Programming has been the source of all the revolutions that the IT industry has brought into this world. Be it be the recent artificial intelligence, Marvel, chat GPT or trends like smart money transfer, technologies brought in by IoT, programming has been the most fundamental brick and content for the development. And the challenges out there. However, the one that tops the list and has led development of revolutionary technologies like chat GPT, smart money transfer, robotic process automation and many more is Python. Since the last decade or so, Python has been the most popular programming language and is being used across all the domains of IT and computer science. Python is actually the most in-demand programming language right now and it's going to stay at the top for decades to come. And you guys must not bear any doubt about that. You guys will be amazed to know about the products developed using these programming languages. That is the reason why people who have mastered this language receive quite fat paychecks. According to the Payscales report, people working around Python receive salary numbers between 200k to 2 million US dollars, whereas in India the same range is between 9 lakh rupees to 30 lakh rupees. So, thinking about learning Python is worthwhile. Well, that being said, hello everyone, welcome to this extensive session on Python by Intellipath. Today, with this session, we are going to cover some intricate details about the Python programming language and it's applicable in no-code roles such as business intelligence or data analytics. But before we begin that, please make sure that you enable the subscribe button and hit the bell icon so that you never miss an update from Intellipath YouTube channel. We will begin this session on a friendly note, not where we will understand what is Python. Then, moving ahead, we shall discuss what is data manipulation, what is NumPy, Features and applications of NumPy, library in data analytics. Next, we shall talk about initialization, inspection, manipulation of array, array mathematics. After that, we shall move towards the next library that is pandas and getting introduced to it. Later, we will look into the differences between pandas and numpies. Moving forward, we will go more deep and talk about analyzing data sets, manipulating the data sets, basics of data visualization with Python. Next, we shall discover the data visualization in detail. We will also talk about matplotlib concepts, different types of plots in matplotlib and how to create charts. Then we shall also touch upon the basics of machine learning. We also shall talk about the basic and easiest ML algorithms that is regression algorithm. To be specific here, we will cover linear regressions using Python. And by the end of the session, we will also cover the most commonly asked interview questions and answers to them. I hope I made myself clear with the agenda. So without any further delay, let's get into the session. What is Python? So Python is basically an all-purpose uh, general language uh, that works on multiple platforms. So, you know, it can work on your Mac or Windows or Linux, anything there. But we, uh, here we will be using on Windows itself. And the best thing about it is that it's high level and it is very, very easy to learn. So the learning curve is really, really shallow. And uh, and uh, the third point, you know, it says that the more commonly used for machine learning and predictive modeling. Yes, uh, this is definitely, it is one of the things Python is used for, but Python is emerging more of an universal tool. So it's more of an universal language you can do anything, whatever you want to do using Python. It could be your ETL job, data visualization, or, uh, you know, uh, web development using the Django framework. So, so you know, the third point is not entirely true. It's, uh, it's becoming more of an uh, universal uh, tool. And the other thing is that it is open source and it is free to learn. So, so that is a very big advantage that you do not have to pay for Python. Uh, you can just download it and there are so many uh, people, so many users are there. So many users are there who are using Python. So that makes it very, very, that makes it very, very attractive. So now uh, talking about the, uh, the uh, spectrum ranking, talking about the spectrum ranking. Uh, here Python, you can see it is at the third third uh, boy third third uh, rank third uh, where just after c and java of course you know all your applications are written in 
Java, so it's not really that bad. Where is uh, the other language R that is like at the fifth position for you know data science? things so you can see the icons are there so you can use python is mostly used for your web development and uh, dex desktop devel desktop uses so the there are the logos are there so it's it's becoming really really popular um because of its uh, you know it's a, a shallow learning curve i would say so why is Python so popular? So you know, just uh, if you if you know Java, so just uh, compare it between the Java syntax and the Python syntax. So you know, Python is an object-oriented language. So you know, there are class and objects are there, but just to write hello world, you do not need to call any class or any methods or anything like that. So you see, just the, the print out hello world. Uh, you know, just see what the the uh, syntax between Java and the uh, and Python. So the minimum minimal setup is another of Python's box. So that's why hey, you know Python is so uh, popular because of its clean and easy syntax. Okay, so uh, also also the other other thing is that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so as I had mentioned, like it's a clean syntax, as you have seen from the previous slide, and an expansive library. So Python is a very library-based or module-based language. There are, all, uh, you know, already a lot of uh, libraries are already available. This you can just plug and play, you know, uh, all the functions that are available, and we will be using some of them. I will take you through what are the libraries that we will cover in this class. And then uh, other thing is that it is uh, it is your or uh, it is your hmm, open source free to download and it has a massive user base. So it has a massive user base and that's why you know if you are uh, if you are stuck with it uh, stuck uh, having some problem with your code or anything you can uh, use your uh, Stack Exchange Stack Overflow and really get your everything can get solved. Also you know uh, Google so in in I think in uh, our case is the Microsoft. They have bought the uh, R, but uh, in Python's case, its main uh, corporate sponsor is like the Google. So, uh, which uses up uh, this programming language and number of uh, applications, including uh, the TensorFlow. So, if you know uh, TensorFlow, it's the newest uh, deep learning library that comes from Google. They recently has uh, open sourced it. So, you know the deep learning um, part. Uh, this Python really helps. So why Python is uh, so popular? There are a couple of uh, points pointers are here. Readability in Python is very very uh, syntax is very well thought out and very clean and very clean. It's a high level and low level programming um, balance of that. So you know you can use uh, Python basically in the shell mode or in the interactive mode. So you can write one line and you can run it, but also you can use it multiple lines and the batch. You can do that. Let's have a quick quiz question guys and the question is which type of programming does python supports and the options are object oriented structured programming functional programming or all of the above please mention your answers in the comment section below language interoperability python is interoperable with 22 other languages so if you are interested, just let me know. I will provide you how if you have written some C code or something, you know, how you can bring them in Python, how you can uh, make that uh, bridge, make the connection. So I will I will tell you if you, if you have any specific need, just come to me and, you know, I will guide you case by case basis. Uh, documentation system is highly, uh, very well uh, documented. It has, as I mentioned, it is, uh, you know, the uh, libraries are there. Other than that, uh, it's an object. It can be an object if you are interested to write object-oriented pro uh, programming so in Python. That can be also be done. So you will have class objects, etc. Other than that, uh, you know, you can if you are doing repetitive stuff. Uh, first, you can write a function, your own user-defined function. Um, then you can write a module where you know you can assemble a lot of those functions, and then you can create your own module. And you can also use your one of those libraries that Python already has. So it's very, very well documented as well. A uh, hierarchical modular system, of course, you know, the namespaces we will see. Uh, when we get into OOP, then you will see how this hierarchy works. 
the data structures data structures python can data structure can be both uh, change you can change the data structure or you cannot change the data structure so what we call is is mutable and immutable so immutable data structure means that the data structure can be changed immutable that it cannot be changed. So, for example, list is a um, uh, list is the type of data structure, and um, and tuple is the mm, tuple is the other type of that is the immutable. So, it means that you can change uh, a list, you can add, delete members uh, in a list. But in a tuple, you cannot do that. That fun functionality is not there. Or it could be a mixture of both mutable and immutable. For example, dictionary. Dictionary is means of a key value pair. So it means that, you know, there are the keys. Keys are immutable. You cannot change them. But you can change the values associated with the keys. So that makes it mutable. So, you know, you can have the data structures. And we, we have dedicated classes on that. Uh, available libraries there are a lot of libraries available I will take you through which are the specific libraries we will we will take uh, we will be going through in this class and then uh, testing framework if you are coming from the testing background uh, there is a unit testing framework that is available within Python however that will not be our focus we will not get into the testing the main focus of this class would be um, learning the basics of Python and then you know how we can apply it in data science data analytics a couple of machine learning, a very foundation uh, basic uh, machine learning uh, uh, like uh, you know algorithms that will take you through okay so now um if you are if you are you know uh, i uh, last class i I heard that uh, there were people who are thinking of a career switch into the data science profile, um, you know, data science, or they are trying to make an entry into the data science or uh, analyst uh, thing. So what they do, um, data science, uh, uh, so, you know, it is not the only, uh, there is not a specific job that we do. Uh, I've been in this field for a while now, so most of the thing uh, we uh, is uh, important are like uh, ETL work. So you know, before um, uh, a data scientist can work on the data, the data needs to be ingested. So the data needs to be ingested, and the data needs to be bought in. So you need to create the data pipelines. So there are, you know, uh, there are ETL tools are there, extract, transform, and loads are there. So you can create these ETL tools using Python, or you can also use um, dedicated softwares like that. After this, that there are when uh, talking about the data science, you know, the type of typical type of projects that we do could be uh, find out or uh, know about the historical data and what is just happening now, or what is ha what has happened uh, in uh, uh, you know in recent past or in the past. So. If you want to make a career in data science, then IntelliPath has IIT Madras Advanced Data Science and AI Certification Program. This course is of very high quality and cost effective as it is taught by IIT professors and industry experts. You might be interested to know what has been the sales, what are the sales figures, how much the sales had been. So you, you might also would like to know the sales by month you know, the sales by month, by mm -hmm. sales by month or, or by year like that, or by category, if you are into a uh, retail kind of thing. And, you know, you might want to find out uh, how has been the sales by uh, from January uh, to uh, December, and if there are any seasonal picks, because there are some seasonal goods are there. Uh, they might have, like, you know, in the festival time, their, their sales might increase, other times they might not be there. So, you know, these cells, this type, the type of uh, analytics that we'll do are called the descriptive analytics. So it's just, you know, finding out w what is happening, what is happening with the numbers, nothing much more than that. So that is most of our job is, um, is the, you know, 
visualization and descriptive but then um, a, a lot of modeling if you are into um, so going the machine learning and this is called your predictive modeling so you know you want to predict something like uh, if the sales figure uh, January month was so and so you might want to understand why is it so why has been your sales figure like uh, 10,000 in month of January but you know in March it dropped to 8,000 so you want to find out the reason why that's why you know you might want to try some algorithms like uh, linear regression or logistic regression for classification problems or you might want to find out if a loan application needs to be approved or not approved so you know a kind of decision is no binary kind of decision that you might not need to figure out in those cases this is called your prescriptive analyst analytics and in this prescriptive analytics you will have your uh, that is the uh, part of your you will be applying your machine learning algorithms over here so you know these are the basic things that our data analysts do other than that there are regular visualization works are also there and also reporting work is reporting work is also there so recommendation engine like we you know come across this recommendation engine every day you know in day-to-day -day life no matter whatever website you use whatever android application you use whatever platform you go through anywhere recommendation engine is a part of it is a part of any organization so what is recommendation in simple terms in order to predict something or, and you know in order to recommend it for upcoming customers you can say basically now talking about you know types of recommendation engines we have basically two types and the last one is a hybrid or you can say combination now what are they one is the collaborative filtering and the other one is the content based filtering okay now in collaborative filtering what are the topics and what is the content based filtering so content based filtering uh, it's not so important in general also most of the times organizations will be using collaborative filtering now what exactly is collaborative filtering filtering items from a large set of alternatives is done collaboratively by users preferences now what are users preferences guys here you can see a small example so there is a particular person a and the other person b if we are talking about amazon prime or netflix or hotstar anything like that any kind of ott platform if a person A is actually showing interest or you can say he generally watches, you know, rom-com movies, sci-fi movies, thriller movies. And if the other person B, he is also watching the same genre movies. They both don't know each other, you know. But the only thing is they are actually watching same genre movies or uh, same genre, you know, series you can say. So as they both share same interest in future, they will be recommended similar movies. So this is actually called as collaborative filtering. Collaborative in the sense taking together or getting together each and every one. Right? So if one person is watching certain genre of films and the other person is also watching certain genre of films, okay, let's suppose a movie released or you can say a new movie released. Take it for example, Pathan released no OTT platform. So sci-fi sci-fi thriller thriller they both have so if one person is being recommended with that particular movie obviously according to the algorithm which we use the other person will also be recommended in the same particular film set not just Patan, whatever movies will come in that genre everything every other movie they will be recommended so simply speaking this is what we call as collaborative filtering if one is getting a recommendation and the other person is also having similar interests or similar likes, he will also be recommended the same product or same movie or whatever, you know, uh, your organization is or whatever the platform is. Similar people are having similar interest or you can say different people are having similar interest. Whatever a new product will come, it will be recommended to all of those people. It's not like only one person will be getting a recommendation. Everyone who is interested in that particular cluster or that particular domain, they will be recommended accordingly. Okay. So this is what we call as collaborative filtering. You can see here, if user A watch a new movie, then user B is also recommended same movie. 
this is an advantage of collaborative filtering you can say okay so this makes our work easier you know you don't need to verify with each and every customer verify with each and every client all the time once you get the history once you get the you know uh, information then it will be more easy let's suppose take a small example guys take a small example yeah but interest may change obviously so we need to keep on updating the algorithm and keep on updating the information that's it so this month i'm interested in watching food bloggers so i'm watching all the reels which are related to food and all like maggie pasta you know people doing some kind of reviews of restaurants and all might be after one month i'll i'm not interested in uh, food right now I, i want to see videos related to bikes and cars or something like that bikes cars jeeps you know all these things so what will happen in our feed you will be getting different different posts or reels as recommendations but till now as i have shown my interest in food in my reels feed obviously i'll be getting most of those suggestions but now if i want to change my preference or now if i am not interested in them i'll be clicking on the reels which are related to cars or bikes kind of thing now what does the algorithm do it tries to understand it tries to adapt to the situation and slowly slowly within one two days i'll be started you know it will be start giving me reels as recommendations related to bikes and cars so that's what i was saying like adopting and all that's it so identify similar users based on similar user preferences now what does this statement mean similar user preferences so let's go back to this example users preferences means a i mean a person liking rom com movies is his preference similar preferences in the sense one more person liking rom com movies this is called as similar preference now what are we saying identify similar users based on similar user preferences so first of all we try to see which people or which customers are actually having similar preference and then we are trying to combine them as similar user or a similar customer we in the sense we don't do it manually the system will be doing automatically so this is what user based collaborative filtering the first point the second point is recommend new items to an active user based on the items not rated by the active user now who is an active user guys so you know the definition of active user can be so many like types of active users you can take but in general if we see if i am talking about uh, something like netflix again okay so after watching a movie if someone is giving a kind of upvote or like or you know some kind of star rating anything like that what we can say if a person is actively viewing netflix movies or netflix shows so he is giving some kind of rating or review for that now that is a situation where we have an active user and the product or you know that movie is being rated now come back to the statement it is saying recommend new items to an active user okay so a product or a new movie has launched in netflix ott platform we are recommending it to an active user based on what based on the items not rated by the active user so till then that active user did not rate that particular movie but we are trying to boost that movie we are trying to promote that movie so that it reaches mass number of audience i hope you are getting my points guys see anyhow if a movie has been rated so no need to boost it or no need to promote it at the back end using an algorithm people will already be showing interest to watch it but some cases what happens maybe lack of star cast you know maybe lack of uh, budget something like this marketing promotions all these things the movie don't have any kind of hype now what the what does the platform do it tries to advertise it it tries to show up mostly on your feed all these things even though you being an active user so you are an active user but you don't know this movie has been launched in this situation you will be using user based collaborative filtering based on what based on the genre so let's suppose in rom com genre you are interested you are getting recommendations related to rom com okay but none of the users has given a review or rated a particular movie which falls under rom com only 
but the ott platform wants profit every time it doesn't you know uh, purchase a movie who is not getting any views or something like that right so it automatically boosts that particular movie so that at least the people who are interested in a certain genre will be showing interest to you know watch that movie so in this principle you can see at the back end directly or indirectly we can consider collaborative filtering is somewhat helpful for us so guys is this user based filtering clear for you these are the two conditions or two you know tasks basically which can be cleared with user based collaborative filtering shall we consider it as recommend product services and information ha ashok ji you can consider it so that example i'll give when we'll move ahead with item based collaborative filtering there it will be you know more clear like i'll give example from amazon e-commerce website so that time i'll be doing that okay fine now moving ahead with item based collaborative filtering calculate the item similarity based on the item preferences <laughs> now what is item preference and what is item similarity now let's come back to amazon e-commerce website forget about youtube forget about netflix now we are talking about amazon e-commerce website let's suppose i went to the search bar and i searched uh, how many of you know tripod i think everyone knows what is a tripod camera tripod mobile tripod hai na fine now if i am searching tripod in the search engine you can do it right now if you want so when i search something like tripod Ha. <laughs> so you will be getting all the products one after the other. Now, out of all these products, you have a product which is called as Amazon Basics, or you can say Amazon's Choice. How many of you know this? Out of all the products listed out, there will be a product which is called as Amazon Basics or Amazon's Choice, है ना? Now, if we talk about Amazon's Choice. will you agree if i say that particular amazon's choice product which it is recommending to us it will be having so many ratings positive ratings yes or no that particular product will be having so many positive ratings that's the reason amazon is recommending us now let's suppose i don't have any idea about tripod so i am new to photography field i just want to take some tripod and later i'll see is it good or bad so for a person like me who don't have any experience in the photography field i don't know even what are the brands okay i did not do any background search i did not do anything i just saw okay amazon is recommending it saying the word amazon's choice and it is having considerably very high ratings so i'll be uh, you know buying that product respectively like directly without any doubt now in this case what is happening the recommendation which amazon is doing with respect to what with respect to the reviews it got from how from where it got that reviews from the customers again hai na so i am trying to buy that particular product coming back to item based collaborative filtering in the first point calculate the item similarity based on item preferences i'll explain it in a simple way uh, let me try to do it so if you are talking about tripod guys if you are talking about tripods consider there are three brands of tripods okay this is first brand second and third for the sake of comfort i am naming it as abc companies so a company is giving a particular tripod b is giving a particular tripod respectively c is also giving now they will be getting a certain rating they will be getting a certain rating now according to the rating if you see let's suppose it is having 4 star it is having 3 star and it is having 4.2 star okay these are what these are same item guys these are same item but from the different different companies now what is happening amazon e-commerce website will try to analyze the reviews or ratings of each and every product and it will be listing out them in a certain pattern or in a certain order now this is what you see when you search for a particular product now if i am searching for tripod 
forget about the filter button which you have in general if you see it will be given relevance yes or no filter will be with respect to relevance how many of you see i don't know but uh, there will be an option called as relevance that means what highly rated products or you can say uh, considerably highly rated products will be showing up over here so you might consider something like a at the first case a company's product tripod at the first case exactly then c and then b something like this hena now there might be a case uh, might be the second one or the third one is being recommended by amazon calling it as amazon's choice now this you know relevance and popularity now this you know method of creating a certain list of all the products where the highest rated values will be at the top and the least rated values will be at the bottom it is called as item preference now if a certain product is getting high ratings so many ratings 4.2 star with 4k customers rating it so what does that mean indirectly customers are preferring it yes sir no guys most of the customers are preferring it so customers preference is being converted to item preference so if customers are preferring more that means the demand of that particular item or product is increasing yes or no right so what what does the system do what does the machine do it tries to sort them and it will try to recommend them so for a inexperienced guy or you can say for a person who don't know anything about a particular product he will definitely go with the number of reviews and ratings only so item based preference or item based collaborative filtering is actually following this particular pattern now what is the second statement we have find the top similar items to the non rated items by active user and recommend them so active users means number of uh, ratings only right because see if some product is getting five star rating but only one person is uh, you know rating it we cannot recommend it to other people right am i correct so active users are the people who are like considering okay these are the number of people who rated it or something yeah fine find the top similar items to the non rated items by active user and recommend them just like uh, you know aruna has asked right now if it is non rated okay if it is non rated by active user what we are doing we are trying to find out top similar items and then we are trying to recommend it accuracy or performance of the model will get better and better hai na so to implement dimensionality reduction we have studied pca and lda but also like there are many other algorithms in the market or in the documentation we can you know find them later on how can we find eigen values for this particular matrix the formula is determinant of determinant of a minus lambda i is equal to 0 a matrix we already have given to us i means what identity matrix okay we know this zero we already have now lambda is a variable which consists of eigen value guys so we need to find out what is our eigen value by getting the information of this particular lambda so in this example if you see i just multiplied lambda with identity matrix lambda 0 0 lambda okay then we are subtracting it and then we are trying to find out the determinant of this particular matrix which is resulting as in two values one is 0 and the other one is 4 so for a two dimensional matrix or for a, you can say two cross two matrix for the given matrix there are two eigen values 0 and 4 fine how many eigen values does a two cross two matrix can have two eigen values if it is of three cross three it can be three eigen values am i clear to you guys now did you understand what is eigen value this lambda variable which we are finding it is called as eigen value they can be called as characteristic equations or solutions for a linear equation if it is of 3 cross 3 matrix then we will have x axis y axis and z axis so depending on the dimension of the matrix the coordinates will be changing or you can say the axes will be increasing so here you can see 
I substituted all the values and I am getting a different matrix where we can find the direction of eigenvalues. Is this clear now, guys? Did you understand this or not? What is eigenvalue and eigenvector? So this X is actually a matrix where you can find eigenvectors and this lambda is a variable where you can find eigenvalue. Eigenvectors are the directions of eigenvalues, Anand, simply speaking. Eigenvectors are the directions of eigenvalues. Eigenvalue is just a number. But in what direction is that, you can get it from the eigenvector. Now the SVD algorithm, guys, see, in linear, linear algebra, I'm so sorry, in the linear regression, if you remember, you need to find out a best fit line. So all the algorithm is revolving, you know, around that best fit line. Or you can say y is equal to mx plus c. Yes or no, how many of you agree? All the algorithm, we are just discussing about one particular equation called as y is equal to mx plus c. So that's the main uh, formula for linear regression. In the same way, for SVD, we have a certain, you know, formula again. What is that formula? This one, u sigma v transpose. U sigma V transpose. So U is a matrix. I mean, all the three are matrices only. But what are the differences we have? U is a matrix which is called as orthogonal matrix. We discussed about orthogonal, right? V transpose is also a orthogonal matrix. Sigma is called as diagonal matrix. So these three matrices which we have, they give us a certain matrix later on called as SVD, singular value decomposition, denoted by the a matrix okay so again there is a lot of maths behind it i'll just explain you in a simple way okay no need to worry now what are we doing if we want to find out v and v transpose values guys okay if we want to find out v and v transpose values or you can say simply the v matrix how can we get the v matrix from the question or from the data set you can get the a matrix your data frame is also a matrix that's a basic uh, pandas you know uh, statement Anna? so that is what you consider as your a matrix like obviously you will be performing something like standardization null values all these things but after performing all the eda feature engineering whatever you want you will be left out with a certain data set so that you can consider as your a matrix if you are multiplying a transpose into a Okay, if you are multiplying A transpose into A, what happened? Oh my God, oh my God, just a second. Huh. If you are multiplying A transpose and A, you will be getting the V matrix from that particular output. Just a second, let me show. Yeah, so if you are multiplying A transpose into A, you will be getting a V matrix. In case if you are doing A into A transpose, you will be getting U matrix. Now, why is this happening? Because the V matrix and the U matrix, they both are orthogonal to each other, guys. So, here when we multiply U transpose into U, you'll be getting the identity matrix as the output. So, that doesn't make any difference. But, what is happening at the middle? Like, where exactly is this sigma value going? You can see, this sigma value will be consisting of eigenvalues, guys. Again, in interview, you should not directly use the word eigenvalues. You, you have to use the word singular values. I want to I want everyone to note this point. If at all in interview, they'll ask you, okay, you did this recommendation engine, very good. You have used SVD, very good. So in SVD, you will be using three matrices. What are they? Then you will answer them, U, Sigma, and V transpose. Okay. So U values, uh, V value, we will be discussing later. But right now, what exactly is this sigma? Sigma is a matrix. It is a diagonal matrix where it has the eigenvalues as the inputs. Okay. Eigenvalues as the inputs. But technically speaking, we should not use the term eigenvalues here. You must be using the term sig singular values for the singular matrix. Sigma matrix, you can call it. So lambda of A transpose into A is same as, what is the sigma square of A? So these are actually called as singular values. I'll show you, don't worry. So here you can see, this U matrix is called as left singular vectors, V value is called as right singular vectors, and the middle value is called as, this is of M cross N. So it can be a rectangular matrix as well. 
see what are we saying here instead of eigen values we call them as singular values now let's suppose in interview someone asked you what are the values or what do we call the values present inside a sigma matrix what should, what should be the answer what are the values present inside a sigma matrix in svd what should be the answer singular values now what are this u sigma and v transpose how svd algorithm is helping us to perform dimensionality reduction i'll explain this with two methods guys first method mathematically i'll show you with respect to uh, linear algebra yeah so let's suppose after calculating you are getting it as 25 now how can you find out sigma sigma square is equal to lambda okay sigma square is equal to lambda that means sigma will be is equal to root of lambda right so if you are having a 2 cross 2 matrix you will be getting 2 lambda values so 2 lambda values will be giving you 2 sigma values i think it's clear now uh okay so u and v matrices these two matrices we are using in order in order to rotate a particular value then sigma is a singular value. exactly sigma is a singular value correct exactly not eigen value it's a signal value the only difference is we are taking the root of value that's it Test everything is same. fine now u matrix and v matrix we are actually using it for rotation sir u and v are square matrix now what is this rotation and what is this stretching you know what is this exactly so first of all try to understand it in this way okay so rotation we are doing with respect to this particular matrix case we call it as unitary transformation consider this example guys you know how can we use this for dimensionality reduction now just for the sake of explanation here we are trying to increase the coordinates but in general the same operation we will use in order to decrease the coordinates or transform the coordinates so that so that at the end of the output we will get dimensionality reduction now how are we doing it this is the original value i want everyone to focus on the colorings as well red blue orange and green okay now first of all <clears throat> first of all what is happening you are multiplying it with v transpose matrix you are multiplying it with v transpose matrix what kind of rotation is v transpose so clockwise rotation is happening guys so that is the reason you can see this red value shifted to this point here all the values are shifted so this is your clockwise rotation now then we are multiplying it with the sigma matrix the singular values that's what we called as stretching so here you can see the coordinates have been increased then we have the stretching part here you can see the values are actually transformed to new coordinates this operation we are performing with respect to what the sigma value so how much you want to stretch it that again depends on the matrix values of sigma values or the singular values later what we did we multiplied it with a u matrix so that's the you know rotation of anti-clockwise direction here you can see the coordinates have been changed again now just for the sake of explanation i have considered a small value and converted it into a big value in general if you see the big value will be converted to small value according to the convenience so here you can see so if this is the dog image you can see you know we are actually reshaping it and uh, rescaling it so u sigma v transpose rotation two types we have anti-clockwise and clockwise and stretching we have if you don't want to rotate it with certain angle or with certain number of uh, degrees you can just nullify it you know by dealing with the values present inside this matrix you can directly nullify it you can directly come to this step by stretching it and then just rotating it anti-clockwise any operation in between if you don't want you can just nullify it with the matrix values the function which we use for svd it is trying to collaborate the things it is trying to you know uh, group up all the values in the data set and try to bring them close or you can say few people are understanding with respect to clustering that is also fine with respect to grouping kind of thing by changing the coordinates or by transforming the coordinates we can understand how the values are close enough then we can recommend them accordingly so this is a back-end process going on but 
in python if you see we will just use the function and accordingly you will get your output so what is a data manipulation right so in any world okay any any world of data you do not get a clear data that can be used for data modeling or let's say if you want to build any data science algorithm or if you want to analyze how the data looks like okay uh, in order to do get into a place understand uh, let's say get into a place where you can analyze the data derive insights uh, from the data you need to manipulate the data in such a way that you can derive meanings from through through that it could be a basic analysis or it could be building any uh, data science or machine learning models or deep learning models for that case okay so that's what is majorly on a higher umbrella if you see that's what a data manipulation could so then like what is the i mean like overall uh, higher level of data manipulation is so as you collect the raw data from multiple sources so let let me give you an example here right uh, in real world you collect data from users through their clickstream data what do i mean by clickstream data here is let's say every user using an uh, phone or a mobile application do different uh, actions in a mobile for example uh, if you take any e-commerce website you go there you search for something you click on a product and you kind of like a product and you add that product to cart you place an order right so that's so that's called client even so where client 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 is the user here do many interactions in an application you collect all the data in the place okay these are all unstructured data this does not have any proper flow because this changes from user to user it's not predefined a given user will follow the same structure as another user so let's say a uh, user me tarun i could be doing a different level of actions compared to the user b in the platform let's say i come to the site i do uh, let's say a lot of interactions uh, in the search or uh, i sometimes i'll not even like or click on any items i'll just randomly surf through the uh, products and there could be an other user who would be going inside the product and clicking on that adding to cart so this data is not very structured right so this we call in industry as a clickstream data events okay then there is a very organized data so for example if you place an order so it should go into the system and get recorded or if you create uh, let's say if you are creating a an user id or you are logging in to any uh, e-commerce platform or it could be a blanking platform that user id need to be created so those are more organized uh, data that comes into the low level uh, so in this formats so you as you get data extracted from different sources you need to create the data in such a way that you can use that for model building or analysis so in order to do that as you extract the data you need to do the data manipulation okay and once you do the data manipulation you get the data in a very readable information so that you can use the data for plotting analysis getting insights from the data and using the data for building the models great so 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 in order to do that so there are different tools that you can use uh, to do the data manipulation as i said earlier so the uh, main tool that would come into place is numpy so numpy majorly works on an array data structures we would be discussing in detail about numpy how do you use numpy data and how do you like manipulate data using numpy okay and what are the advantages of using any numpy data great so then the pandas so as you see numpy works on data structure based uh, uh, sorry array based uh, data structures pandas work on data frames so what does a data frame means is data frame is nothing but an rows and columns which if you plot if you get any csv file let's say that has columns and different rows of values right so if you want to just load that uh, data as such we can load that data as such as a data frame that can contain any different of data types so it could be of type uh, let's say uh, array it could be of type uh, let's say string int double float all that okay 
So all that manipulations could be done by pandas. So if you want to do any scientific operations, that's when we use sci-fi. Okay. And matplot is majorly used for plotting the data. So you have all this data in a number format or let's say text format. But if you want to plot this data, understand in different plots, so you will be using matplotlib. How do you differentiate between structured and unstructured data? That's a great question, right? So what is a structured data is, let's say you go into any, uh, I'll give you an example for that, right? Let's say you go into any e-commerce website, right? So there you see list of products that has been added already, right? So in that products, you will know for a given product ID, what is the price of the product, right? And uh, what is the quantity available for that product? And let's say, what is the title of the product, description of the product, all that. So in that sense, those is an unstructured data, which is stored already in the database, right? So that is, we have defined that columns. So these are the columns that needs to flow into the data that has been defined. That's what will flow into that data, okay? That is a structured data. Great, I hope uh, you are clear about the structured data. So, which is the data which is defined, where the columns are defined, what are the data that needs to be going is defined, is a structured data. Uh, let's say if you have any data frame or data uh, table which is defined, okay? So, what do I mean by defined is, let's take an orders table. Any e-commerce site will have an orders table or a product table. So, if you go into a product table, the product table is defined in such a way that every product will have a product ID, product title, product name, uh, sorry, product description. What is the price of the product? What is the quantity of the product? Will that change for any of the product? No. So these all columns or the data should move or should uh, go into that table. So this is a structured data. And I'll also give you one more example for the structured data. Okay. So for any structured data like users, right? If you take any user's uh, data, so you know for any user, you once you go create an account in any, uh, let's say you take a banking or let's say you take an e-commerce or you, you create an, a YouTube or a uh, Google account, right? So you, there are specific type of columns that is defined. So for, let's say if you are creating and registering as an user in an e-commerce website, let's say Amazon. So it is defined that you need to create a mobile number. You need to have an, let's say, a mail ID. You need to give your address. You need to give your date of birth. Will that change for any of the users? No. So these are the data that is defined. That's how it flows into the any uh, database, right? And structure. Uh, it's not that when columns are not defined. Let's just stick to the structured data first. Okay. So when we go into the unstructured data, so unstructured data has so many meanings, okay? So it's not that unstructured data is not defined, okay? Unstructured data will also be defined, but it's not necessarily to be staying in a low level format, okay? So for example, right, the idea I gave you before. So let's say you, the same thing, what is the interactions a customer does once a customer gets into the website, okay? So will that be same for all the users? No. So as I go into any e-commerce website, I might go search for something uh, and click on some product and uh, let's say buy some product or add to some product to the cart. So all these activities are, uh, are of an user that is being tracked by the website, okay? Once you give that permission. So most of the websites track our user interactions right so in that case for every user the interaction flow will be very different and and interaction at row level so previously when we talked about we said interactions will be stored at a row level so for every user you will have only one row but in this case if you store a, for every user id whatever the interactions does in a single day at a row level our database will explode for all the events so in, the, in such a way, we'll not store for different events one row. So whatever events done by the user will be stored as an unstructured format. For example, 
once a user comes into the website he went and searched and inside the search he has seen so many listings or products let's say once you type uh, let's say you go to amazon you type for nike shoes you get hundreds of products that has been shown to you right so all that hundreds of products will not have an different rows so then if you have a, if you want to store data like that your database going to explode okay so in such a way for your search we have shown you 100 items so that will come into only one row inside that row itself the products that is shown to you will come as an array of format inside that one row itself but for another user will do a different search for example i come and search for shirts shirts i shown only 100 shirts for that user so here previously nike shoes i have shown 1000 products here i have shown only 100 shirts because i have only 100 shirts in my site can i store it in separate rows no so in this way i will store this data but it's an unstructured format we have not defined this is how data should flow in so here whatever customer does the database will record those data okay that is in an unstructured format in this unstructured format we will also store other informations like images right uh, and let's say uh, text whatever we get so all this format which is not defined how the data will flow that will be stored in the unstructured format yeah so let's let's go into the array uh, will not so now i hope you are clear about structured and unstructured data right cool so yeah so hope you understood what does uh, data manipulation uh, do right we collect data from different sources uh, we know to make uh, information out of that data we need to do the data manipulations right so inside the data manipulations we have different steps and different issues that comes from uh, where do we get the data from right let's say the first um, let's say issue uh, would be multiple problems would be so every data is not clean right uh, so the first problem would be a missing values let's say all information as i said in an this would be majorly happening in an any unstructured data collection so in that case all information will not be stored some of the data might be missing so in order to treat that missing variables or understand how much data is missing we will be using different data manipulation techniques so so uh, numpy has different functions to handle that missing value treatment so that is one thing then incorrect data format so just to give you an example as we collect the data set we collect the data set as a timestamp values for example it will be in a millisecond format but as a human readable i need the data format to be standard across everywhere okay so let's say i want my data uh, date format to be uh, month date and year or let's say year month date so there are different formats data flows in so we need to have a standard format across all the records so we kind of see what are the format mistakes we might change that format to whatever we need it okay similar to that units okay so uh, uh, the the place the one place we are where we are collecting the data we might get uh, the data in uh, different units. For example, uh, let's say if you are getting a temperature uh, information, you might have Celsius, Fahrenheit, Kelvin. So, but uh, uh, when you are collecting from different places, similar if you are when you are collecting uh, distance, you might collect in miles, kilometers. For example, some of the e-commerce sites when you are collecting the data. Let's have a quick quiz question, guys. And the question is: Is Python case sensitive when dealing with identifiers? And your options are. Yes, no, machine dependent or none of the above. Please mention your answers in the comment section below. If you want to make a career in data science, then IntelliPath has IIT Madras Advanced Data Science and AI Certification Program. This course is of very high quality and cost effective as it is taught by IIT professors and industry experts. You might collect the data uh, as uh, some in rupees, some in paisa. Okay, it generally happens in an US based e commerce sites where people have collecting the data in rupee, uh, sorry, dollars, some in cents. So, in order to get across, uh, let's say, standardized across same uh, units, you need to convert that into one standard format. Cool. Then comes the unnecessary data, right? So, as I said previously, 
uh, when user interacts with our system, we collect tons of data, whatever user is giving to us. We might not need all the data uh, or we might not make sense out of data uh, from all the data. So we might be removing that data from our, uh, let's say, whatever that is present. So we'll just take the relevant data that is being, that will be required for our problem solving. So we'll use only the relevant data. So in order to get out of that, we might be using different manipulation techniques that will be removing the unnecessary data and taking only the relevant data that will be used for our analysis or building, uh, building any uh, machine learning algorithm, right? So there are different things, right? So I, I do not want to say these are the only four ways uh, see, that's the only four problems that we will come, come across in real world. There are tons of problems, but it comes under one umbrella. So, but to give you an idea, so these are the major problems you will come across in your day-to-day -day life. Once you learn and understand this, right, these are the ways we could get the data into me. As you see any data, you will get into an idea. Okay, these are the possibilities that my data might be wrong. I need to go back and uh, manipulate that data so that I can use the data in the real world analysis or uh, building any machine learning algorithm. So duplicates come under the umbrella of unnecessary data, right? Uh, so yeah, so as I said, this is the bigger umbrella that we might see the data for. So we might come across many, uh, let's say data in real world. So for you give to an example of unnecessary data, one of the sub part is a duplicate variable, right? Duplicate recorded that has been collected by us. Duplicate row, okay? But what is an unnecessary data to be? So unnecessary data could be defined as in any world, you will not require all the columns that has been collected by the user, right? You might need just a subset of data. You cannot call it entirely that is unnecessary for the overall data information collected. But for the specific problem you are trying to solve, that data might be irrelevant for the problem you are trying to solve. So that that data might be unrelevant for that task. So yeah, so that's more about the unnecessary data and whatever you call as duplicates that come under the unnecessary data itself. So you need to clean that data before going into the next steps, right? So if you are looking for any date format, so you can have different formats of date itself. For example, you can have uh, uh, date as, let's say, uh, starting with YYY, which means year, full full year, then month, then the date of the month, day of the month, or in the reverse way. So some people use it as month, uh, day, and year. And some people use a timestamp. Timestamp is a millisecond format. So there are different units that you can collect the data for uh, every uh, data column. So that needs to be unique, uh, that needs to be same across all the records because you cannot have one uh, record with a different format and other record with a different format. So yeah, now let's get into NumPy, purely NumPy. What does NumPy do? Uh, how do we use NumPy in real world? What are the data manipulation? Uh, how is it different from list? And what are the advantages of NumPy? All that, okay? So what is a NumPy, right? So NumPy is a like, as you know, right, people, uh, once you started Python, people would talk about uh, NumPy uh, libraries there. So yeah, so the uh, abbreviation of that is numerical Python. So with using NumPy, you can do a lot of scientific operations and NumPy has a lot of, uh, let's say, predefined functions that can make our life easier, right? And NumPy is faster for the uh, array-based data structures, okay? So the first thing about NumPy is, right, NumPy is open source and the base road. So as you all know, right, Python, uh, we have an interpreter language. We have many libraries inside Python or the base code of Python that is written in C. So you see interpreter called C interpreter, okay? So the language is built based on C only. So the, whatever you write in Python, so major majority of the code converts into C and goes to the low level language, right? So inside that, once you have the code, the functions uh, written in Python, which is like, uh, like uh, faster, but when you have the language written in C itself, the base C itself, it helps us to fasten the process. So as NumPy is majorly written on C, then on Python upon that. 
so you can have so much fast uh, or speed in your operations cool and there are like no built in capabilities inside pure python that can help us to uh, do the array operations right cool. and um, we can, we have list but there are like some disadvantages of list uh, inside the python uh, due to the speed and the memory usages that has been overcome using the uh, numpy uh, library we'll discuss uh, using the code and few examples for that okay cool so let's start with how what is a numpy array right let's uh, we first understood why we need to use numpy now we'll see wh what does numpy provide okay so numpy is an n dimensional array so n could be single dimensional two dimensional three dimensional or two cross two two cross three you can define that dimension of the array by yourself right and we have so many uh, functions the tools to manipulate the array so numpy as a package or library that has so many uh, functions within that numpy that we can use directly to do all the operations so it could be math mathematical operation uh, logical operations all that so all this predefined function helps us to do all this data manipulation in a very easy format and very fast format okay so so majority of the array operations inside this will be going into a numpy format okay and one of the interesting fact so that that might not be uh, I, I, it's just an uh, add on one i'll just give you an idea right so in uh, tabular data we might not be using numpy as extensively as we use the data frames right because in tablet format we have mostly uh, let's say uh, numbers uh, let's say strings uh, all that right categorical variables but once you go into the deep learning world so every image or let's say if you are trying to solve an image classification problem there every image is converted into an array format right so there you will have lot of uh, array operations there so in that case numpy will be very very useful uh, majorly on the uh, let's say image classification problem as well so make sure you understand uh, let's say each and every uh, iterations of numpy so that will help not only in the data science or the machine learning problems it will also help in the deep learning world okay so yeah as i said before let's say you can do a lot many uh, manipulations let's say if you want to do fourier transformation or a shape manipulation let's say you have some shape of a numpy array uh, you can use that uh, convert let's say you can uh, you have a two cross two you can convert that into fro cross one and you can have let's say a lot of uh, linear algebra let's say you have equation of line that you want to solve uh, using uh, numpy you can do that and you want to uh, generate uh, random numbers uh, that you can use for the uh, let's say uh, let's say dummy data set or let's say you uh, you can use that data for let's say uh, dummy plotting all that that could be used okay so all and numpy uh, library is kind of integrated with c because that base is integrated uh, i mean num i mean the base packages of numpy is created from the c itself so it's easy for the integration uh, with c programming and many other databases right so yeah first point numpy consume very less memory space what does that mean okay so let's say numpy can have uh, data types of int double all that right so it takes uh, let's say it can have tiny and all that different types of data types numpy can have in a numerical format okay you, you cannot ask let's say can i store a string there it's all numerical formats you can store inside a numpy array and it takes the exact amount of memory that is required for that type data type of the array uh, data type of that element okay it's not going to same across all the elements of a numpy array so it kind of allocates only that memory so it's not same with a list or any other operations okay so operations let's say if you take uh, any numpy right so you have so many operations that is built inside the numpy array uh, numpy package itself and you, you can see a very a speed in the terms of operations as it's built in the c and uh, and uh, as i told before you have lot many predefined functions 
that will do uh, i'll make our life easier to solve the real world problems that does not come along with the lists okay so having all these advantages numpy kind of saves the speed i mean the major agent or major idea you need to take from here is numpy kind of a speed uh, better than the uh, let's say uh, uh, list and numpy has lot of predefined function you can use for scientific operation or mathematical operation or logical operations all that okay and then you have the memory so how much memory is allocated for numpy uh, is less compared to the uh, any uh, let's say list in the real world cool so that's why we use majorly numpy for the any array operations got it so that's what they talk about here right so let's say any very simple example one element whatever is needed it take four bytes but in the other uh, other thing it takes around 14 bytes so how much memory and numpy allocates for an array uh, is far better than compared to any, any python list okay so what is a numpy array right so um, for any anything right as everybody know array is a data structure uh, which the numpy uh, library uh, revolves around so we have a data structure defined and to be more precise a numpy can be any uh, matrix or a grid of values so the grid of values is the example you see here just one row of values and it has the same data type okay called uh, it also called n dimensional array which is you can have any dimensional as i said previously you can have one uh, row which is one dimensional array or you can have two cross two you can have three cross three or three cross three into two so n dimensional of array you can have okay and indexing so what does an index mean like index is the position of any array okay uh, in our numpy it's uh, similar to the uh, list so in terms of the indexing right uh, so if you see the index value of a numpy also starts from the zero okay but in terms of execution it's last lot faster than the list cool so yeah so it's the same thing it comes in different ways right so if, if you see applications of numpy comes with the, any mathematical operations okay and then uh, numpy is also important because that's the back end of any pandas as well so all the pandas operations so it can uh, any it is the back end code of the pandas as well and if you want to do plotting uh, majority of the data which is directly let's say you take it as a pandas data frame you cannot use that pandas data frame in many plotting directly so you might be taking that as an array that will be used in the uh, matplotlib so that is the library used for plotting the data okay and as i said previously so it is the uh, any data science problem internally uh, that might be converted into an array format before uh, let's say uh, building any uh, algorithms okay for any deep learning algorithm so even there uh, our array data uh, numpy arrays would be used cool so let's start with how do you create an array right so there are different places you can uh, you can install numpy right but with respect to anaconda anaconda comes as a pack package so in that case you do not need to uh, go separately and install numpy okay but let's say if you are in different platforms you uh, install python as a standalone system uh, you just install python in your uh, laptop okay uh, not through anaconda so in that case uh, we might be using let's say pip install or uh, in ubuntu we use uh, sudo app get install Py, uh, python numpy in mac brew install numpy all that so but in generally right uh, let's say even in anaconda so this is the common term let's say uh, uh, there are some packages that comes with the uh, uh, some libraries comes with the anaconda packages itself so one of that is numpy but yeah if you want something you can use pip install or you can use uh, there is anaconda install as well but we don't need to worry about uh, that for the numpy right now which comes with the package right so the library which is already present in your anaconda package itself you, if you directly go and import numpy you will get uh, the numpy package let's say numpy package would be imported okay cool 
so so right now we understood how do we uh, install numpy and how do we import numpy right uh, and as i said previously you guys know right what do we do as mp so you can have just uh, import numpy we use amp np now np acts as the object to calling all the functions of numpy okay yeah so can we so what are the different ways we can create the numpy array okay so it's not that we just uh, create new arrays right so let's say you have already a list which is of same data type and you can use that list that can be converted into an array same with tuples right and using a numpy array you can using the predefined functions for example ones numpy has a predefined function called ones and you can specify what is the dimension you need there uh, let's say you specify 2 cross 2 so you will create a 2 cross 2 of all ones same with uh, zeros and same with uh, ranges you can define the range let's say i need uh, 1 to 10 of numbers so numpy has that predefined function you can use to create an array okay so these two things then uh, numpy can also create random numbers so using the function random uh, you can np dot random you can define uh, let's say how many elements you need and the structure of that array you can create random number of uh, elements or uh, uh, let's say uh, random uh, values for that an array okay so this is about creation so just to repeat so you can create through already uh, present data from list tuples or you can create from the uh, date i mean uh, functions that helps us to create uh, one zeros uh, let's say uh, random numbers okay yeah so as i told before let's say uh, you can so this is the list so here whatever you see np dot array inside that you have something called list one comma two comma three so that is generally a list right so using that list you are creating an array here so np dot array which returns an array uh, uh, data here and the second one we spoke uh, spoke about is zeros so zeros is the predefined function as i specified you need to just give you give the structure of that array so here we specified three cross four so which means three rows and four columns so all zeros you will get that zeros here and for random so you gave two comma two and you will get the random number of uh, random numbers here it's not defined so you just get the random numbers here got it so let's get into hands-on uh, of creating an array okay so let's start uh, okay let's get into the notebook so hope you guys can also try it out by yourself so yeah let's start uh, with under creating any one dimensional array right let's it's very fast so let's not spend uh, much of the time here okay so first uh, we all see um, importing let's say numpy okay and you see uh, you create an array of one dimensional right so this is the list in so you are creating an array using a list so inside this one comma two comma three is a list and you are creating a numpy using that list so and you see that uh, this is the list so this is a one dimensional array similarly as you need a two dimensional array uh, you can create let's say if you see i'm creating two dimensional array and similarly and you can create a three dimensional array as well so nothing changes here so using a list we are defining what array you need okay and just to give more idea where do we use this uh, majorly right uh, so majority of the application uh, we will be using through lists only so we already have a data uh, which is created so using that only we kind of create the numpy arrays for our manipulations let's say list could come from uh, let's say it could be in python data frame there you have a column that could be created as list and then you could convert that to a numpy array but this numpy as zeros and uh, random uh, all that would be on a very rare occasions but you will also need that let's say you are building uh, in uh, function by yourself you want to create an uh, empty uh, one arrays okay in that case you will be creating numpy there but for random generation you want to build a, a test model let's say uh, you have some random numbers need to be generated you you are building a test model so that will be useful during the random as well okay 
So majorly you will be using the list uh, through list. You will creating an arrays. So that's the major use case in the real world you will be seeing. So now we have created the array. So now we'll discuss about initialization of an array, right? So what is the differentiation difference between uh, creating an array and initializing array is that while you create the array can be empty as well, right? So let's say you create just an array without any elements in it. But when you initialize, you are entering some values in the array. So these are the two major differences of an creating an array or an initializing an array. Okay. You can initialize a NumPy array in like uh, the ways we have created the array previously, right? So it could be an empty array, right? Um, and using the predefined functions or let's say uh, empty list, all that you can create that. Okay. That's the major differences. Once you initialize, you'll be entering the values in the array. Cool. So, right. So here there are the other examples of initializing an array, right? We can also try this out. Cool. So here we are saying uh, we have an um, array of two cross two, which is uh, using full and and you are specifying what is the value that two cross two array should have, right? So as you give two cross two, that is the uh, dimension of the array. Um, and then what is the value you need to have is five. So you need to have the value of five everywhere, right? So then, so if you see this arrange, right? So you can have diff values that you need to different. Let's say uh, you can have values 10 to 25 in the gap of five, okay? But let's say when you give different uh, value one, you will get a different results. So you will have 10, 11, 12, all that. So in that increasing order, you can get that data as well, okay? Similarly with line space, okay? So here you are giving, so let's say uh, you are arranging six and five, okay? So in that, in that function, if you see line space, so you have five comma 10, okay? So inside that, how many elements you want to have, okay? So how, what is the space between two elements, right? So here you have given only five, so that you get the extra uh, elements with that, uh, let's say uh, uh, decimal places, right? How, how do you want to define the spaces here? Okay. So let's also try this out, array initializations, okay? So if you see arrange, right? Arrange is nothing but you need to specify the starting value and the ending value and the gap between that, okay? So here I've given starting value to be uh, 10 and ending value be 25. And just to keep in mind, ending value will not always come into the array, right? So as I given 25 and it need to be increment 5, 5, the 25 is the last element. Those are, that's why we are not getting. So in this case, we have 10, 15 and 20 and we do not have 25. Similarly, here I need to have starting element to be 10, ending element to be 25, but in between I can have 1. So it need to increment by 1. Hence, we have the value still 24. I hope you understood the function arrange. So this will be used extensively in the real world application. So this is one dimensional array only. So we are creating just one dimensional array here. And what does one mean is how do we increment this data? So if you see here, so we have 10, we have 25. Okay. And we need to increment and we need to value have values from 10 to 25. Okay. And from 10 to 25, you need to increment that value by one. So that's what this value one mean. Okay. Let's say if I give two here, it will increment by two. So 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 24, 24. It uh, stops at 24. It will not have the last value of that. Okay. So now we understood about the initialization, the ways we can initialize the arrays. Okay. Next comes the important part. So you have created an array. You need to understand how does that array looks. So what is the shape of the array? Uh, all that. What is the number of elements in that array? All that, right? So in that case, we call something called incep in inception. So you need to inspect how an array is looking like. So that's where uh, you will know how the array structure is. For example, you need to know 
how many columns that an array has, how many rows it has, or uh, how many elements an array has. Okay, so you will get an idea about the array. Okay, so in this case, the first one, which is shape, so shape will give you the array dimension. So which is, uh, it is two cross two dimension, or is it one cross ten, uh, or let's say two cross three. What is the shape of an array? And using this, you can also resize the array. Okay. What do I mean by resize here? Let's say you have two cross two array. So which means you have four elements in that array, which is two dimensional array. Okay. So you are con you can convert that array into one dimensional one cross four array. So which becomes all uh, all records will be one row itself. So you can use the same shape function to resize the array as well. Okay. Then size. Okay. And what does that size will give you is what is the type, let's say, uh, what is the number of elements that is present inside the, uh, let's say, in an array and dimension. So what is the dimension of a given array? Okay. And then D type, which means what is the uh, data type of the array? So it could be int, it could be float. As I said, it could have the uh, numerical values inside an array, right? Cool. So as you see here, uh, first thing is shape of the array. As I said, as you give a dot shape, so for this array, so which is two cross three, which means you have two rows and three columns. A dot shape will give you the shape of the array. And let's say if you want to change the shape of an array, as I said previously, which is two cross two, you want to change that to three cross two, which means you need to have it it will have the same number of elements so keep in mind that you cannot convert this to three cross three because you do not have so many elements in it you have just six elements so that need to be sure if that is there you will get an error so in that case so you are converting two cross two array into three cross two so as you convert that you can see you have three rows and two columns okay then the size so if you give the size of an array, so you will get how many elements are inside an array. Okay. As you already know, np.arrange will create the number of elements, whatever the value you have given. As you create that, you give the size of that, you will know what is the number of elements that is present inside an array. Okay. And then you will have the dimension. Okay. As we see, what is the dimension of an array? Okay, so here you see, so as you give the dimension, the first dimension, you will have only one. Okay, and the B, you reshape that to three, uh, two cross, four cross, three, right? So that uh, the you uh, just reshape the uh, A element itself. That's when your dimension changes to three. Okay, let's also try this out in the, uh, yeah, I have left one thing here. The other thing we have seen in the ins inspection is what is the data type of an array? So it could be float, it could be int, all that. So as you give D type, we'll understand the data type of an array. Let's try out this in the coding. So we all know we have created a uh, array here through a list, which is two cross three. Okay. So there could be many different arrays uh, in real world that would be created. You want to understand that shape of that array. Okay. So here, if you want to understand that, so you will give B dot shape. So what does that give you? It will give you how many rows it has, how many columns it has, right? In this case, we have two rows and three columns. I hope uh, this is clear. So first one we have seen a shape. And using the shape itself, we can, uh, first we can understand the shape of the array and also we can change the shape of an array, right? So in that case, we have this data B equal to shape is equal to two cross three. Let's say we want to change this B uh, shape of this array into three cross two, right? Into three rows, two columns. So once we have done that, we see, the shape of this array has been changed, right? And reshape is same as transpose of matrix. In some sense, it's the same thing, right? Let's say, uh, you. but in terms of transpose, 
uh, you need to like it's the single operation. You are transposing rows into columns, right? But in this case, it's not that you are not you are not just saying uh, you are transposing from uh, rows. I mean, from rows to columns, columns to rows. That does not happen here. In this case, you can even transpose this into one row as well. So if, let's say I can also transpose this into um, let's say b dot shape equal to uh, one comma six, sorry. So in that case, I'll get my B as um, one, just one row of all elements, right? So that will happen here. So keep in mind, it's not same as that. As I told the previous example I gave you was rows into columns, columns rows, you would have understood that as in transpose but you can uh, transform this, uh, reshape the value into any any way that you wanted, right? Given you are giving the shape that matches with the number of elements that is present inside the array, okay? I hope the shape is clear. Let's move to the next one, okay? So next one is the size of an array. So size is nothing but how many elements are present in an array, right? So here, if you see B dot size, so you will get six. So the number of elements that is present inside an array, right? So then you have something called and them. So you get what is the dimensional of an array. So this is two dimensional array, right? Um, and you can also have like a three dimensional array. For example, here, I convert this uh, into a three dimensional array, for example, Right. So now we have like three dimensional array, right? So you get three dimensional array. So what is the dimension of an array you have? So you need to make, you need to understand the difference between size and the dimension. Dimension is how many dimension you have, right? Here you have three dimension. If you see, we have two square brackets and everything you have one square bracket. So we have three dimensional of the uh, array here, uh, array. So that's what dimension is. The shape is how many rows and how many columns you have, right? And then you have something called D type. So that tells you what is the type of the data present inside the array. So here we have int data. So that's what D type means, okay? So here, if you see, we have only one dimension. One dimension I mean is we have only one uh, bracket of sort, right? So you have one dimensional uh, array here. So if you see dimensional of this is one, right? And if you see the size, size is four, okay? So if you just be clear on this, so just one dimensional, uh, which is size is four. There is only row here, there is no column at all. That is what is one dimension here, okay? And let's change this into two dimensional without changing anything, right? So here I've just added one more square bracket here. And if you see the dimension, it becomes two, okay? And size of this would be right four. Ah, oh, sorry, size. We should see shape, man. Sorry. Okay. So here, if you see, I've created two brackets. So how many dimensions it has? It is different from the shape you have. Okay. So that's the difference between dimension and shape. I hope it's clear. Even. Uh, even then I'll, re if not, even I'll repeat again, okay? So the shape is number of rows into number of columns. And dimension is how many dimension you have. You can have one dimension, two dimension, three dimension. It's code wise, it's specified based on the number of square brackets you use. So just to give an idea where this dimension will be useful is, let's say you are creating an image based data, right? Image data is always three-dimensional data, okay? 
so one object will have three dimensional values inside three dimensional you have every array will have one cross 28 data right so in that case so one data point with three dimension each dimension will have uh, one cross 28 elements inside that let's jump into array mathematics right uh, so in any given array you can do all the uh, previously we have understood uh, how do we inspect an array how do we create an array uh, how do we initialize an array all that right now uh, you have created an array uh, you know how do you understand uh, array let's say how do you inspect an array by saying what is the size of an array uh, how many what are the number of values of an array that is present right so using array mathematics you can understand or do uh, uh, mathematical operations inside the values of an array will understand different function that will be used to understand the different mathematical operations okay so these are the few of the function that inside the numpy we can do mathematical comparison so yeah so this is more self explanatory it's not that uh, something tedious but all this mathematical functions which is present inside the array itself for any two given values, you can perform this mathematical, uh, let's say numpy dot sum, which will give you, let's say a plus b, and let's say you have subtract, which is a minus b, similar to exponential, uh, square root, uh, sine, cos, uh, logarithm of a value. Okay. Uh, see, these are the basic mathematical function that could also be performed using a uh, numpy uh, package. Okay. These are the functions inside the numpy package. As you can see, these are the uh, code implementations of that. So the first one here is uh, you have two values inside an array, which is 10 comma 20. So as you do numpy per sum, you get 30. So that's an addition of that. And here it's these, the, these are the values direct. Okay. Here you see numpy of sum 0 comma 1 and 0 comma 5 axis is equal to 0. Okay. So what does access specify here is, so are you want to do a row operation or a column operation, right? So if you want to do a row operation, which is you are adding on the uh, rows, you specify uh, one, okay? Uh, and if you want to do specify column operation, you specify zero, okay? The first one, access equal to zero, which is a column operation. There, what do you do here is, Z, column is what? So if you see the column is, uh, first column has zero and zero here. Zero plus zero equal to zero plus the other column. The second column is one and five, okay? So in that one and five here turns out to be six. So here we have done a column operation. When axis equal to one, you do a row operation. So in the first row, you have the values of zero and one. Second row, you have the values of 0 and 5. So once you add 0, 1, you get the value of 1. When you do an operation in the uh, row of the second row, 0, 5, you get the 5, right? So this is the in terms of addition. We can do addition in a like plain uh, one dimensional, two dimensional, and uh, inside that, we can specify do we need to do a row operation or a column operation. So this is the difference you need to be noting down here, okay? So then, right, we can also do element-wise comparison, right? So here, what are we trying to do here is, we are trying to compare uh, doing an element-wise comparison. So if you want to see here, we want to say, we have like three rows, okay? So we having like three rows, inside these three rows, is it equal or not, okay? So as we, uh, sorry, uh, we have like uh, three rows and three columns. So here we are comparing np dot, uh, np dot equal a comma b. So as we are doing an element wise uh, comparison, we are saying is one and two are same, which is false. And two and four is it same, which is false. Is four and four same? That's what is true, okay? And here, what we are trying to do here is, row wise comparison actual uh, full row wise comparison so as you see here we are comparing np dot equal a comma c okay 
So what does A comma C give you? So we see all the rows, uh, sorry, here also it's uh, element wise operation. So all, uh, all the rows compared to, uh, uh, let's say uh, A and C are same, which is one is equal to one, two is equal to two, four is equal to four. All the values here are uh, true. And here we are doing an array wise comparison. So we are comparing the entire array is it equal to the uh, uh, the second array okay as we do the entire array wise comparison one two comma four so here is array equal to a comma b so we are comparing is a equal to b so both are not same so once you do this you get the uh, array wise comparison equal to false right so if you do the same thing with a comma c you will get true because a and C are exactly same type of an array. Okay. So here there are two things we are trying to do. One is element wise comparison. The other one is array wise comparison. In element wise comparison, we are comparing the elements inside the array. Are they equal or not? So as, so the result of an array would be equal to the number of dimensions, uh, sorry, number of columns that is present inside the array, right? So here we have three elements. That's why we have three uh, values. But when you do an array wise comparison, it's just the entire array. Is it equal to the other array? So that's when you get A comma B, which is false. Just the one value here. Okay. So yeah, then uh, whatever we discussed previously, we can all do this uh, aggregate functions here. So what does an aggregate function, right? So you are trying to specify the entire value of the data into some aggregate value. One is sum, so one is mean, median, uh, then uh, correlation, standard deviation, all that, correlation, coefficient, standard deviation, all that, okay? So given any array, you can find all this mathematical operations for that array, okay? Right, so let's get into this array mathematics. So please everybody uh, open their, uh, let's say uh, notebook and let's try out this uh, mathematical operations starting from addition. So first let's try out with the um, uh, elements. So let's create an array from the list and try out this addition. So undo row wise uh, addition, also do the row wise, uh, sorry, column wise addition, right? So let's jump into the, uh, uh, let's say, um, are the um, mathematical operations and let's get our hands dirty. Okay. So everybody open their uh, notebook and try out the operations. Uh, it could be a simple, uh, but still once you, when you try it out, you will understand uh, the syntax or how do you need to define few things. So you will get to understand that uh, in the beginning itself. So you need, don't need to spend uh, if you have any doubts or stuck somewhere in future. Okay. So first one, we'll just see the array comparison we did previously, right? So first let's start with the array comparison, which is element wise comparison. Okay, here, just to be clear, I'm repeating this again. Again, Here we have A equal to one comma two comma four. Okay, let's, uh, for simplicity, let's remove the C uh, as uh, from our code itself. Okay, so here we have one, two comma four and two, four, four. Okay, you are comparing the elements Okay, here you see three values. So because you are doing an element wise comparison, if four is only four is equal to four, that's when you get true, okay? But when you do row wise comparison, right? So you get array wise, uh, so you get only one value if the entire uh, array is equal to the other array. So as you see here, A is exactly same as C, that's when you see true. But when you compare the same thing, A comma B, so you get false because this entire row is not same as this entire row. So array A is different from array B, okay? So in terms of element comparison, you just check the elements inside. Got it? Cool. Yeah. So I'm not going into this uh, aggregate functions. This is very direct to so sum min, uh, median, all that would be directly there. Uh, let's get into the uh, mathematical uh, operations, okay? So let's take some array first. This is just direct one. 
and we'll start with two dimensional one that's where things get interesting right so you have two dimensional data which is um let's say zero comma five and one one comma six okay so as i said earlier axis equal to zero um sorry for that sorry As I said earlier, when axis equal to zero, you do the column wise addition, right? So if you see five plus six equal to 11, zero plus one equal to one. And similarly, if you do change it to axis equal to one, you do row wise addition. So zero plus five, which is five and one plus six, which is seven, okay? I hope you guys are clear about element wise comparison and uh, mathematical addition. It goes same with the, uh, let's say subtraction, multiplication, all that. And just to be clear, uh, you need to be make sure this axis uh, value, this will also be uh, useful in the Pandas data frame as well. So first one is the uh, element wise comparison. Okay, so NP dot equal comma A comma B. So what does this do is, it does an uh, element wise comparison. So it sees each of the elements inside this uh, array. Is it similar to the each of the element inside the uh, of the B? So it sees in the same index. So this is this like three values here, three values here. It's exactly compared with the same index in the B. So as it compares, so it sees first element here. Is it matching with the first element? No, nope, it's false. Similarly, second element here. Is it matching with the second element? No. Nope. And third element only matches here. That's why it is an element wise comparison. Okay. Which is NP dot equal. Then we have uh, array uh, wise comparison where we use NP dot array underscore equal. So where we compare the entire array. Is the entire array similar to the entire array? That's when it gives the value true. Otherwise, it's false. It will not do an element wise comparison. Right. So here we use function called array. Here A and B are totally different. Uh, the array is different. That's why we get false. Uh, but when we compare A and C, which is A is one comma two comma four, even C is one comma two comma four, we get true for this. Okay. I hope you guys are clear uh, in the element wise comparison and row wise comparison, right? Then we have the aggregation functions. Here, the important point to notice the row wise uh, addition and the column wise addition. It goes same with the subtraction, multiplication, division, everything, right? So here, uh, so division would not come into here, but yeah, uh, here it will, if you do an uh, NP dot sum, the aggregation function here. So as you do 0, 5 and 1, comma C. So this is a two dimensional array. So if you see axis equal to zero, you do column wise uh, aggregation. So the column wise aggregation here is, if you see this array, it will look like this. I'll just print this array. So you have array like this, which is zero comma five, one comma six, right? So in this case, if you do column wise addition, it will be like five, come, five and six, five plus six, which is 11 and uh, zero plus one, which is one. So axis equal to zero is column wise addition and axis equal to one is row wise addition. Row wise is what? Zero comma five, which is five, zero plus five and one plus six, which is seven. This is row wise addition. So this is what you need to note. Uh, so this will be uh, same when you are doing the pandas operations as well in data frames, okay? Yeah. So when you don't specify, as I said before, if you do shift and tab, you will understand uh, the documentation of any function, okay? Once you don't specify any axis here, it does the entire sum of values, okay? So here, let's say entire sum is like six plus one, seven plus five, which is 12. Uh, so it, it does not do any row wise or column wise addition here. Got it? So yeah, right now we have, indexing and slicing in NumPy, okay? So what does indexing and slicing mean, okay? 
So you have, uh, right now we were working with very uh, small, uh, like dummy uh, data, right? We have created our own arrays, uh, all that. But in real world, we'll deal with uh, millions of rows, thousands of rows, and you will not, uh, and thousand, hundreds of columns as well, hundreds to like 500 of columns as well, that's possible. So in that cases, you will not need all the rows, all the columns, uh, for any uh, uh, analysis or any uh, model building in that case, right? Or you might need to do data manipulations or uh, do, uh, let's say, uh, uh, for a specific row, you want to change for a specific value, okay? Let's say you are treating for a missing value, you want to do a spec for a specific column. So in that case, you need to do all this indexing, okay? In terms of slicing, Let's say you have a very big array. You want to split that into uh, trying and test uh, values, right? You you need to slice that arrays into different things and understand that. So this is for the world of machine learning, okay? But let's say you go into the world of images, okay? Images are also uh, specified in terms of an array. In terms of that, you can have very big images, but you will not be interested in the whole images. You want to cut the images into smaller images, then take that to the training. So you want to slide this, slice that images into different subgroup, then use that uh, slides to, uh, images for training, okay? So this indexing and slicing in NumPy has different uh, use cases in real world, okay? So yeah, so as we know, there are two things. So slicing here, we uh, sorry, indexing here starts with zero. So position, let's say you have an uh, index like this and zero is the starting position. It's same as a list. So as you give, uh, you have an array of zero to 10. Uh, let's say if you give uh, A of zero, you get the first value there. And there is one more thing you note, you need to notice. Let's say you need the values from the last, okay? So then you can specify the values from the last. So you can also see the index values here. You can see, you can take from the beginning, which starts from zero. If you want to take from the last, let's say if you want to take from the uh, right and uh, right to left, then you can specify the values from minus one to minus twelve. So the last value depends on the length of the array you have. Okay, and similarly the uh, index, I mean the previous indexing as well. So if you want to go from left to right, note that you start with zero. If you want to go from right to left, you start with minus one. And let's say if you want to slice this data. So this is similar as rows and columns, right? So index always start with zero, okay? So as you give A of zero comma zero, okay? You get the value, first value of that array, okay? Which is one. And let's say you just need value of the first row. So then you give, I need all columns, just the row, okay? which is A of zero, that's it. You will not give any value for the column index. Similar for the column, let's say you need all the uh, rows, uh, but you just need the column, which is A of zero, that's it, okay? I'll show you the code for that, but just understand this how slicing works, cool? So whatever I told you before, this is how it works, okay? So if you give A of zero, which includes all elements from the first row, okay? So if you give A of zero, which includes all of elements from the first row, okay? And if you give all, uh, e even like, there is an other way of doing that as well. If you give A of uh, dot one, okay? So what does it say is, you just extract the first row from the array, which is this. So you can slide, you can do the slicing of first row in two ways, okay? And let's say you need to extract till row zero, okay? So that's what this does. So you need just the first row, that's what this does, okay? And in the other part, you need to extract till row zero and just you need the values of row one as well, okay? So in this, you are selecting the values of two and three, which is defined by this, and you just take the column of column index one, okay? So this then will select the column index starting from the first till last. So slicing for this would be two comma three. Got it?
and let's say you need to slice till two okay extract values till row two so when you give uh, a of a two so you select all values of the first two rows okay then let's say you need to extract till only the first row so then you specify row of two and one is to one so here these are the ways you can slice and dice and any array okay so same as that you can change uh, your indexing in different way you can try it out your code to understand how you can slice and dice this code to extract the sub part of the array okay so you guys all understand, let's say you have rows, which is zero, one, and two, okay? And column zero, one, and two, which is three cross three matrix or three cross three array here, okay? In this case, let's say you want to just select elements from the first row, which is zero index, okay? How do I do that? What do I specify here is, which is, zero a of zero this is one way you can extract the values of the first row which is highlighted in blue color okay a of zero will just give you the first row of values got it and is there is one more way you can just select the first row only okay. here when you give a square brackets is to one what does this mean is I just need rows till the first row. So uh, this one means before, so one is the second row actually, right? Because we know one, uh, our index starts from zero. So if you give one here, you get all values till one, okay? So then this will also extract the same first row for you. Got it? Uh, once this understand, uh, if this is clear, then I'll go to the next part. So I hope this first plot is clear. So if if you give a of zero, a of zero, then it gets just the first row, which is highlighted in blue. And uh, the other way of getting just the first row of an array is if you give a is to one, okay, a colon one, it gets the value still the first row, okay. So here, the first row starts from zero. First index starts from zero, second is one. So before one, what all rows you have, you will get it. So once you give two here, you will get first row, which is zero row, and the first row, which is one, two, three, and four, five, and six. So first two rows you will get if you give A colon two. So here I've given only one. So you will get the only the one, two, and three, okay? So this is how you index for the first row. And then, okay, so as we said, A of one, uh, A of uh, colon one will get you only the first row. Then if you want to do get only the values of, uh, let's say, uh, from uh, two and three, okay, which is highlighted in dark red, okay. So here, if you see the first before the comma, A of colon one, which represents the column, the second part which represents the rows okay so what does it tell you is first it selects only the first column okay so here i just need columns till one so which is the first column and the second part one column which tells you that i need value starting from one so which is two and three so what do you filter from this is two and three that's it so just to repeat here again, here just we are, if you just give you one value here, it thinks that is rows, you are filtering for rows. But if you want to filter both for rows and columns, you need to filter, uh, let's say colon one. So colon one means you need values till one, okay? So value till index one is the first row. You have selected the first row, then you need to filter for uh, the column wise. So there, if you give one column, which is one comma two, so there you will get two one three, right? If you want to make a career in data science, then IntelliPath has IIT Madras Advanced Data Science and AI Certification Program. This course is of very high quality and cost effective, as it is taught by IIT professors and industry experts. So we have this array, okay? So I'm printing this array. So now we have 
uh, array of one comma two comma three. Uh, one let's create three dimension three rows. Okay, it will be more clear. Okay, we have three rows here. Okay, now I need to select just the first row. If you want to just select the first row, I can give zero. So what does this give me? Just the first row, which is one comma two comma three. And there is one more way I can do this, which is is to one. So what does this tell me is, so if you just give you one value here, it tells me I need to select values till one index. So just to repeat here, this is index zero for row. This is index one for row. This is index two for row. Okay. So till one, till one means which is one is not included. But if I give two here, what will happen? Uh, can somebody answer? What would be the output of B uh, colon two? I'm looking into the chat. First two rows. That's right, Preeti. So you will get the first two rows. So now you get first two rows, right? So what does this tell you is index zero and index one. I need index zero and index one. Got it? So now you understood about row level slicing. Let's get into the column level sizing as well. Okay. Now we selected. So now what I want is from this, I just need two, one, three. Okay. The values from the first row, and I just need two, one, three columns. Okay. In that case, let me print B again. So first thing I would be doing is slicing the row, right? So if I just need the first row, what I need to give it here is one. So I got one. So if I need to do a column filter, I'll add comma here, then from one, one is two if I give. So it's starting from one. So it will not include one, index one, it will start from that. So from index one, I need the values. So index one will be one. So here, this is the index one right in column. So this is the one, four, one, which is index zero, two, five, two, which is index one, and three, six, four, which is index three, right? So if I do this here, this is the column filter. This is the row filter. And one thing you need to keep in mind is row filter will not include till the value you give. Okay. So here, this, this last value will not include the last row. Okay. So here you are just selecting the first row as you give one. But in this case, as you give one is two, it's starting from one. So because this is the index of one, you are starting from one until whatever the value is present. Okay, so this is the index for first row, second row. Uh, this is the index, zero index, first index, second index. Okay, so once you give colon one, what does it do is whatever the rows which is present till one. Okay, what is the rows present till one, which is zero. Okay, you will get only those value, which is one comma two comma three. Okay, and as you give uh, two here, it will take values the first two rows. If you give three here, you will get all three rows. And one more thing you can do here is you can also specify you need, let's say you just need these two rows. Okay. Here you can give one. So you need index one to index three. You don't even have index three. Okay. So that's when you get last two rows. Okay. So you're, we are clear about the slicing of rows. Okay. Let's get into slicing of both rows and columns. Okay. So this top things are the index of columns. Okay. So what do we want to do here is we need the values of two and three. Okay. From the first row. Okay. From the first row, first row, what is the index of first row is zero. What is the index of uh, first column is also zero. Okay. So we need the values of two, one, three. Got it? So if we want to filter for first row, we'll take one. This is what we have done previously. So it filters this part, right? Now, if you want to do a row filter here, right? You do a comma. This, this part talks about the row filter and the second part talks about the column filter, okay? So if you want to do a column filter, Okay, you want to column filter starting from one. Okay, starting from one. If you want to uh, va uh, value just for one, if you give one, you will just get the value of two. 
okay but you need all values till the end if you need all values till the end you add colon here so once you add colon here so uh, the filter for column is you need values of 2 comma 3 right so i need starting index from 1 till whatever the index is there we have only index till 2 so that's why we are getting 2 comma 3 right if you don't give any column right so anything let's say the colon it will go till end of the uh, row okay you, if you are not specifying anything the end value there it is still end of the row kiran photo so you are clear about slicing so this is the concept of everything right so so if you want to do two two rows as well i'll show you that okay so let's say you have this data first two rows and i need this column alone i'll just put that here six okay so i need the values of first two rows and uh, last two columns okay this is the value i need this is the whole concept of slicing so you are filtering sub part of an array that can be used okay and so given this you can uh, let's say solve uh, let's say filtering of an data into uh, given let's say if you think this as rows and columns in real world right let's say you might not need all rows and all columns so based on this operation, you can select specific rows and specific, specific columns that you need for your uh, analysis or uh, building any algorithm you wanted. Cool? Not included. Yeah. So dot number, it means the second value, which will not be included in that rows. Right? Yeah. First number will be included. First number will be included till the end. But the colon, the Preeti, whatever you're saying is that's right. Okay. And yeah, one more thing, right? I, I suggest you guys go back and uh, try out different slicing and uh, slicing from your end. So you will get a clear idea. Okay. Great guys. So now slicing is clear. Okay. So this is how it works. Okay. We have completed a demo. Let's get into the array manipulation, right? This is very simple concept, right? So it's very direct. So how do you uh, combine two arrays or uh, stack two arrays, uh, column stack, head stack, all that. But majorly uh, here we will be using concatenate in the real world. But yeah, we have other operations as well that might be used in different scenarios. It's good to know those operations. Let's see how these things work. Okay. So here you have concatenate. So concatenate is nothing but you have two arrays, which is A and B. So here you are just concatenating that array uh, into one array. Okay. So first array is one comma two comma four and two four two and second B is two comma four comma four. So you have concatenated this array into one array. Okay. And one more thing here. So when axis is zero, okay, here you are concatenating in the row wise. Okay. As axis changes to one, you will do column wise concatenation. So just keep in that, that in mind. So whenever there is an axis, you can do row wise and column wise operations. Got it? But let's say if you want, you, I mean, with the concatenation itself, you can do all this operation. But let's say if you want to do vertical operation. So the same thing would be done by V stack. Okay. So once you do V stack, which is vertical stacking. So that's what it means, right? So A comma B. So you are, you are concatenating a single array of A and single array, one dimensional array of B into two dimensional array of two cross three, right? That was, that's what V stack is doing. Got it? Great. So you have a similarity between the V stack and column wise, right? So column wise stack. Okay. So these both are same. So you are doing a vertical stack and the column wise stack. So that's same with the concatenation of uh, axis equal to zero and con and the head stack. So which is horizontal stack, so which is self-explanatory. But in real world, with the help of concatenation itself, you can do like most of the operation, column wise, row wise. So that's the major option we'll be doing. So we can be doing that with the axis with the help of axis itself. Let's say you have two arrays, which is A and other one is B. Okay. So uh, let me show you with a code, then it will be more simpler. What are A being with? Okay. So, uh, yeah. 
so if you see here right a is one array okay a is one array of three values so if you see in vertical stack a is one comma two comma four okay b is two comma four comma four so a is one array b is one array okay so when you do uh, numpy vertical stack a comma b so you are combining uh, two separate arrays into one two dimensional array ah uh, there is ah uh, there is no difference when you use axis zero mohammed so when you use axis zero it does row concatenation right so when you do axis one there is a difference ah uh, let's get into head split right so head split is nothing but horizontal split of any data okay so let's say you have a data you want to split that horizontally into uh, different values okay so here if if i have a data like this okay which has uh, four cross four values i want to uh, uh, horizontally split this values into uh, let's say uh, uh, let's say if the first one is 2 okay so when you give horizontal split of x comma 2 so you get two rows for each column right so everything is split into 0 comma 1 4 comma 5 3 comma 9 12 comma 13 all that it will be split okay and similarly when you see head split uh, of x okay and you want to do 3 comma 6 okay so in this case what will happen is you do not have that many values at all in your system right so you have like uh, only uh, 16 values cool so in that case what will happen is you do 3 uh, comma 6 here first split will happen but second split will be only the first column of this i hope uh, this would be bit confusing i'll repeat this again so first one we have 16 values when you uh, split into 2 cross t into 2 cross 2 that does not have an any value because you have 16 values entirely you can define based on that but the second one when you give 3 3 comma 6 you you need you have for the first array you have uh, the values you can have 3 comma 6 but for the second array you do not have so many values so you just take the first column here and put it there so this is what the horizontal split means nothing nothing to worry here okay so first one let's start from this right you have 4 cross 4 array which means you have 16 elements in it okay so the first thing you are saying is you need to split this into 2 uh, cross 2 array okay the uh, this part so this first array here you are splitting horizontally two two items each so here if you see you are splitting horizontally you are cutting this uh, array by 2 okay the second element so once you do that you split the first two columns into one array second two columns into one array first two columns into one array second two columns into one array which is 0 comma 1 4 comma 5 8 comma 9 12 comma 3 into one array and then 2 comma 3 6 comma 7 10 comma 11 14 comma 15 into one array so you are horizontally splitting at the second uh, column yeah so the first one is clear similarly now you are doing an horizontal split of 3 comma 6 so in this case you do not have so many values right so what happens here is you take all three first rows that's fine okay so that's what is 1 2 3 till 12 till 14 would be there three rows three columns would coming here but you do not have for the other uh, array itself so in for that you will take only first column that's it i hope now it's clear you are just splitting the uh, uh, array horizontally based on the values specified so in python okay uh, pandas is a library uh, it's not just sticking with uh, let's say uh, one kind of data structure right so using pandas you can have a very popular data structure called data frames and and it's all the data manipulations that cannot done by the native python itself so we have built pandas so that can be used and which has so many predefined functions for joining uh, merging concatenating and data manipulation for filtering all that 
there are a lot of predefined functions. We'll understand all, all the predefined functions uh, with the demo as well, okay? And how much time required to type a code is very minimalistic compared to if you want to write the uh, code from the base, okay? So this helps to save our coding time and as well, uh, we have so many predefined functions, so it makes our life very easier to handle all this data structures. So then, let's say um, when we have seen arrays, we have seen only arrays can handle same data type in an array, right? And the amount of data that we can use or let's say uh, that we can process in array is very less, okay? Given pandas, we can work with very large amount of data sets, okay? You have 500K and like more than 500K of records. So that's when uh, the pandas is very useful. And one more good part of put pandas is we can have different data types. So there are different columns, every column with a different data type. It also supports string, it supports, uh, let's say, int, float, all the data types. Okay, so given that so you can one data set with different features, the pandas is supported. And inside the pandas, you have the predefined functions which helps to clean the data and manipulate the data and derive insights from the data. Okay. Good. So from the papers, right, what the documentation talks about pandas. So pandas, it it another a popular open source tool as we have seen in NumPy. It's also open source tool for data analysis and manipulation, which is built upon Python language itself. Okay, and it can be it is widely used by everyone. And as it's open source, it's free, and we can modify the functions uh, inside the pandas. So you can also support pandas community as well. So it's flexible and it's faster for the larger data set usage, okay? So yeah, so Panda's name is derived from panel data. So the panel data is multidimensional data involving measurements over time, okay? So Panda's can have different, as I said, different data types. So if you have, I hope everybody would have seen an Excel or a CSV file, right? In a given Excel, uh, one column would be named, which is of string type, the other column would be a uh, roll number, which is of int, and the other column would be, uh, let's say, salary, which is of float or double. So all that. So given in that case, so that data could also be imported into Pandas, and we can work on that data set. Okay. So that is um, on one simple uh, example we have it here. And who created Pandas, right? So West Vacancy around 2015, uh, he has created the uh, uh, like uh, uh, pandas. Okay. So as we have seen earlier, um, how do we import NumPy is simple. Import NumPy as MP. Same import pandas as PD. So just to note here, PD, you can give any name there, right? It's just an object we are trying to call pandas. Okay. Uh, using PD, uh, that object, uh, we can call all the functions inside the pandas okay so if you can see the pandas can hold any type of data let's say it could be an arbitrary matrix or a tabular data with different uh, data types so here you see there is a customer id and first name and what is the birth date which is a timestamp the address again is a string and the state and zip code is an integer and pandas can also store a time series data so time series data is nothing but so you have a time series column, which has date and what is the changes of uh, value of that data. So for example, you are recording a temperature in a given day from morning to evening on every minute, okay? So every minute would be the time series date column value and temperature during that time would be the data, okay? Um, in a, any given day, right? Uh, for example, if you take temperature, temperature is not going to be the same throughout the day. So every hour, the temperature would be different, uh, right? So that whatever is the changing data. So for every uh, hour, we are noting down what is the change in temperature. So that that's what I mean by change in data. See, that's how, uh, Vikram, that's how it is stored, right? So it, it is not that it cannot hold, uh, it can hold images inside that. So it's more for the uh, structured data. Uh, that's how the pandas is built for. 
it's like uh, you are asking, let's say you have built a relational database and why can't it load something like unrelational database? That's not possible. So that's how Pandas is built more for a structured data. So you have defined how the data should look like. That's how the data will flow into that. We cannot suddenly uh, add image uh, to an Pandas uh, data, features of Pandas, okay? So as I said before, previously, uh, Pandas can Pandas has two things. One is series object and a data frame object, okay? Um, then uh, you can uh, handle missing data using Pandas. You can do an alignment, which is more like uh, data alignment in the Pandas. And you can group the data. Let's say uh, you have uh, different fields. For example, you have city-wise, uh, there are a number of customers uh, in a data and you want to know uh, city-wise how much, what is the average salary of the customer. So you can group by that city, understand what is the average salary of all customers being in that city, okay? Subsetting of data, right? So you can do that and uh, you can index the data. So you want specific columns in a data frame, you can do that. And let's say you have two data frames, uh, two, uh, two, data, two files, you can merge two files, okay? And there are different ways we kind of combine uh, two files, right? Uh, there are different functions for that, uh, merging, joining, reshaping, okay? So we kind of, uh, let's say, uh, go detail when to use what and hierarchical labeling of access and which means let's say uh, uh, can you change the labeling of access so there is a specific labeling that is given to access can you change that and there are time series capabilities uh, in the pandas as well okay so we'll look everything one by one cool so first thing previously we have seen numpy uh, now we are talking about pandas so we need to understand when to use pandas, when to use numpy, what are the advantages of using uh, pandas, right? So pandas perform um, better than numpy when you have so many rows, let's say 500 plus, uh, 500K plus rows, when you have that, you mostly go with pandas, uh, which is built for that. And numpy is perform what for and better for an a data, which is lesser, less than 50K rows. And Pandas supports a series object and is more flexible because it has labels to it, okay? You can create our own labels. So previously in array, whatever is given, zero, one, two, three, we talked about, that is defined. You cannot have create new labels for that. So in this uh, Pandas, there are other advantages itself. So Pandas can hold different data types on different columns, right? You can, one column could be uh, of, uh, let's say, uh, a customer, one column could be of, uh, uh, let's say, a roll number, other column could be of salary. So it's more human readable compared to the NumPy. So as a CSV file or an Excel file, you have it in the system, you can directly load into Pandas and visualize that. So it's more human readable, uh, very, uh, let's say, close to how we see the data itself. So that's when a Pandas is more powerful. As a data scientist, more than NumPy, right? As a, when you are doing so many analysis, or uh, building machine learning models, 90% uh, uh, of the time we'll be working with Pandas data frames, okay? So yeah, so as I said, there are data structures in Pandas. So one is series. So series is nothing but a series of numbers, which is holding same type of data. So it's similar to array, okay? But which is labeled. So if you can see here in the first example, you have labels for an uh, series. Then the data frame, right? So the data frame is nothing but a two-dimensional tabular structured data, which can have columns. So let's say if you are loading something from a CSV file, uh, you have some column as player uh, and points and title. So you can load that data. So that will be uh, stored as a data frame, uh, data frame um, data structure, okay? And there is one more thing, panel, right? So which holds, which is same as uh, data frame, but it's in different dimension. But in real world, we will be mostly working with the data frames um, and some part of so some time we'll be working with series, but we will be concentrating only on the data frame here. That's what, uh, that's what uh, we'll be working in the real world, okay? Cool. 
So let's get into Panda's uh, series object and data frames. How will it you how will it look like? How do you create the series object? So let's start with series, right? So what is a series object? As I said, series in one dimensional array which contain uh, same or different data types in it, but series has a label to it, okay? Uh, so inside that you could have any type, but all the values in the series should be of the same type. Let's say if you say float, all the values should be float. Uh, let's say if you are int, it all values should be int, right? And, and then you will have labels to the series, cool? And if you want to create an empty series, so you will start pd.series. pd is the object uh, we have imported. Let's say import pandas as pd. Cool. So that's how we create an empty series. And we can also uh, create series from uh, numpy uh, uh, arrays. Let's say if you have a array uh, or a list here, so you can create a series from that as well. Okay. And if you can see, we have index for an series and this index can be changed. Let's say here index is A, B, C, D and we can change this to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and the default would be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So let's understand the series with uh, coding uh, so it will be more clear for you guys. I, I request everybody to open uh, the notebook and try this out with me before going into the data frames. Cool. So in order to create an empty series, we are using function of series, okay, pd of uh, series. So here we create an, here we have created an empty series, okay. So if you can see here, um, let me zoom a bit, if that's not more clear. So if you can see here, we have created an empty series of data type float, which is default, okay. And as I said before, you can also create series uh with from a list so here we have a b c d so this is a list of values and if you want to create the series you are creating from that once i print it you can see the default index so this values 0 1 2 3 that is the default index that will be given to a series okay but let's say if you want to change that index to different uh values you can provide that index as well so here, what I have done is I have created the same series, uh, sorry, list of values, but I have specified how my index should look like. So here, my index is one, two, three, four. So as I do this, my index values are starting from one to four. And it's not that you can just create index with numbers, right? You can also create index with, uh, let's say, alphabets as well. So if you see the index right now for a series is A, B, C, D, okay? So this is how we create any series. It's same, uh, it's an one, it, if you look the data, it's kind of a one dimensional array, but this can hold any data type. It can hold integer, it can hold float, it can hold string. So, it, and you can also have an index that can be changed. So this is the overall point of a series, okay? So here, if you see, uh, first we'll starting with importing pandas as pd, okay? Then if you want to create an empty series, uh, this is the function for creating a series, okay? So you create, uh, there is a function series from pd object. So as you create this, you will get uh, empty series, okay? And the default data type of series is float, okay? Then let's say if you want to create a series with values. So here you have list of values here, which is A, B, C, D. And as I told, series can hold any data type, okay? It can also hold integers, it can also hold float, it can also hold strings, okay? So here, if you see this, we are creating an uh, object here. Uh, so series object from this. And as you see, uh, I said uh, index, default index of the series starts with zero, zero to three, okay? And we can also change this index to our uh, requirement. Let's say if you want an index starting from one, two, three, four. Okay. So if you see here, 
you can also create a series with a different index so here the default index will be starting from 0 to 3 and here the uh, we have given the index which is 1 2 3 4 so that is what is given here so this index can also be changed to uh, like uh, alpha uh, values so it can also hold uh, 1 2 3 it can also hold a to b so it depends what we want to have the index of I hope things are clear right now. How do we create a series? Uh, what is the difference between series and then array? Okay. Let's say uh, the series of data uh, in real world, we'll be mostly using that series uh, when we want to uh, have, uh, let's say plotting. Okay. You have a Fonda's column. You'll get the data into a series data. Okay. And uh, one more useful uh, thing of a series. Let's say you have something called list. But in list uh, and let's say in arrays, you cannot hold all data types, right? Uh, list can have all data types, but in arrays, you cannot have all data types, okay? Series can hold even text data, okay? And you can change the index of uh, a series as well. So whatever the operations you want to do it in a single dimensional array, you can do that. And series object will be very helpful during uh, the data you want to convert uh, for a plotting exercise. So I'll explain that during the uh, matplotlib, uh, uh, let's say, uh, visualization class. But yeah, right now, just understand how the series data will look like. But in real world, as I said previously, uh, data frames are the one we'll be using for most of our uh, work, okay? So let's get into data frames, okay? So the data frame is nothing but a two dimensional data. So you have a labeled data structure, which has columns of different data types and the data frame is mutable. So what is mutable, which is uh, changeable and access as I uh, said, which is labeled, uh, you can change the access. So you have the column names. That's what is the access they call it. So you can have the column names. So it's more readable. So as I said previously, the data frames or the data types or data structures, that is more uh, close to the human readable formats. So as you see the data, anybody can understand data frame. You don't need to be a technical person there. So how you see an Excel, that's how you see the data frame. But the number of operations, the scale of data you can use is much bigger in data frames compared to any Excel, okay? So let's start understanding the basic syntax of a data frame, right? So in data frame, you have the data. So that's two dimensional data and it has an index. So index is the X axis and columns are the Y axis. Okay. And D type, which is the data type of an any object of the data. So you have the columns, which has, uh, let's say uh, the data type, which is, it could be string, or it could be, let's say, uh, uh, int, it could be float. Got it? So let's see how a basic uh, data frame would look like, right? Um, cool. So one thing here, we can create data frames from a series, we can create data frame from dictionaries, all that, okay? So you can see uh, we have a, a series of uh, examples. We can uh, create a data frame from a series on an array, or we can create a data frame from a dictionary as well. Okay. So let's get into the demo. So you will understand how does a data frame will look like, what all the data frames, how we can create, uh, let's say, what are the operations we can uh, do it in a data frame. Okay. So yeah, so as I said previously, we can create data frames by our own, but in real world, we will not be typing the data, right? We will not be creating the data, not by ourselves. So this is just for an example, we are creating the data like this, but generally we'll be importing the data from a CSV file or getting the data from a database, all that we will be doing it. So, but in order for a few examples, I'm creating a dummy data, so that we'll understand how the data frame will look like, okay? So here, if you see, this is a dictionary where we have a name and the column uh, and the data for it. Similarly, uh, we have a uh, other uh, column, which is like uh, add number and we have values here. This could be int as well. Let me show you that. So this is how a data frame will look like, 
Okay. So as I said previously, we have indexes, which is zero to three. So that is the, how do you uh, point and rows? Okay. And we have columns, which is name and add underscore number. And we have values. Okay. So these way, this is how a data frame will look like. And we can create how many of our columns we want, right? But as I said, in real world, we will not be creating data by ourselves. We'll be mostly importing data from a CSV files. Okay. And let's say cell or let's say, um, Let's move to the uh, operations, right? So we have, let's say, uh, first we'll understand, let's say you have two data frames, okay? So so how do you, let's say you have a uh, specific data datas in A, uh, which is data frame one, and there is other specific columns, which in data frame two. How do you combine these data frames into one data frame and analyze the data from that data frame? Okay, itself. So we have different operations here of combining two data frames. One is merge, the other one is join, other one is concatenate. Okay, so uh, let's understand each and every one of them and try it out as well. Okay. So the first point here is uh, merge and join. So combines the two data frames at the column levels. Okay, uh, and concatenate. Uh, combines the data into mul uh, of multiple data frames without any gaps. Let's say you have uh, same data, um, let's say which has A, B, C, D, and also there is another frame data frame which has A, B, C, D, okay, which has column names, which is of same type everything. So you want to combine uh, which has uh, two data frames into one data frame. So that is at the row level combination. You can also do at the column level combinations on that, right? So that is one thing, but merge and join are both are same, but there is a very minute difference between the merge and join that we will see with the demo so that you can understand how that gonna work. Okay. So before that, let's understand how, what are the types of merges and joins we can do. Okay. So this is a very important concept. Uh, it will be used in even uh, SQL as well. Let's say uh, wherever you have data, so you need to join two different data sources. So how do you join is the key point, right? Uh, so here, if you see an inner join, right? What does an inner join means is, let's say you have few columns, uh, let's say uh, you have few data sets in data frame one and few data sets in data frame two, okay? So if uh, you are joining based on a common column, whatever it matching between both, okay? Only that will be joined. Other, other rows will not be coming in the final result. Okay. And I will also show you with an example. Okay. And the other part, which is left join, where you will have a common column between data frame one and also data frame two. But what will happen is when you join based on that, all the records in data frame one will be there. But only the records which has matched with data frame one from data frame two will be in the final data frame, okay? And for the right join, which is totally opposite from the left join. So whatever is present in left table will be only there with whatever is not there in the uh, uh, right table will only be there. And whatever is matching from the left table to right table, that will be there. So other than that, nothing will be present in the data. So the outer join is whatever is matching, let's say between both the tables that will be in the same row, whatever is not matching in the data will be in a separate rows. So we'll go one by one on this, understand how the data gonna look like when you do inner join, right join, left join and outer join, okay? And one more thing here, in real world, we'll be working only, uh, well, I mean, I'll not say most of the time on inner join and left join, okay? Let's start understanding the merge, okay? So right now we have two data frames, which is DF1 and DF2. 
uh, even in real world, you will have data like this. Okay. So one data frame, which will have all the customer details. Okay. So for example, name, uh, what is their uh, number? For example, I call this as an uh, other number, then their address. And there is an other data frame, which will have uh, other number, only the other number, and then the salary. Okay. So let's say uh, you want to uh, create, for example, let's say if you want to uh, combine these two data frames, okay, merge into one data frame so that you can analyze uh, the data. Okay. So what we will do here is we will do merge. Okay. So you have merge uh, of DF1 and DF2, and there should be a common column between both the data frames, right? So we know the common column is other number. So which is AD underscore number here. And so as you do the common column, so if you see here, you get this data. So you have name, uh, other number, address, and the salary. So you can create this as an DF3. And you can use DF3. for your future analysis. So you have, so the basic understanding here is you have merged the two data frames. Okay. And so here, the basic uh, thing is how we have created this data frame, right? Here, if you see, so you can create the data frame in many number of ways. Okay. So here, how, how do you create a data frame? The basic type is inner. So inner is mean by this is how the basic join. So whatever is matching between both the columns that will be joined. But here there is no issue, right? So DF1 also has four rows all uh, with an other number of one to four. Here also there are four rows which has uh, other number of one to four. Okay. So that's why you have got four rows here. So which has joined by four rows. So let's say even if I give inner, you will get the same results. Okay, so uh, here we have one data frame. Okay, so which is of uh, we have a column name, uh, uh, add uh, other number and address. Okay, and we have an other data frame. We have other number and salary. Okay, we need to combine these two uh, data frames. Okay, so in order to combine these two data frames into one data frame, we have. Uh, we need to know what is the common column we need to combine on, okay? That we have other number here. Here is an other number. Here we have an other number, okay? So if you want to combine, um, uh, uh, merge both, so what we are doing here, we are merging DF1 and DF2 on other number. So this is the common column for both. We are merging uh, other one, sorry, uh, DF1 and DF2 on other number. And how are we merging? So only the column, uh, only the rows, which are there in both the data frames, only that will join. So that's why we give inner join here. Let's say, let's say we have one more column, uh, sorry, one more row here, which is E, okay? And which has another number five, and So right now, if you see, uh, we have five rows, okay? So five other numbers, but in DF2, we have only four, four rows, okay? Four other numbers here. But when you do inner join, as I, the result's gonna be same, okay? So if you see here, when I do an inner join, we got only four rows here. But let's say I want all rows from the data frame, one so i want all rows from the data frame one and from data frame two what all rows have joined with uh data frame one we'll get only those uh, columns uh, only those rows okay in that case if you give left join here okay you change how how do we join this from inner to left we'll get all rows we'll get all rows from the data frame one and from data frame two, only those rows that matching with the data frame one will get it. Let's see the results. So here we see, we got all rows from data frame one, 
but for data frame two, which which is only the salary one, we got one we got a NAND here, which is uh, uh, which we do not have any value for that record. Okay, these are missing values because that record does not have any value in the DF two. So now we understood inner join and left join. Okay, so let's understand uh, right join as well. Okay. So right join is more on the, uh, let's say if you have a, from the right table, let's say if you are joining DF2 and DF1, okay? So let's say you have DF2 here and DF1 here, okay? And if you want to do the same thing on the right, okay? You want all the values from the right end table and uh, not from the left side table. So same thing, we have just converted DF2 and DF1. Okay, replace that. We are calling DF1 as the right table, this as the left table. Okay. So if you see here, we got the same thing, but we are doing a right join. Okay. And let's understand how a full outer join works. Okay. Let's add one more row here, which is six. So please follow this closely, pull out a join. So you have add number one, two, three, four, five. Here you have one, two, three, four, which is common between both the things and six is different. So when you do outer join, so you will get all records, all rows and whatever is joined between commonly, you will have in the same row. So let's do that. Let's change it to DF1 and DF2 uh, and call it. Okay, so you can clearly see here. So we have NAND for this values. So the add number, which is common, which has all the values from one to six, but whichever is not present in these two things, because uh, here it's not present. In the DF1, we do not have value for uh, six and value for uh, address. And in DF2, we do not have value for salary. So this is how outer join works. Okay. I hope this is clear, guys. So now let's understand the difference between merge and a join. Okay. So as you see here, um, so there are merges and joins, right? So the major difference between uh, any, uh, so we have understood how the merge works. But when you see join, so join works on indices, okay? So how the index is there? It, you cannot give any value for that, for example, uh, you cannot join based on a column. It will join based on index. I'll show you how. Okay. So if you see, if you want to join DF1 and DF2, so let's say you can recreate this. Let's say we do not have any of the value here. So what do I mean join by indexes? We have some values here, right? Zero, one, two, three. So these are called indexes, okay? These are the index of those rows, okay? So now we have zero, one, zero to three here indexes, here zero to three, okay? So once you do join of DF1 and DF2, you add number, uh, okay, yeah. So it has both same columns. You cannot have same columns there. So you need to give uh, how we want to change that columns, okay? So for that, you will be using L suffix and R suffix. So how do you want to change the column of uh, the left side uh, uh, column name of the, uh, data frame one, how do you want to change the column name of data frame two? So which is left table and the right table.
I guess. So, yeah. Hope this is clear, guys. So what what I said is, so merge will join based on the column name. Okay, if you want to join any two data frames, so you will join based on the column name. But let's say if you know all the uh, data is same if, uh, and the, both the columns have the same number of values and all the rows indexes are matching together, you will join based on the index itself. So you will not give any column name here. You just purely join based on the index here. So here, here what I've done extra is as both the data frames has the same uh, column name, which has add number and add number. So you cannot have a uh, same column name for two things. So that's why I've changed that to for left side table, you can change that to add number underscore L for right side table, you change that to uh, add number underscore R. So in merge, if you see the difference between code here, right? Merge, we have specified what is the column we need to join two uh, data frames on. So here, if you see in the merge, I need to join data frame and data frame two based on the column or uh, based on the column add number, okay? But in join, I have not given any column name, okay? But how does the join happen here is, join happens on the index, okay? So here we have index of zero to three. If you see here zero, one, two, three, and even DF2 will have the same index. So let me run for DF2 as well. Data frame two will also have the same index, zero, one, two, three, right? So in that case, you will do join. Uh, so in that case, you have not specified any uh, column here. So the if you, join based to, so if you join based on, if you do join to data frames, it will join based on the index value, not the column value, okay? So DF1 has four values, which have indexes come starting from zero to three, and DF2 also has values zero to three, okay? So now join, we have not given any column name based on which it should join, it has joined based on the index values from zero to three. Okay. So let's say we have DF2. So let's say we have DF2 without add number. So we have DF1 with name, add number and address. We have DF2 with just salary. There is no common column itself. In that case, you don't need to worry about R suffix and L suffix. So here you can create with DF1 join DF2. So both does not have any column name, uh, which is common uh, and you it's joined based on the index itself, which is zero to three. Here it's also zero to three, okay? But let's say you have a common name, which is add number. Okay. So once you join DF1 and DF2, a data frame cannot have two columns by the same name. Okay. Okay. That's when you say you add for the common name of the left side table, which is DF1, with the suffix of underscore L. For the right side table, you add a suffix of right underscore R. This can be anything. You can give uh, even Y. You can give uh, X. It, underscore is also not needed. It's a text value. You can give anything for that so that you will have a different column name. So if you see here, the left side table, the column name, the common column name that has been changed from add number to add number underscore X. Here also add number underscore Y. So that's when we use L suffix and R suffix. So let's move to concat, okay? So right now uh, we have completed join, okay? Oh, sorry. So let's move to concat, okay? What does concat do? 
Okay. Concurrent is simply nothing but let's say uh, you have two data frames of the same values. Okay. And you just need to combine that into one uh, data frame. Okay. I'll show you that with a very example. This is very straightforward. You can easily understand that. Okay. So let's say um, we'll start with the same thing. So let's say if you do not have index as well, it also going to start from zero to three. Okay. And let's say you have some other data frame. Okay. And which is starting from name is like what? Um, okay. Some names here. We have some names here. Then four, six, nine, some values and cities are same. Okay. So these two are different. So when we need to concat both the things, right? So if, if you concat both the things, both the things will have the same index name. So that's when you will change the index to so here you have 0 to 4, 0 to 3. Here it will start from 4, 5, 6, 7. So you have changed the index values for this. So what you have done is you have both uh, same values in both the data frames. You need to combine that into one data frame. So that's the result you got here. That's the result you got here. Okay. So from zero to seven and one concat would be simpler, but keep note of indexes. So you need to have different index values when you are concatting two indexes. Okay, sorry, two data frames. Let's say you have got two CSV files that you have loaded, okay? And one CSV file which has name, add number and address and other CSV file will have the other columns, okay? So for example, um, I'll go to join. So other CSV file has only salary. So in that case, so the client or client or the uh, data team uh, which gave your data told that my rows exactly match with the other rows and uh, the indexes are same in the CSV file. Okay. In that case, you do not have a common column. Okay, here, add number uh, in the other CSV. So the one thing you can do is you can create a column in the Excel, just copy pasting that and then doing and uh, joining or using the merge, okay? But in, uh, let's say, if you do not want to do that, you can directly go and use join. As you know, all the indexes from the left data will match exactly with the, all the indexes in the right data, which is the right data frame. So in that case, as you do not have any common value, you can just use uh, join here. So you will get the all the data into one data frame, right? Let's have a quick quiz question, guys. And the question is, which of the following is the correct extension of the Python file? And your options are .python, .pl, .py, or none of the above. Please mention your answers in the comment section below. If you want to make a career in data science, then IntelliPath has IIT Madras Advanced Data Science and AI Certification Program. This course is of very high quality and cost effective as it is taught by IIT professors and industry experts.
and one suggestion here guys uh, in real world uh, the join is uh, will be more error prone right when you do things we might kind of miss out so many things while doing join so uh, the more uh, we just use merge in the real world more compared to the join so try practicing merge than join okay so these are the concepts that is there so we are trying to teach you that but uh, i am telling you here and there which is more important so for example data frame is more important compared to the uh, series which you are learning that so you just need to know uh, uh, overall idea of series but data frame you will be working day to day uh, uh, on life okay and then inside data frame also which i told so on joining uh, you will mostly use inner join and left join okay uh, so you need to concentrate and do more practical examples on that as well and then in the merge join between these two we will be using merge lot more compared to the join and merge is far more better practices compared to the join as well okay so we have completed till merge join concat of data frames okay um let's get into how do we uh, import data sets and once you import data set how do you clean it how do you analyze data and many of us how do you uh, work on missing values of data all that um, we'll be seeing uh, in the up upcoming uh, slides okay so the first part um, this is what used extensively um, in the real world one is importing data set from the csv files okay and all the problems we work on, we get a data as a CSV file and we import that data set. And uh, using that, um, let's say we can do all the analysis. Okay. So, in order to import data set, it's very simple. Um, you have an, a CSV file that is uh, loaded in the folder and you specify that folder um, name here. So, if it is in the same folder as of your uh, uh, Python notebook, so then we don't need to worry of where we need to specify. We just need to give the file name. Okay. So, and pandas uh, dot, which is PD, the object name of pandas dot read CSV. We can get the CSV file loaded into the uh, pandas as a data frame. Okay. And it's not just CSV. Um, we might uh, read a data frame from uh, different sources, as I said previously. Uh, we could load an HTML file, JSON file, pickle, Excel, and even from the SQL databases. But uh, right now, we'll be focusing only on CSV files uh, and how do we load it and how do we, uh, let's say, analyze from that. So it will not change much. There is a function for all the things as well. Uh, except for SQL, we'll do a database connection, but as this is out of scope and we do not have any database interface that we can do it. But uh, but yeah, so we'll be focusing on reading a data frame from a CSV and uh, doing all the operations upon that data frame. Okay. So yeah, so people all know how do we uh, import a, a CSV file, right? Just note this: uh, pd dot read CSV uh, will load the CSV file as a data frame. Okay and analyzing the data right so uh, in analyzing the data first we'll start with understanding information about the data set okay so here if you want to know what is the type of the data so it can be int it can be string it can be float so sometimes uh, pandas will not understand what is the data type uh, of an column itself that's when it will be given as an object so that we can change into, uh, let's say, string. Uh, let's say if it's a string value, we can change it to string. And if we know that is a float value, we can change that one float or end uh, in the type conversion. So I'll also be explaining how do we do the type conversions there. Okay. And here, uh, and what does null counts equal to true is? We want to ignore. Let's say if you see uh, if there is are any nulls. Uh, we don't need to count that. Let's say uh, that means those are the values which are null. So those are the missing values. Uh, we might be imputing those missing values. Okay. We'll also be seeing how that works. So the first function of any, once you load the data, you will understand the data, how the data is looking like. So info will give you 
uh, how many records uh, are there, non-learn values are there, and uh, what is the data type of that, uh, uh, let's say, uh, that column. And if the data type is not a read uh, understood by the uh, pandas, uh, that will be as an object, we might change that to, uh, let's say, uh, column, uh, we might change that to the uh, data type that we wanted, doing a type conversion there. So then we can do different uh, uh, understanding of the data based on this function. Okay. So what does count do is uh, for every column, it will give you non-null records in that column. So how many records are present in each column? Okay. And describe. So it's a very important uh, function we'll be using once we load this. So describe will give you all the values possible. So for example, how many non-null values are there? Uh, what is an average value? Uh, what is a mean? What is median? What is uh, a standard deviation of that column? Uh, all statistics summary of the data frame will be given by describe, okay? The shape, which, which we have uh, shape will give you how many rows and columns there in a data frame, okay? And we can also see a specific uh, uh, let's say functions. For example, mean will just give you for that column, what is the mean value? Median, standard deviation, min, max. But uh, all that would be just given by describe itself. In the describe itself, you will get all possible uh, statistical summary of a data frame. So in real world, uh, we will be, once you load the data, once you see the info, then we will directly do a describe, understand all possible summary of that column, of all the columns in that data frame, okay? So yeah, so these are the few examples you can see uh, if you want to see the shape. So which means you have uh, 32 uh, rows and 13 columns. So the other important one is the statistical summary, right? So in statistical summary, you see, once you give describe, you see count, you see mean of that column, standard deviation, uh, minimum, and what is the 25th percentile, 50th percentile, which is the median value, and the 75th percentile, and what is the maximum value. All summaries would be given here. And let's say if you want to just see the mean value, you will be using uh, mean here. And one thing to note here is, you will get the values only for the continuous variables. Let's say you have uh, discrete variables like strings, for example, uh, you will not see statistical summary of that because those are string values, right? You cannot get uh, the mean median values of a string. For example, you have a column called city. Uh, there you have Mumbai, Chennai, Delhi, all that. Uh, there you cannot, you can get only the count. You cannot get mean, standard deviation, max, and min there. So only for the uh, numerical values, you will get the statistical summary. Okay. Let's get into the demo of uh, importing and analyzing uh, the data, uh, understanding the basic info about the data. Okay. So data set, uh, so you so I have, I have the empty cars CSV data file and I, I have the same notebook. Uh, I have the uh, uh, CSV file in the same folder. So what I'll be doing first is we have already imported Panda, so we don't need to do it again. So only thing we'll be doing here, reading the data set, uh, the CSV file into a data frame. In order to do that, we just need to do pd.readcsv. Okay, once you do that, um, let me remove this. Okay. So I have loaded uh, the CSV file into a data frame. So once you do that, if you see, you have, uh, once you print that, you will print all the columns here. Okay. So let's say if you want to just see the top file, the top uh, few records. So once you give head, so head will give you the top five records. Generally, it will give you the top five records. And you can give the number of records you want to see in the head as well. Let's say if you give 10, so you will get 10 records, okay? And if you do not give anything uh, here, you will print all the records here, okay? 
generally uh, we will deal with an um, uh, let's say high volume of records so that it's good to uh, if if you want to see uh, uh, understand how the data looks like at an overall level uh, generally start with head don't print everything okay uh, so here you can give 10 5 or how many ever records you want to see you can specify that here okay uh, then if you want to understand the info right um, sorry for that so its data frame name is cas okay so here if you see uh, the info will give you uh, what are the column names are there and how many records are there okay and if if you see uh, qsec uh, overall we have 32 uh, records but in QSEX, you have only 29 records because those values are missing inside that records. Okay. So then if you see, uh, let's say uh, there are columns, for example, uh, uh, let's say what is the data type of each column? So is it in, is it float, is it, uh, let's say a string, all that would be present here. So whichever the pandas didn't understand what data type is that, that would be given as object. So we can convert that uh, if you want to do that, okay? So in this case, let's say, for example, um, for example, MPG, for example. So that column uh, that has been given as uh, float. So we can keep that as float. Let's say we know uh, this unnamed column, which is one, uh, that is object. If you want to change that, uh, we can change that column name as well. So once you do, uh, if you want to do that, you can change that column name into uh, using converting that as type equal to str. So if you do that, uh, we are converting, uh, let's say one of the column, which is MPG uh, as type as string, okay? So similarly, whatever the type you want to convert, uh, you can convert that using string type. So now if you check what is the type of cars, okay? So that we know, uh, the overall data frame. So this is loaded as an pandas data frame. Cool. So we have already discussed head. So we have something called tail. So if you want to see the last records, last five records, you will give tail. Okay. And even in tail, you can specify how many uh, records you want to see, last 10 or last five, all that. And then shape. So shape will give you how many rows are there? How many columns are there? So we have 32 rows and 13 columns. Okay. So as we seen before, we have uh, the uh, functions like mean, median, um, and standard deviation, all that, max, min, separately. For all columns, you will get that. But let's say if you want to understand everything at one stage, the best possible way is to use describe. So describe will give you uh, everything of that columns, okay? And as I told you before, it will not show the string type here, okay? If the column is like string or object, it will not get that here. Only the columns that is, uh, let's say, um, exactly uh, 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 numerical, that's the values you can calculate, uh, calculate the uh, mean, median, standard deviation or statistical summary of that. So here we can see uh, what are the records, uh, what is the count of each and every column, what is the mean value, and what is the standard deviation of that, what is the min, and 25% is the 25th uh, percentile, okay? And 58th percentile is the 50th percentile or median value of that column, okay? And same 75th percentile, and what is the max value present in that column? So seeing this itself, you'll understand how the data is looking like. So is that some data is very weird uh, or you are seeing a very, uh, let's say, um, um, high maximum values, a lot of outside outliers are present, all that on a overall basis, you will understand through describe function itself, okay? The column unnamed is, we do not have any name for that, okay? So as a CSV file, you will not have uh, column names. So that would be missing. So pandas uh, took that uh, as an unnamed. So we'll be converting that unnamed column to an, and uh, we'll be giving that name. So we'll be seeing that pretty. And as str type, okay. As type, right? Got it, I'll show you that. 
So what we are doing is we are changing the type, uh, the data type of the column MPG. That's it. So this is how we change the data type of a column. How to give a path? So that's nothing but let's say if you have a folder, let's say if you have a folder, let's say if you have the empty cars inside data. So you will just give data. That's it. So it's nothing uh, new. Like, um, so you just give the full folder path. So right now we have it in the same folder. We don't need to give that. Let's move ahead, guys. So right now we understood uh, how do you, uh, once you load the data, what are the statistics you see? Uh, let's say, uh, how do you uh, understand the data at a very high level? Okay. Uh, now let's get into the remaining part. So while you're loading the data, you might not... Uh, have the column names for everything. Sometime it might be uh, null for the column names, right? So that's when uh, the pandas will treat that as an unnamed one. So if uh, so, if you want to rename the column name, so we use a rename function and specify what is the columns we want to rename. So here we want to just rename the column unnamed is to column one, and we rename that to model. So as we rename that column, we see uh, the column name as converted from um, model, I mean like unnamed to model. So uh, pandas generally gives names like unnamed of one, unnamed of two, if you have two, three unnamed columns in the CSV file you have. Okay. Cool guys. Now we have seen how to rename the column names. Okay. Then the next important one we want to see is uh, if you want to understand uh, you have seen, uh, we have uh, had a column which had, uh, let's say, let's see this column. So if you see in this column QSEC, we have too many NAND values, null values, right? These are nulls, these values are missing, okay? So generally, what do we do for a missing value is, uh, we kind of impute that value based on the mean of it. So what is the overall mean of this uh, data? We can impute that. So there are so many different ways, but yeah, mean is the major thing. Uh, we kind of use to impute that null value to an uh, act, uh, a mean value of that. So what are we trying to do here is we are taking cars QSEC. We are using fill NA, okay? So, so fill NA. So if you want to fill NA, what you want to fill for, okay? So we are filling this value based on the mean. So this, uh, if you see, so this uh, value will be 17.67. So that is the mean value of this column. And sometimes we also fill values as zeros. We can give a directly zero there, okay? So this fill NA will help you to impute the null values to whatever the values we are given here. So here we are trying to impute based on the mean value. So this will give you the mean value of that column. So we are filling NA for, the, uh, for we are filling uh, mean value of that column wherever the NA is present, okay? Uh, once we do that, uh, and we can even check, uh, let's say, So you can see now we do not have any, uh, sorry, let's see that specific column itself. So now we do not have any uh, nulls here. Okay. And we can also see using describe, count, info, all that. Let's see using info. So info previously we would have seen only 29 values for QSEC. Right now we have 32 values, uh, non-null, okay? And got it. So you see the difference between info and describe. Describe will also give the count, but it will give the statistical summary of mean, what is the mean value of serial number, cycle, uh, HP, all that columns we have here, card, all that. Similarly, standard deviation, minimum of that column, 
and 25th percentile, 50th percentile, which is median, and 75th percentile, and the maximum value of that. Okay, so the info and describe are totally different. Cool. So is that uh, in info, what is count? Count is the count of values that is present in the uh, that column. For example, you are imputing a value for an age. Okay. So in, in age, there is no, uh, and the data set you have for, uh, let's say college students. Okay. College students, uh, you have an uh, data set. Okay. So if you go and impute as zero, that value will not be uh, good for that, uh, that column. Okay. So you have an idea for college students, you can take the mean value. It might be at least closer to the age of that student. Okay. A college student cannot have a value of zero for the age column. So it depends on problem statement to statement that we will uh, change the imputation criteria. So here we are just trying to see how we can impute, but in the coming up classes, when we are trying to do modeling based on that scenario, we will understand how we can impute the data. So it could be zero or it could be mean. There are many other imputation techniques as well that will be discussed in the future classes. So here we are trying to understand how, what are the ways we could impute. We have a file, which is emptycars.2, okay? So that file is present in the same folder here, emptycars.2, uh, which is a CSV file. Uh, then we are using pandas uh, pd dot read csv to load that file as cars okay now this file will be loaded as data frame in this cars so that's how we load a csv file so whatever we have done is from importing from the scratch only we have a file we have just loaded that file into a uh, data frame so even in collab uh, you have let's say uh, let's say import here okay so once you go there, you can select your file and import to the collab. So go to your collab, okay? So you have files here, okay? Here you have a folder option in the left corner, and then you can upload from this. Under files, you have an icon here. Then you go and select the file in the downloads or the wherever uh, you have stored the data, then click open. Okay, so you will get the file here in the collab as well. Okay, so you, you can keep anywhere, right? Like in the uh, notebooks itself. Okay, so you can upload the folder. It's, it's uh, see the computer folders and your notebook are in the same thing. Okay, so let's say uh, if you're working on something, uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can create your own folder and upload there. Okay, or else for a very easier option. So uh, Anaconda has two things. One is Jupyter Lab and one is Jupyter, okay? So Jupyter Lab is a very uh, a fine environment. You can see the folders and file in your left side itself. So uh, if that, you can do that, that would be more simpler in the future project itself. So every time, if you are you want to use a library, it could be NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, anything, you need to import that library first. Uh, and uh, give it some object uh, that you can use it, uh, calling the functions uh, of its own. That's a good practice to have that. So if you have the file in the same folder where your Jupyter notebook is, that's a good practice to do it. So you don't get confused in the future. So make sure you keep the files in the same folder of the notebook. So follow this format. Let's say you have NumPy, NumPy will be in one folder. The notebooks related to NumPy will be in one folder, same as Pandas, okay? Pandas, you create a folder and you have all the notebooks inside that folder and all the files inside the folder. Probably I can show you guys that as well. Let's say if you are using Pandas, uh, sorry, if you are using um, Jupyter Lab. So uh, if you are using Jupyter Lab, right? Let's say if you have courses, have a folder called NumPy. So all uh, files related to NumPy here, and let's say all files related to Pandas here. And if you want to have a folder, uh, sorry. Um, so if you want to have a folder here uh, or file, just uh, from the uh, from the import, you can 
upload any file here. Okay, let's say if you want empty cars, you can keep the uh, file in the same uh, folder itself. So it's easy for you in the future as well as for the readability. Okay. So what do I suggest is not all files in one folder. You create separate folders inside the path. Let's say if you have something related to this, create one folder here for data and you can have data inside uh, empty cars inside that. Okay. So then inside that, if you want to import and one more thing you can also do is when you know that uh, if you can right click, you can copy the path and you can just load it here. Okay. And you don't need to give the entire path as you are in the same folder. You are in the data folder inside of that notebook. Okay. So you can keep create a folder for data uh, if you are working on large things. So you can read CSV from the data folders itself. Let me copy that entire path. I'm sorry, let me check why that is happening. Let's get into the exercise again. Uh, so people can follow all these steps. Okay, once you have imploded the file, uh, let's follow the same steps. Let's concentrate on this, doing this uh, before moving into the uh, next steps. So I once everybody has imported the file, try uh, understanding the info, okay? So if you give info, so you will understand all the, uh, let's say, uh, column data types and uh, how many null, non-null values are there, okay? Once you have done that, Let's get into head, okay? Head will give you the top records of the data frame. So in head, you can change uh, number of records you wanna see. Let's say basically, if you're not giving anything, you will get top five records. And if you are giving 10, okay? You will get top 10 records. You can change that to how many ever numbers you want. And for the tile, you will get the bottom number of records. Let's say uh, default is last five records. And if you want to change that, you can change that to number of records you want, 10 or 15, all that. Cool. So the other part is, so we have this mathematical operations, which I talked about mean of all the columns, numerical columns. Then we have median which is 50th percentile. Then we have standard deviation, max and min. So instead of doing all this, you can just use describe, which will give you all statistical metrics here. That is count mean of the column, standard deviation, minimum, 25th percentile, 50th percentile, which is also the median. So as everybody would have studied in our math classes, 50th percentile is the median, okay? And 75th percentile, and what is the maximum value? Let's also try understanding describe, okay? So now let's start renaming the unnamed column. So as we have loaded that CSV file, we know we do not have the value for that column. So let's rename that unnamed column to model. Yeah, so, so you have just renamed it. So if you want to see, uh, see, just understand this guys, like when you will get an output, so output is not something you can see, right? You have created that and you have loaded that data into cars again. If you want to see the output, you need to print the cars again. Let's say if you have that data frame as DF, print that again, only then you will see that what is the what has been changed. So we, we are seeing, we want to fill NA, I mean, all the NAs for the column QSEC, okay? So here, what we are trying to do here is, First thing, what you want to understand is this fill a, fill NA is the function will help you to impute the uh, NA uh, values, which is null values, okay? So what you want to do there is you can fill NA to be zero or mean. So there are many other functions that we can use imputing the values. 
So, but agenda of this is just to understand we have a function that will help you to fill the NA. But based on every business data that we have, the filling criteria will change. Some places we will fill zero. Some places we will fill mean. Some places we might fill K nearest neighbors to see how the column looks. Do you want, okay? So there are, there are two ways. And we, you, we take the mean value of that. So we want to get impute based on the mean value. So in order to calculate mean value, the data frame and what is the column, what is the operation we want to calculate? You can calculate mean. Sometimes let's say you can also calculate median and you take that value and you put what the value you need to impute here. So you are I, uh, data frame QSEC, you are filling in is to be values of mean here. So then, yeah. So the next part is, let's say if you are building a model, right? So we might not need the unique columns uh, that to exist in the data frame. Okay, which is serial number. Serial number will not give any information about the data. It's just a unique value uh, or let's say a primary key in a database, all that. So in term, in during that time, we might not need those columns in our data frame, right? So what we'll do is we generally call, drop those columns. So in order to drop columns, we'll use this function data frame name. So for you, however you are loaded, I've loaded my data frame as cars dot drop and you need to give what are the columns you need to drop here i just need to drop one column so i'm giving that column name here which is serial number okay uh, library called os and you through that uh, uh, library we get to know what is the current working directory okay so c wd is current working directory how do we get that so let's say OS dot get current working directory. So if you run this and type this, this, I mean, where if you don't want to store it in any variable, fine. Or else let's say if you just run this uh, without, um, let's say any uh, saving into any variable, you can directly get the current working directory. So if you can see my notebook is saved in users underscore page learning courses dot pandas, okay? So in that you can see um, where, uh, so this is work dot I uh, Python notebook. So I've stored my notebook in this directory. So this is just to understand where uh, our current working directory is. And let's say if you want to store your CSV files, okay, or any data you get, so you can uh, store, uh, let's say if you download from internet, all that, you can go and store your all the data in that form, uh, in the same working directory. Okay, So it will be easier for you to load the file. So right now, what I've done is in this case, so I'm putting my uh, my notebook directory is in pandas, and I have created one more, uh, uh, let's say, folder inside pandas data, and I'm storing my data there, empty cars.csv. So I can read my file from this entire data. Okay. If I am not storing in the same, uh, I mean, if you want to create a folder and st store it, this is how you do it, okay? If you want to load that file. Uh, again, get into cleaning up the data set. Uh, in that process, so let's say we have something called rename a column name. Let's say you have a column name. Uh, in our case, we had something called unknown, okay? We didn't know what is the, uh, we didn't even have any column for that, column name for that. And uh, while loading the data, uh, the pandas took it as an unnamed one. So we might want to change that column name, okay? Or else there is a column name given in CSV, but we do not want to use that column name. We want to change that to a new column name. So that's when we use uh, changing the column name. And let's say we also discussed about fill NA. So if you have, uh, let's say, uh, non-null values, let's say, uh, sorry, uh, uh, null values, and how do you um, fill that with mean or let's say it could be even uh, using zeros, okay? And let's say if you want to drop a specific column, let's say you have 10 columns and you do not want to use all the columns in that data frame, you might want to drop that column in the data frame, okay? And as type. So let's say uh, you have, while loading the data, you for a given column, uh, you got the data type to be string, or but you you want to change those are numerical values but um python uh, let's say pandas understood that as a string data type 
and you want to change the data type to float or int okay so you can change data type of an any column uh, from a base column let's say if you want to change from sing to let's say in uh, double all that we can do that okay um uh, yeah let's get started with the examples itself in the notebook so it will be clear for everybody let me also open my notebook Okay, so first uh, we'll start with changing the data type. Okay, uh, let's say we'll see first what is the cars info. Okay, here if you see uh, the cars in cars info, for example, uh, the MPG. Okay, so this is the column MPG, which is a non null column, which is float. Okay. Uh, which is already a numerical column, but just for the test purpose, let's say if you want to change this to a string column, okay? So what do we do here is, so we take uh, the data frame and what is the column we want to change it and we say uh, change type as. So for that, the function name is as type and what do you want to change that to, okay? So here we want to change that to str. Okay, and we are storing that data again to the uh, the column itself. So if you just do this part, it will not change. You need to assign this again to the uh, column here. Okay, so if we run this, so please note here MPG is in the float. Once we rerun this and see the info, so MPG it would have been changed to object. So object is necessarily mean a string data type. Okay, so that's how we show the detail to be here. So here, what we will doing is we have already converted that to uh, string, but yeah, to model, right? So so here um, the unnamed column is renamed to model. Okay, let's try this code also. So all all the records has like say thirty two, but uh, QSec, uh, which has only twenty nine records. So uh, let's uh, separately see how does Q spec looks. Sorry. So if you see, we have NAND values in Q sec. Okay. So we want to replace uh, all NAND uh, to um, mean value of this column. Okay, so what do we do in that case is uh, we the same format the beginning. So let's say cars and QSEC. Let's say from cars data frame, we are taking the QSEC uh, column and we are filling NA. Sorry, filling NA wherever in this column the values are NAN. Okay, so what is the value you want to fill is what is given here. So here you can also give zero or you can give mean, median of that. So we can try out any uh, imputation techniques that depends on the problem we are trying to solve. But here we are just trying to impute that to be mean. So if you type mean, let's say cars Q sec of mean, you get one value. What is the mean of the uh, values that is present already for just that 29 records, okay? So we are filling uh, that values of cars, um, cast QSEC to the mean value of that column, current mean value of that column. So once we feel this, the mean value might change based on the uh, new value, but yeah. So we are right now filling this value based on the current mean value, okay? Sorry. Okay. So we have filled uh, that. Let's see how it looks right now. Okay. 
So if you see, we don't see any uh, null values. We can also check using info. So every, even in QSEC previously it was 29, now it's 32. So what all, uh, or we have filled all uh, NA values to uh, the mean value of that. Okay. So the next one is dropping a column, right? So if you if you have some column uh, which you do not want uh, to use in your analysis or modeling, let's say this might happen uh, more in case of modeling exercise, okay? And that column is redundant, redundant column uh, that might have come through, let's say if you are joining two tables, so you might end up, uh, let's say, getting to a redundant column, which is like same as the other. So you do not want to keep the secondary column. So let's say you want to drop it, or let's say you uh, you might end up loading a column which is not even used anywhere, but it's just uh, say a store taking up the, the RAM space. Okay. So in that case, it's better to always drop unnecessary columns which you will not even use in anywhere, and that does not going to help you in any way. So it's better to drop that columns. So uh, you are on RAM space uh, is better. Let's say the storage space is better. You are use, you, using the space, whatever is needed for. Got it. So this is very direct, right? Let's say same, like here you are giving what is the data frame and what is the operation you want to do, which is drop and uh, what do you want to drop? Okay, the columns. In that columns, what are the column names? So that will get dropped, okay? So this command will drop the column uh, serial number from cast table and you are again assigning that to the cast, then it will not do that. So if you just run this, uh, this part, it will just print the results, but it will not uh, change anything in cast. Only when you assign that back to cast, it will change. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's with everything. Any operation you do, you need to uh, assign that back to the original column or original data frame. Okay. Let's get into the manipulating the data set. Okay. So what do we mean by manipulation of a data set, right? So in real world, we might, uh, we might face like uh, millions of rows, uh, more than hundreds and thousands of columns. And we, I mean, in order to make sense of that data, uh, we need to do a lot of manipulations. Let's say we might want to select a subset of data, okay? Or let's say we want to filter a few data points. Uh, we might not want, let's say, uh, let's say in a data set of orders, uh, if you want to just look into um, uh, a city-specific orders, okay? So then you might be filtering that data to that specific specific. And you might not want to uh, look into all columns. Let's say there are thousands, hundreds to thousands of columns. Uh, you want only 10 columns in that. So you will be filtering, I mean, selecting only those 10 columns and filtering only for a specific city to understand that data. And you might want to sort that data and aggregate that data. All that we might want to do to derive insights from the data, okay? So if you want to do any analysis, uh, we want to know all this uh, data manipulation techniques. So let's get to understand what are the ways we can manipulate a, a Python uh, data set, right? Sorry, a Python uh, Pandas data frame, okay? So as we have seen earlier, let's say uh, we have indexing by position and indexing by label, okay? Uh, and let's say we can, uh, let's say if you want to apply some function, or do I mean there is, let's say you have a column and you have to derive a new column, uh, based on another two columns, which is already present in a data frame, we will be using a, a function apply. So that will be, uh, we can create new columns or change the existing value. Um, or let's say if you want to square that column or multiply that by two, uh, derive log, all that we can do. So we'll discuss all that in the um, apply function itself. Okay. Then the sorting, let's say if you want to sort uh, based on uh, a rank, uh, or let's say sort based on a salary of a person, all that. And if you want to filter to a specific group, all that we can do uh, in the manipulation of a data set, okay? First, let's get uh, to understand uh, indexing of a question. So this is where it will be very helpful to uh, selecting a subset of a data set, okay? You might not want to select the entire data set. You might want to 
just select the subset of a data set okay in this there are two ways so one is indexing by position and indexing by the name okay so what is indexing by position mean is you will give the number there okay and indexing by name is you will give the name of the column or name of the index to filter okay so once we see uh, let's say so if you see uh, so the i log okay i log means uh, the location um, so i which means indexing by position but if you see just loc that is indexing by name let's just try to understand what does car does i log uh, give you okay when you give this the first one is rows the second one is column the first uh, column uh, is rows the second one is column so if you give uh, just column there it will give you all rows and all columns so you are not uh, filtering anything you are getting all rows and all columns okay so let's say if you want to get to specific uh, specific columns on specific rows okay in that case what do you do here is uh, you give i need rows from 0 to 5 okay and we have seen that earlier if you give 5 you will get values only till uh, 4 okay so whatever uh, is there only that you will get okay because our indexing starts from 0 and uh, yeah it can go till whatever the number of records we have but last record which if you give 5 you will not get that okay and then you want the fourth column so you are saying i need uh, index uh, i mean uh, five rows and only value of four so if you see here let me go back here so zero one two three four okay you will get the values of this uh, fourth column and only the top of uh, five rows okay so that's what we get okay in that case so you need the fourth column and top five rows and let's say here in this case what are we doing here is we are taking all uh, all rows okay and we are just want only the first column here okay so then we'll get the model name alone so that's the first column in our empty cars okay let's go back to the code and try this out so we'll understand better on indexing of columns and selecting based on indexing of columns okay so let's uh, so we have cars here again Let's see how the cars data set looks like. I'm zooming a bit more, guys, so it will be easier for you. So if you see, we have cars data set. We have uh, serial number, unnamed, all that we have. Okay. Um, I have not renamed. I have not run my code again. That's why I'm seeing the same name. Okay. So let me uh, rename again, for example. Let me run, rename so it will be easier. So now I have renamed. So my serial number, model, MPG, cycle. Okay. Uh, these are my uh, uh, column names. These are my row. Okay. So right now uh, I am uh, in. I mean I am filtering based on the uh, index values. So that's when I give index location. Okay. So as I pre said previously, if I give all columns, both the columns. This is rows. This is columns will get everything right so here this is for rows this is for columns if you do just colon we'll get everything right and let's say if you want just first uh, five rows okay so if you give zero to five so if you you will get only till four okay and you want just the uh, column one so column one is what always start from this is zero this is one so if you run this So, but yeah. so if you run this, what are we getting? We are getting four, uh, I mean, five rows and column one values. So column zero is serial number, uh, column one is model. Okay. So we are getting uh, from uh, uh, only column one here and this. Let's say if you want two columns. So here what is happening? It is ending here. So, so serial number and model. So this is zero. This is one. So you will not get the last one. So till this only you will get same as rows. Okay. Till five only you will get. So which is four till two only you will get, which is model. So this is zero. This is one. Got it. So this is for rows filter. This is for column filter. Our index starts from zero. Okay. So uh, if you just start from one, so it will start from model. 
Okay. Our index always start from serial number, which is uh, zero. So first index will be always zero if you have not renamed that or done anything. Okay. Same thing here. Okay. Our here also our index starts with zero. Got it. So we should not start from one. Okay. If I say first four columns, we should start from zero. Okay. Which is zero. Then, uh, oh, sorry. So with zero is this, then one, two, three, four. Okay. But if you just give four, will not get uh, values of display. So you need to give five. So if you give five till display will get. And similarly in rows as well, if you want till uh, rows till 10, you will give 10 only because our indexing start from zero. So zero to nine is the top 10 rows. So I hope uh, filtering, I mean, selecting based on eye location, uh, the index column is clear. Uh, let's move to the, um, the other one. Okay. So indexing by label. Okay. So previously we have done based on the, uh, let's say the index value. Right now we're going to index based on the label. Okay. Uh, here, what we are doing is we we'll, can give the column names here itself directly or the index value name itself directly to select those uh, specific columns or specific uh, rows. In real world, uh, let's say we might be using both the things. Let's say in some places we might be using uh, eye location, all that. Um, and some places we might be using label as well. So both are equally important. Okay. So here, if you see just, it's very straightforward, right? So instead of giving the value, I mean the index value, we'll give the name of the column itself that we want to select for, okay? Uh, and yeah, you can see, and you can also give continuous, let's say if you want to see from MPG to Q set, you can give that. Uh, so it will just get those. So one thing to note here is, let's say, uh, I mean, let's say uh, we'll be using same zero to six or zero to one here because the index value and the index name both are same. Value is also zero starting from zero to six or uh, zero to 32, uh, what number of records we have. And uh, the name is also six for the rows I'm talking about. So if you see for columns, we might use zero to one, but for rows, both values and uh, name are same. It's starting from, it's a numerical value only. So don't get confused, but we can change this to, uh, alpha bets as well. So that we have seen previously, we can change the index value. Got it. So don't get confused in that part. So there are many ways we can do that. Okay. Uh, so yeah, let's see, uh, let's see the code of that as well. So I location is indexing based on position. So, okay. So the position is zero, one, two, three. So you will not, you cannot use column names there. So in case, if you, you will use fourth, you want fourth column, you will give four here. Okay. So that is what I location does. It takes uh, index based on the position. But if you want to know index based on label, you will use location, which in that case, you will give the direct name itself. So here we'll give the direct name of the column, which we want to select for. So that's the difference between I location and location, which is like I lock and lock. If I want to select the specific columns, okay. Uh, how do I use that? So I don't want to select all the columns. I just don't want to select one column. In that case, you can use this syntax. So in the square brackets, you will give specific columns separated by commas and you can give any number of columns you want. So that will give you the specific, I mean, you can select the specific columns from a data frame. Okay. Let's move to the, um, so we have seen how do we select specific rows and specific columns. Okay. Based on index, uh, sorry, indexing by position and indexing by label, which is necessarily by, uh, so you can think like this, right? When there is an I log, it's number. When there is an log, which is LOC, which is the name of the column or name of the uh, row. Okay. Got. Okay. So, that, so let's say if you want to create new columns, okay, or let's say set the same value for all columns and you can change that in future as well. Okay. In that case, how do we do it? Okay. So it's very straightforward guys. Uh, let's say if you want to create a new column, 
uh, we directly, um, so let's say you give that column name, what you want to give, uh, let's say cars of uh, AM, or you can give anything, uh, whatever the column name is, and what is the value you want for that column. So if you give one, so all values of that column will be one, okay? So the next important thing is uh, using an apply function, okay? So, uh, so what does an apply function do is, if you want to create uh, uh, or change anything in the specific uh, column, and you want to apply that uh, thing to all values uh, in that column, okay? It's kind of, let's say if you want to do, if somebody asks, uh, I want to change this uh, 21, uh, let's say undo uh, some conditioning and change this value. So what you might end up is you cannot say we write a for loop there. So for loop here will be very slow and not an optimized process. Uh, so that's when we will be using something called an apply function. Okay, inside apply we we up, we do a lambda operation. Okay, this is optimized for uh, pandas data frames. Though it this will be very faster uh, for an like uh, data frame data structures. Okay, so what are we doing generally here is let's say um, don't worry about all these things. Okay, first let's understand what does a lambda function do. Okay. Here we are defining the operation. Okay, the operation is so we have a value x, okay, and we need to multiply that by two. So in that case, uh, what do we do is we need to know what for which one we do we uh, apply that. Okay, so what do we do is we take that uh, function and put it here, and we know where do we apply that. We tell where where that should be applied. So if you see. Previously, our value of AM okay, was one. Now we have changed all that to two. Okay. So we can do uh, so many operations here. Okay. Let's say if you want to do log, we can do log of this, um, of this and change that. Okay. So so any operations we can do like this. Okay. Or let's say if you want to uh, uh, add two columns and create to a new column. Okay. So add uh, hp dot rat will be just adding those columns here and creating a new column which is am. Okay. So this apply function will be very helpful in uh, situations like that. Uh, any operations you want to do uh, or convert one column to another or derive a column from existing columns. Okay. So let's start with a very simple operation which is a multiplication and applying that the to the column which you have created and Again, storing that column here. Make sure we need to, once you just do this, will nothing will change. You need to apply that back to the, the existing column, okay? Value of, we want to create one more column, which is uh, some categorical column, okay? So let's say if you want to split cylinder into uh, two types, zero and one, okay? So big cylinder was a small, okay? Yes, Y, L. Then uh, if x is greater than 4, else. Let's have a quick quiz question, guys. And the question is, which keyword is used for function in Python language? And your options are function, def, fun, or define. Please mention your answers in the comment section below. If you want to make a career in data science, then IntelliPath has IIT Madras Advanced Data Science and AI Certification Program. This course is of very high quality and cost effective as it is taught by IIT professors and industry experts. So what are we trying to do here? We are saying if the value of X is greater than four, so we'll give big cylinder or else we'll say it's a small cylinder, okay? And we are creating a new column, which we do not have. Okay, that uh, CYL group. Okay, so now uh, what are the what is the column we need to apply for this? Which is cylinder, which is CYL, and apply that function. We can change that to F1. So so if you guys see here, we have created something called cylinder group here. So based on the values of let's uh, the value of cylinder six. I mean let's say six. If it's six, it's big cylinder, or if it's four, it's small cylinder, okay? 
again let's say eight it's big cylinder so even we can write conditions here to derive a new column got it so so we are creating a uh, first a rule here so consider this as the what you want to do it does not depend on the column name or anything okay we are just saying for any value that comes in okay for any value that comes in which is let's say x here uh, what we are trying to do is if x is greater than 4 okay we are calling that is big cylinder okay that value we want to give if that's not true else we're going to call that as a small cylinder okay this is the rule we have created for grouping of column cylinder now if you want to apply this rule okay you will where you need to apply you need to apply this rule on cylinder so that we will select based on cars of uh, square brackets of cylinder or or even you can select dot cylinder you can use both the things so here we have selected for this column we are applying this function so up, after applying this function we are storing this value in a new column which is not even there we are creating that column which is cycle group okay so this cycle group is column is derived based on the values of cylinder so we need to create one more column, which is display group based on the values of display, DAS. Okay. So if the value is greater than 100, we call it high, else we call it low. Okay. So we have seen apply function uh, doing some manipulations in data. If you want to write if condition, all that. Okay. And there is an other ways uh, as well. Let's say, I mean, but if you cannot, you cannot write if conditions or any uh, operations there. You can also directly change a column to a column. So, for example, um, so let's say, so we have done this right. Um, so instead of uh, instead of multiplying uh, into two. Uh, previously we have created a column called am right let's say am we have created all the values to be one right so here all the values of am uh, will have uh, one so previously we have tried uh, using apply um, so for example in this case here we have used apply to change the value of am so to multiply two so there is an other where as well, which is very direct. Um, uh, but for simple operations like this, instead of using apply, we can even do that. So for example, uh, we can just multiply that by two and store in the car same. So you don't need to do, I mean, use apply function there. So, but you cannot write if conditions, all these complex operations uh, in uh, uh, directly like this. Okay, so here if you see all, all the columns, we have changed that to two. Okay, you have not even used apply function here. So let's say if you want to do uh, add two columns uh, and create one more new column, uh, we can do that directly. Um, let's say you have cars, uh, AM plus uh, gears. And if you want to combine these two, you can just combine and store that into one more column, which is so this is just to, to show you guys like the other ways which is very direct we can also do this if you are not doing any complex operations okay um yeah okay let's move to uh, the next one okay uh, let's say you have some data set you want to sort those values based on a value uh, for example if you want to sort a column uh, and based on the lowest salary or highest salary or in the data set you want to sort the values uh, records based on the uh, ascending order of an uh, gear or you want to sort them based on the descending order or let's say price of an car all that so in that case we'll be using the sorting function okay uh, we can do both the sorting uh, so one is uh, sort by values uh, by will give the column name, which is uh, cylinder, let's say, uh, and default uh, sorting is uh, ascending. If you are not giving anything, it will be sorted by uh, ascending only based on that column. But let's say if you want to sort by descending, okay, you just need to give ascending equal to false. That's it. 
then if you want to filter the subset of a data based on a value, we can also do that. So here, um, I mean, we want to filter where cars having greater than six uh, cylinders and uh, HP uh, is uh, greater than 300, okay? So can we filter those uh, data alone? So we can filter a subset of data based on this condition. We can also use our condition uh, using a pipe symbol, uh, and condition for the, um, let's say, uh, and symbol, okay? So, so one is sorting, one is filtering, got it? Uh, yeah, let's see this with some data, guys. So let's see this data uh, and understand how, uh, I mean, let's say, try out what Ramesh is asking for, okay? Let's move to the coding part, guys. So starting is very straightforward. So we, are, we have to just give uh, what are the columns we want to sort based on, let's say. We want to sort based on the column uh, cycle, okay, so, sorry, cylinder. So we'll give CYL, that's the column name here, and we'll sort based on that. Uh, we can see it's sorted based on that, and index values have changed in the left. So it's coming in the ascending order, okay? Let's say if you want to change that to a descending order, we'll just change uh, ascending equal to false. So if you see, uh, the values will be sorted in the descending order, okay? Uh, let's try this both guys. And you can also sort based on two columns. Let's say if you want to sort based on cylinder and as well as mileage, okay? So then what you will do is you'll just give two column names here. I mean, multiple columns. Okay? So in this case, let's say I want to sort based on this. And based on, uh, let's say my ascending is true. Okay. So it first, it would be this um, cylinder. Uh, inside the cylinder, we'll also sort based on this. So if you see all four, so we have sorted MPG here. And then in six, we have start, uh, started ascending based on this. Okay. So it, within each group, we are uh, ascending, uh, I mean, then sorting. So it will be first sorted based on the first column, then the second column, okay? Uh, is this clear uh, how we are sorting based on, uh, let's see only these columns, we'll understand better, okay? So, so if you guys see, so we are first sorting based on cylinder, which is four, uh, post sorting that inside cylinder, we have sorted based on MPG. Okay, uh, so this is also sorted based on ascending. And for then six here also, it started inside six, it started, uh, uh, I mean, sorted based on the values of MPG of that. Okay, same with eight, all that. So here we are sorting values based on two columns. And if, if you want to select just the specific columns, both filter will use this. I mean, here we can give how many columns, column names we wanted. So uh, let's see first. So first, what we have done is we have just sorted based on cylinder. Okay. Uh, we have not, uh, let's say this is just one multiple column. This is very direct. We are sorted based on this column. So four, six, eight, all that. So we are just sorting based on cylinder. Okay. Let's say you, are, you need to sort based on two columns. Okay. Multiple columns. So you could give any number of columns here, but it will be in the same order of sorting. So what happens if you give multiple columns is, so first it will sort the first column, which is cylinder. So which is sorted four, uh, then six, then eight, that's it. We have only three values in this, okay. Then it will sort the MPG and inside MPG, within that group it will sort because let's say if within four, what all the values you have, it will sort that into ascending. So if you see, it's starting from 21, ending at 33, okay? It's sorted ascending 21.4, 21.5, 22.8. And similarly, within six, it will uh, ascend the MPG, uh, uh, sort uh, in ascending the MPG column, starting from 17, value 17, it goes till uh, 21, okay? Similarly for eight, so it, the values inside that group, it will be uh, sorted, okay? So if you see here in the documentation, 
uh, the default value of ascending for this function short sort values uh, is uh, ascending equal to true okay and if you have not given anything the sorting will be ascending only but if you want to give uh, to be descending will change that to false so let's let's try out with only one uh, column so it will be easier to understand so if you see right now, uh, it's sorted based on descending because we have given ascending equal to false. Okay, so let me share this as well. So we just can try this out. So here we give, uh, so if it's false, uh, it's, uh, sorry, it's descending. If it's true, it's ascending, right? So we'll give true here. So what happens is in this case, so we'll sort cylinder by ascending and MPG by descending. Okay. Can you see? So what you have done here is you have sorted values uh, of cylinder and MPG. You want to sort one by ascending, the other by descending. Okay. In that case, you are giving true for ascending. So here you have sorted four base four first. And for MPG, you are starting uh, from 33, it goes till 21, sorry, 21.4, okay? Similarly here, it starts with 21, ends with somewhere like 17. So you're changing the ordering for different columns. Um, so I'll show you guys something. So let's say we have cars, okay? And we have sorted cars based on cylinder. That's the basic code, right? And if you can, if you guys can see our index values of cylinder has changed. Okay. What does an index value previously? How does a car look? So index value is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. As you are change, sorting the values, so it has changed the position, but index value is the same, right? Let's say if you want to create new data frame and store it here, let's say cars V1, post sorting, okay? There what happens? So the ordering is the same, but index value is not sorted, right? You have zero, one, two, three, four here. As you sorted, the index value positions also changed, okay? Because that's the name of it, okay? So in this case, what do you do is, if you want to reset to the order you have, so you give reset index. So then what happens is, you are positioning changed, okay? This is the actual index value and your new index value is this 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, okay? And you can also do, let's say, and one more thing to note here is, we are seeing there is a new column index is created, okay? So once this is created, yeah, we have seen something called dropping a column. This is an unnecessary column, right? Index, we don't even need this column, old index, okay? So we can drop this column or we can, uh, inside this function itself, we can specify drop equal to true. So in this case, what happens is, so you see the difference, how it is created. So now we don't see any index column created, new column created, right? So as we are specifying drop equal to true. So first thing is, um, so if you do any filter condition on any column, what does it give you is, it will give you whether this record is true or false, okay? So we'll, and if you apply that inside the data frame, it will select only the records where the column or let's say uh, the uh, index value is true. Cool. So 
if you let's say i want to filter only for cars where cylinder is greater than 6 okay if you see if for just for this we'll get all results let's say 0 to 31 we have totally 32 records but we'll get true only in the places where this condition matches okay so this is the first filter condition then once we apply this filter condition inside the cars okay for that data frame we will see only those records so filter condition where cylinder value is greater than six which is eight i mean in our data frame we have only uh, three values for cylinder which is uh, uh, four six and eight so here which is greater than six we have only the records which has cylinder value greater than six okay so there is very straightforward way we are just uh, splitting we are first writing the filter then we are doing this then all that right instead of that we can just directly write the filter condition inside itself so we have a data frame inside the data frame we are writing the filter condition what is the filter condition so we want cars of cylinder greater than six okay and column name should be inside quotes so we have got all this okay so this is the filter condition this is the data frame that's it got it so right now we have seen only the condition based on one value right so let's say we want to write a condition based on two values let's say two columns or multiple columns okay so what we want is so where cylinder is greater than six and we want cars uh, hp which is the column hp that value should be more than 300 okay so for this we can write sub filter separately then apply that inside the r cars or let's say we can write and note uh, one thing guys when you are using one filter we don't need any brackets okay but when we are doing more than one filter, we need to make sure we are doing that inside a bracket. Okay. So here, cars of cylinder greater than six and cars of HP greater than. 300 okay we have only one record for that okay um let's so um this is for uh let's say two filters and make sure you do within the quotes okay if you're not then it's an issue okay so make sure if you're doing do within the quotes see if you're not doing within the quotes you will face an error okay so make sure you do within the quotes of every filter condition so what does that pipe symbol tell you even i need all values where cylinder is equal to equal to eight okay you get all values of eight and also uh, if cars is greater than uh, of hp greater than 300 you will also get that values okay so if you see uh, hp uh, greater than uh, less than 300 values also here which is 175 244 that's because this is an r condition if any one of this matches we'll get that record this or that and this both conditions should match okay so if you are using filter for a string so let's say if you're for model So here, this is how you filter for a string. You just need to give the string values in a quote. Okay. For numerical values, we will not use any quotes. Okay. For string values, you need to use give the value inside the quotes. Uh, let's say R and how do we filter for different things? Cool. Let's move to grouping. I mean aggregation part okay uh, let's not go into value counts first 
let's start uh, understanding why do we need to understand groups right let's say if you have cars data set okay here and let's say if you want to understand uh, for cycle you have cycle uh, different values six four eight okay you need to know how many number of models you have for a cycle uh, sorry cylinder sorry one uh, for cylinder six how many uh, records you have okay so what do you, you do in that cases so you for for a, a data frame cars we are grouping by cylinder and we are giving the, uh, let's say there are two ways to do that. Okay, let me show you the first way, which is size. Size give the count, entire count, okay, in this case. So for cylinder four, we have 11 records. For six, we have seven records. For eight, we have 14 records, okay. The total would be 32, okay. And size is the overall uh, size of, and so it will count number of records it has. But we can also count based on number of, uh, let's say, uh, by the column name. So you can also use count. But what happens when you are using counters? It will count each column separately. Okay, you will get the same records. It will not change. Uh, if you do not have any null values, but it will count the each column separately. We do not want that. So what do we need to do when we are doing count is you need to give the column name, okay, which is serial number or any column name you can give, okay, uh, if you want in that case, okay. Here, what, what does it give you is uh, for, we are grouping by cylinder, and we are counting how many records are there by this column, okay? Very straightforward. So first way is to use size. And if you use count, it will give count for all columns. And there are other ways as well, okay? Without using group by itself, only for counting, okay? So we have something called value count. So we have already given that here. So you give just the column name and use this function value underscore counts. It will give the values. Oh, sorry. So for uh, cylinder, um, you have eight, four, six. How many values you have? You have that value counts. The part here to notice, it will always sort uh, the records and show it to you. So that's the difference between value counts and counts. Uh, is this clear how aggregation works? Uh, only uh, We have seen only count. We can do all mathematical operations here. We can average, we can see standard deviation, uh, mean, median, uh, uh, all that, uh, all, all uh, statistical operations we can do, okay? So if you see, uh, so we want to group by cylinder, okay? So group by, you want to group by cylinder. That's one thing. And then you want to count. You want to count how many number of records is there in this, uh, with this value, okay? Value is four, six, eight. So it will group by this four, six, eight, and it will count the number of records, okay? So if you just give count without specifying what column to count upon, it'll count all columns. Okay, but let's say if you want to count upon one column, which is serial number, we know which is unique, all that, which has uh, this column name as, uh, this column has all, all values to be non-null, okay? So we'll give a column like that uh, here and count based on that. So we get what is the count for that column, okay? And then, there is some function without using group by there is something called value counts okay so uh, if you just give the column column name and do value counts it will give you the number of records for each uh, group inside the uh, i mean a cylinder which is 846 only these three values are there in cylinder uh, the cylinder with 8 
okay uh, eight cylinder which has 14 records here it's 11 here it's seven so it will give you number of uh, counts for each group okay overall it would be 32 so right now what we have seen is just the count right so we can do all the operations uh, other than count as well let's say cars uh, we have let's see how the data looks so let's say if you want to do um, let's say uh, for each cylinder group you want to understand what is the hp average hp okay so there you will give hp there and mean okay so you will understand so what is the uh, mean uh, average hp for each cylinder group okay so for 4 it's 82.6 for 6 it's 122 for 8 it's 209 okay so you can also do median standard deviation all that okay so you can also do median mean cool so any operation you can also sum Okay, let's say if you want to sum, you can also sum all the values. Got it? So, but sum does not make sense here. We we'll use mean. So, in in a real world, let's say somebody asks you, uh, uh, what what is the uh, order uh, number of order values uh, for by city? So, let's say Delhi has how much uh, value uh, placed? What is the number of values? Chennai, all that. But let's say you, people ask for number of orders, you just use count or size there. Got it? And if people ask what is the average order value of a city, we'll use mean. Okay. Okay. As I said previously, like uh, it's not just one column, right? Always we might want to uh, group by. Okay. Uh, so uh, we can also do based on two, two columns, right? So let's say we have something called carb or let's say gear. Okay. Cylinder and gear. And based on that, so here we see uh, cylinder and gear in this combination. What is the average? So for having a cylinder four and gear three, what is the average HP? And, and having a cylinder four and gear four, what is the average HP? Same. Okay, so we can see based on this as well. And even here, if you want to, let's say, uh, have four in all columns. Okay, so you can do reset. Let me do that separately. So you will get as a data frame itself. So here you will have indexes, you have column, all that. So this will give a data like this. So once you do reset index, so it will create an index and create values for everything. Okay. So yeah, keep in mind, guys. Um, this is one of the useful option. Um, okay. Um, did you guys understand how do we do uh, two operations? And we can do even like size here. Account. Let me do it in separate. Great guys. So we have finally uh, completed uh, the pandas part. So starting from how do we load a file uh, and how do we uh, understand uh, the file we have loaded and how do we clean up the data and how do we select a sub subset of data, filter the data. And uh, let's say if you have two data frames, uh, can we join these two data frames? What are the different ways we can merge, join, or concat the different data frames we have? And uh, how do we do aggregations upon that to understand the data, do a lot of analysis upon the data? So we have uh, completed the entire section in Pandas. So please go back and try out um, any new examples. Um, um, yeah, so and make sure you always, let's say if you are working on a, a notebook, okay, so try uh, try using uh, markdown, okay, so for example, if you are uh, try writing so many comments, okay, so here if you have comments, you will have this, okay, so you can write some comments, so let's say har, so it will create comments, so based on number of hashtags, the size will be different, 
So in Anaconda, you have something called Markdown. So let's click that. So write comments. It will be helpful for your future reference as well. Okay. So simple thing would be using hashtags. So uh, if you want a smaller uh, thing, you can use double hashtags. So there's a difference between the size. Okay. Uh, same with, um, let's say you have hide, where is hide? Here you have uh, already have text. Okay, so once you are creating anything, you can have text. You can write some uh, things here. You can specify heading, all that. It will take care of it. Okay, so you can specify that. So wherever you are doing something, make sure uh, you do comments uh, or headings that will be helpful, guys. Okay. So we have completed pandas. So let's get into uh, basics of which data visualizations. So data visualization, it's nothing but a graphical or a pictorial representation of the information or data we have. We have discussed uh, how do we uh, get data. So let's say you got a, a data, final aggregated data, okay? And you want to visualize that in a graph uh, or you want to plot that as a graph, so to understand more better, right? When the data is just as a number format, uh, we will not be able to get the entire uh, format. Let's say, what is the trend of the uh, uh, line we have, or uh, what is the percentage? So we can understand, but having a more graphical representation, uh, we will uh, get more insights from the data, okay? So what, what does a data visualization mean is nothing but um, any information of a data which we have as a uh, numerical format, okay? We are converting that to a graphical format. So it's more uh, easy to understand, okay? So that's the need of data visualization. So here you can see, right? Let's say you can uh, simply, let's say when a data is given as a table, instead of that, when you, uh, specify that as a pictor pictorial representation, it, it's easy to grasp, okay? Uh, in real world, uh, when you are doing, let's say, uh, when we have built the data and we have got in a tabular format, but if you want to explain that to our stakeholders or let's say our business owners, uh, we want to show that to uh, understand, uh, let's say how this data is looking like. So graphical representations would be more helpful uh, then a, a number formats. It's not just for them. Let's say it's even for us. Uh, let's say we are doing some analysis. Instead of just looking at some numbers as numbers, um, we can also plot that to understand more uh, about the data. Okay. And there would be like, let's say if you have 10 rows, it's easier, right? But let's say you have millions of rows. You, you cannot just see all records, what is the trend, everything just based on that number, right? Or just based on the summary statistics. So let's say if you uh, put a summary statistics, mean, median, and all that, you will understand the, on an overall level, how that looks. But when you only plot the data, you will understand what is the trend of it? Is there any outliers? Uh, is there some data? Is it in showing a trend or it's scattered across all dimensions, all that? So in this, way it will be more helpful to understand how our uh, underlying data is looking like okay so yeah so why, why should we use uh, data uh, why should we do uh, visualization of a data right so we can view changes over time seamlessly using uh, a visual rather than a plain data okay so we can also discover uh, correlations between two variables. Let's say if you are plotting something, uh, two variables are there. If both the variables are following the same trend, you will understand what is the correlation between two variables, okay? And using a proper visualization techniques, uh, instead of uh, having a, a tabular data, we can give a more user-friendly formats so that so that we can explain our uh, underlying data or, or even we can understand the complex data uh, in a quicker format, okay? And yeah, the final thing is um, we can tell a better story uh, with a bunch of visualizations over time instead of just a tabular format of data and e easier for people to grasp our, uh, let's say it could be our presentation or it could be our any documentations. It's easier for 
uh, any uh, visualizations uh, to grasp it instead of having a tablet data. Even for us, if you have built a tab, I mean, visualizations and had, docu had it documented, so it's easier to come back and see uh, to understand what is happening data, okay? So it will be to the point what happening in the data so that we'll understand. We worry about all that, what we need to worry about is how do we use that, uh, how data visualization techniques have uh, evolved over time and see how the data is gonna look like, okay? So yeah, here if you see, so under this, uh, so this is the overall data. So here we have the just summary statistics of the data. So normally when we give describe in pandas, we get um, average, mean, median, standard deviation, all that. Yeah. Instead of having this, okay, so we can also uh, do uh, that can have a graphical representations of understanding how the same data could look like. Just to give an example. So here, if you see, uh, the averages might be the same. Okay. Uh, the averages is nine. And uh, let's say here, the average is 7.5. So for all X and Y, the um, average is same and even the standard deviation is same, okay? So probably if you can see this, uh, some average, everything is same, but only when you plot the data, yeah. When you even plot the data, you will understand the how data is different, okay? So this is the plot of first X and Y. This is the plot of second X and Y, third X and Y, fourth X and Y. So if you see, I mean, so that's why the summary statistics come sometimes can be misleading. Okay. So when you only when you plot the data, you will understand uh, how the data is looking like instead of when we are just looking at a high level summary statistics. So if you see this data, um, so we have three, uh, sorry, four X and Y. Okay. So this is X and Y, X, Y, X, Y, X, Y. Okay. So here, uh, here this gives the sum of uh, X and Y, and then uh, what is the uh, average of that X and Y? And then we have the standard deviation of X and Y, okay? But these are different values of X and Y we have, okay? But if you see the summary statistics, which is sum, average, and standard deviation, everything for all records, it's same, same to same, okay? 9, 7.5, 9, 7.5, all that 9, 7.5, 9, 7.5, everything is same. Okay. In this case, even the standard deviation is same. Okay. So when you plot this data in a line plot, okay. So here, what are we doing is this is our first X and Y. When you plot this data, it's more like there's a very high correlation as uh, X increases, Y also increases. Okay. But in X2, you don't see, I mean, the second plot, you don't see much of that, okay? Um, so there is a short uh, curve. So initially, there are like, it's not it's not as uh, correlated with the Y and even at the end point, okay? In the third plot, we see very exact correlation, but the only change is there is an outlier there. Okay, outlier, which means it's not, uh, I mean, it's not following the same trend uh, and it's kind of uh, pretty away from how we have this data point, okay? And similarly, in the fourth, we, we do not have any correlation at all. It's tight numbers and just only one outlier at the lost, okay? So what does this tell you is, even if your summary statistics, let's say you have two data blocks, even if your summary statistics are same, which is uh, mean and standard deviation are same, uh, and number of uh, records are also same, even then your data uh, might be different, okay? very different. Okay. Here, if you see uh, the plot uh, one, three might be kind of same, right? It's following some trend, X and Ys are following some trend, but in the plot four, uh, it's totally different. So you have like um, records uh, which are like not even correlated. X records are not even correlated with Y because of only one outlier, our summary statistics are changing. Um, so that's the reason our summary statistics are same with the other records as well, okay, which is average and uh, standard deviation uh, and the sum, okay.
So this tells only the summary statistics. We should not just believe the summary statistics. We should do some data visualization to understand data better. Um, so that will give more insights. So that's what this graph and tabular form format of data tells us. Okay. So is this clear right now? Uh, let me go to. So even the average and other statistics are same because of the uh, outliers. Our data might be um, showing that same average and standard deviation. But when you see uh, plotting the data, that data might be entirely different. Uh, even if the two data points has the same uh, some average and uh, let's say um, uh, standard deviation. Once you plot the data, you see an entirely different graphs for all four. Okay, that's possible. So that's when uh, we might be doing a lot of data visualization and even doing data visualization or doing summary statistics, right? Uh, we want to do outlay removal so that we get some more clear idea. So that that's also more important. Okay, let's say if you have removed these outliers in this data points, for example, if you in the fourth point, right, a fourth graph. Let's say if you have removed this, the last point, uh, the corner one, our summary statistics will be totally different. Okay, only because of this outlier, we have got the summary statistics to this point. Let's say, um, sorry. So our summary statistics has been equated to the other three. So if you have removed that point, right, it would be totally different. So that's what I meant here. Okay. Um, got it. So this 19 and this one, the value of 19 and 12 comma uh, sorry 12.5. So that's what is here. Okay. If you remove just this outlier point 19 and 12.5, our summary statics would be totally different. So yeah. So just keep in mind, guys. Uh, so data visualization can give you an other perspective. How is our data looking? And also note, uh, outliers can uh, skew, skew our uh, summary statistics like average and standard deviation. Okay, outliers can skew our skew our summary statistics, and data visualization given can give an other perspective of our data. Uh, how our data is looking? How is that trend? Let's move to the next slide. Okay. So, uh, as we have seen previously, uh, we have pandas, we have numpy for uh, uh, using uh, data to do data manipulations or load the data and see uh, how do a lot of summary statistics uh, and do grouping, uh, aggregating data, all that. Okay. So, right now we have the data, let's say uh, using pandas or numpy, if you want to visualize that data, so we have packages called Altair, Matplotlib, Plotly, ggplot, Seaborn, all that. Okay. But in real world, majorly we'll be using Matplotlib, uh, right? And Seaborn uh, is an um, addition to Matplotlib. So Seaborn is built upon Matplotlib, and Plotly and ggplot2 are more, uh, let's say, uh, uh, interactive plots. I would say that. Okay. So more interactive plots, you can build dashboards also using Plotly, all that we can do. Okay. But uh, with Matplot, uh, sorry, uh, dashboards also using Plotly. But yeah, we'll be focusing only on Matplotlib in this session. And Matplotlib is a very simple plotting techniques and it does not take a lot of memory uh, and it's easier for to plot and we can do um, uh, many plots using Matplotlib. Okay. So we'll be focusing on matplotlib throughout this class, right? So let's start with that. Okay. So yeah, as I said, matplotlib is a most popular Python library for data visualization to create 2D plots and graphs uh, with help of uh, Python scripts. Okay. And how does matplotlib help in data science, right? So by providing uh, Pyplot module, it takes to work like a MATLAB. So everybody know MATLAB, MATLAB is there, right? And, and we have so many predefined functions uh, like uh, we had in Pandas, right? We had predefined function that made our life easier to uh, do data manipulations. Here also we have predefined functions for plotting. Let's say we want to do a line plot, bar plot, histogram, all that. We have this predefined functions to do that. So yeah, so we have a variety of plotting and graphing techniques. And uh, so it also have the object-oriented API support. And 
it can easily integrate with pandas and numpy so you have a pandas data frame of numpy data you can easily integrate uh, the uh, matplotlib uh, with those to uh, plot uh, your visualizations okay so let's get into a high level matplotlib concepts so here um, there are few components and functions that we need to understand before going into the uh, matplotlib visualizations okay so first one is plot, which is used to plot an array of data on a graph. Okay. And once you have created that plot, we use the show, uh, show uh, method uh, to show that output in that notebook. Okay. So in the result. And grid option helps us to set grid equal to true or false. And there's something called set title. So you can create a title for a graph and even you we can have an x label y label all that so we'll be seeing that in detail with an examples okay guys so yeah so what is an anatomy an anatomy of an mat plot uh lip figure right so if you have um so you can see there is an x axis you can label that and you can have y axis we can label that and then we have something called legend so what does the legend mean is let's say you have two line plots and you want to differentiate that between two lines uh two colors okay so blue and red so he, we want to specify what that uh, line means so having a blue here we'll give that a name let's say blue signal we give for the red we give that a name uh uh let's say uh, uh red signal okay and let's say we can also have the title uh so that's here um so yeah so this is how a data plot looks like so just keep in mind guys we we can have an x label y label which is the axis we can have the legend for differenti differentiating the different uh plots we are plotting in the same graph okay and we can also have the type okay so this is how um, these are the just the terms we need to remember so that uh, once we are plotting, we'll know what does that term mean. Okay. Okay. So these are the some of the color codes, and then we have marker codes. Okay. So color codes generally mean let's say what is the color of the line. So so for example, if you want a blue line, so we'll give B. Okay. And for green, G, R, red. Um, and we have so many other options, black, white, all that. Okay. Then we have marker codes. So what does mean a marker code is you can have symbols. Okay. So for example, dot mean a point, O means a circle, X means a marker, diamond, hexagon, square marker, plus marker. Okay. So you, for one thing, you can give a uh, blue color uh, dots. Let's say if you are plotting two, two, uh, two data in the same graph and you want to see how the data looks like for example in a real world you get a problem like 50 percent of the data is zeros 50 percent of data is one and you want to plot that data differentiating for zeros to be one color and one marker code uh, and for other you can have other color let's say red blue uh, one is for circle one is for x marker so this is just to visualize the data and see uh, differentiate two data points okay so yeah then the line style let's say you are plotting a line and how you want that line to be you want that to be a solid line or a dotted line or dash dot line okay and you can have hexagon marker as well so this is um, so these are the different lines you are plotting so just to show you let's say the same line you have it here so one could be a dotted line, one could be a straight line. Okay. So we can specify that in the function we are using. So the plot will change accordingly. Okay. So yeah. So Goel, for you, you asked what are spines, right? So if you see, uh, spines are just the line connections to the uh, axis tick marks. Okay. Uh, to the boundaries we have. So if you have here, these are the spines. But yeah, let's not uh, think uh, or worry about spines because we'll not be using that anywhere in real world. We just need to worry about the axis part, which is x-axis, y-axis, the legend, the title, okay? 
so these are the things we'll be using or changing in the real world so yeah so the first one which is a line plot so uh, how do we plot a line plot right let's say you have two axes uh, so one is of uh, x uh, which is uh, and and the other plot is y and you want to see uh, let's say um, how x changes with terms of y or y changes with terms of x okay or let's say x could be the time and y could be the uh, some value changes based on time okay? so in that case uh, we can plot uh, x uh, these data okay so you have to give x comma y so we can plot a line plot for this got it then the area plot so the area plot is nothing but if you have two three values and you want to see uh let's say um, how these data is changing uh, based on the x okay so here you will have a one x value okay and three y values so for every x how this uh, a changes b changes c changes so you will be plotting that so in real world we will be mostly using line plots also for this so one x we can also plot three lines to understand how this is going on so this is just a other differentiation of let's say how uh, a line plot could be plot we can also plot a line plot as an area plot as well okay then the histogram okay you have uh, given a data okay and uh, and probably let's see that with more example uh, for example you want to plot any data point how the that changes uh, in the different standard deviations okay here with just with one data point let's say you have a value of height you can plot that height so some people would be very short some people would be very tall uh, in between you will see the major populations so you can see how this data is changing uh, in the same data point itself so you you are not plotting x versus y but seeing how this x is changing uh, how the value of x is different uh, so here uh, the below which is the standard deviation of that so how what is the uh, median and what is the first standard deviation second standard deviation third deviation all that and the scatter plot is let's say so you you have a value and you want to see uh, is my uh, uh, value is in a straight line or which is scattered across all the data points okay once you have that you can also do a scatter plot cool and bar plot you need to have uh, two values here let's say one is a category and other one is the uh, let's say how many number of counts are there uh, in cars we had something called cylinder let's say and in that we grouped uh, the count of uh, models you can also do a bar plot for that so how it will look is uh, for every uh, cylinder what is the count uh, of records we had so we can use a bar plot in that case to visualize that data okay so then we have uh, violin plot so this is just to understand the distribution of a data okay how distributed the data is looking like so the middle line will represents the median and above and below represents the first quartile and third quartile and whatever is apart from that will be an outliers okay and then we have let's say pie chart so let's say if you want to see um, in a given a city uh what are the different types of uh, people are there so you have some categories you can plot the percentages all that okay the steam plot is nothing but you plot the same data in different ranges okay uh, and we have box plot uh, okay and this uh, qrin plot will help us to find the direction so you have something on direction so you can plot that but yeah that's uh, that's not mostly used in real world uh even while in plot and box plot are same uh, same usage but it's just uh the how it has been shown okay so box plot is also is for understanding the distribution okay so the middle plot will define you the uh, uh median the uh, the above is uh, third quarter range first quarter range so you will understand how distributed the data is whatever is apart from that that will be an outliers so you even you can load an image and you can plot in our uh, let's say screen okay so that also we can do but that will be more useful when we are working on uh, deep learning based techniques 
and you are working on um, uh, convolution neural networks, all that. So here are the few examples where to use what, okay? Um, let's say if you want to understand uh, two uh, compare values, for example, uh, you have two axes, um, let's say zero and one, or let's say X and Y, we want to see how uh, Y changes with terms of X, we'll be using bar plot. Even in that bar plot, only when the X is as in categorical variable, okay? So I mean, there is categorical variable. We have only, um, let's say a few uh, categories. Uh, you have, let's say 10 cities. You want to know by city wise, uh, how many, what is the population, okay? So what you will do there is your X axis will be the city names and Y will be the population. So you will understand for every city, how is that population is looking. So in that case, we will be doing a bar plot. Okay. So uh, example for a line plot where, when, when you are comparing something, okay. Uh, let's say uh, you want to see um, how uh, fuel prices has changed over time. Uh, and you want to so see line plot is the plot which is used majorly any anywhere if you see even let's say if you are doing a stock market analysis okay you want to know how the stock price has changed over time so you will mostly go with a line plot okay so you you understand where to use bar plot and line plot right bar plot you will have an, a lot of categorical variables in line plot, both will be a continuous variable, which is like a numerical values. Okay? And it's not just the time-based plot, you will be using a line plot. But let's say if you want to understand how X changing with Y. Okay? Uh, let's say if you are building a uh, machine learning model and you have a variable, you want to predict X based on Y. Okay? So you will use, uh, so you will plot the data. Okay? You want to understand how my X is changing based on Y. So we'll understand more that uh, while uh, learning about linear regression in the machine learning topics. Okay? Then the pie chart. Okay, so where you will be using a pie chart is so you have an hundred percent of data. Okay, let's say you have hundred data points or in you know, overall data points, you want to know how my data is distributed or split across different categories. Here also you will pie chart will be used more when you have a categorical variables and you want to see how that categorical uh, variables has different values. For example, uh, let's say India has an overall population of um, 100 and uh, 100, so you have like billions of a population. You want to see how how that is split across different states or different cities. Okay, so you will be using a pie chart in that case. Okay, so then let's say if you want to understand the distribution of a data. So here, previously it is X and Y. You have two, uh, two variables, you are comparing the two variables. But in this case, you are not comparing anything. You are just seeing for one data point, for one value X, you wanna see how that data is distributed, okay? So in that case, you will be using a scatter plot, box plot, violent plot. As I said, box plot and violent plot are more like uh, similar plotting techniques. And scatter plot, you will understand how my data is distributed across. It is in a straight line, or is it in one showing one trend, or is it distributed across uh, always? Okay, uh, so that's when you will be using a scatter plot there. And when you are comparing, let's say, uh, continuous data. So let's say you can also use um, the histogram when you have only one values there. Okay, let's say you have a uh, height of a people inside a class. Uh, you will be using histogram, even box plot will be used there. Uh, so let's say this, right? So examples of line plot and area plot, okay? So it is best to use line plot when we are comparing a, uh, fewer than 25 numbers. And it's easy to, uh, and it's quicker and easy way to compare the data points. But let's say area plot, okay? So there we will use a cumulative totals. Okay, what do you mean by cumulative total sis? Let's have a quick quiz question guys. And the question is, what does pip stands for? And your options are pip install python, pip install package, 
or preferred installer program or none of the above. Please mention your answers in the comment section below. If you want to make a career in data science, then IntelliPath has IIT Madras Advanced Data Science and AI Certification Program. This course is of very high quality and cost effective as it is taught by IIT professors and industry experts. Uh, let's say uh, you have uh, hundreds of data points and you want to see how my data grows with time. Okay. So first uh, I had like two, then I had four. So what is the distribution of that would be? The first should be having a same percentage. Okay. Let's say it's, uh, uh, it has 2%. The next also has 2%. The cumulative would be 4%. So as the record grows, our cumulative uh, data points uh, goes over time. So we want to see how the data grows over time. Uh, so then we will be using an area plots. Okay. So here we have an example, right? Let's say previously I shown you that. Uh, so this is a time uh, data and you have see how uh, the things have changed over time. Okay. This is a line plot in terms of area plot. Okay. So you have something, how the cumulative distribution have changed over time. Okay. So, and you can also show based on different variables here. Okay. So how the uh, interest over different time period has changed. Got it. Uh, first. So let's not uh, do the entire part. Let's go line by line. Right. So first everybody. Yeah. Uh, it's not, we'll import numpy. So just for creating a dummy data, we want to plot. Okay. And then what we want is we need libraries, right? For matplotlib. So for that, we need to download matplotlib.pyplot as plot. Okay. So only this will help us to plot, uh, let's say plot the data thing. And what does matplot.inline does is it will show the data here, let's say, uh, in the notebook itself. So we need to download, uh, sorry, import all these three. First is two libraries. Okay. Just we are specifying the command that. So you, in order to show our data uh, in the notebook itself. Got it. So uh, we'll be importing numpy just to create a dummy data. Uh, and then we'll import matplotlib dot pyplot. So this will help us to plot our, uh, let's say, uh, let's say using this plot, we accessing all the functions of matplotlib. Got it. Then we'll, then we'll do uh, matplotlib in line. So this command will help us to plot our, uh, uh, let's say plot uh, or visualization in the Python notebook itself. So we might not be using this in Python or any other places, but this is more specific to the notebooks uh, structure. Okay. Wherever you have a notebook format will be, we need to use matplotlib inline. Got it for that question. So if you import matplotlib, we are importing all the options. Okay. Uh, so if you just import uh, matplotlib dot uh, pyplot, right? So whereas we are importing only the pyplots properties, which is where we can use for plotting. So that's the only reason. So yeah, so there is something called MATLAB, which has uh, so which has so many uh, uh, let's say plotting properties, right? So that is the uh, idea of creating this. Okay. So in this matplotlib.pyplot, we'll be importing only necessary uh, pyplot properties, not everything. So the matplotlib.inline command helps us to plot our diagram or let's say our visualization in the notebook. Okay. So if you want to plot this plot, you want to have a command like this. Okay. So this command helps us to plot this plot inside the notebook itself. Any visualization we have developed. Got it. But in this is only in terms of notebook environment. What is a notebook environment? Notebook environment is nothing but you have a code. You will run that. You will get the result. Okay. For every code, you will run and you will get the result. But there are some other uh, interfaces. Let's say PyCharm. You will write the entire code, all that you will be doing that, right? So this is not, that is not a notebook environment. 
there we will not need matplotlib inline okay so whenever we are using a notebook environment we need matplotlib inline to plot the diagram in the notebook itself so in this uh, notebook format okay and there is uh, there is one more thing how this is uh, the data is created as well okay so let's say if you are not using uh, matplotlib right uh, inline uh, so you can so the diagram is created an object okay um, and here it will be created as an lines cool so i'll show you that example itself how that is shown okay let me let's go here right so right now understand this is to render the matplotlib image got it so let's go into defining this data points okay so what are we doing here is we have uh, we have already seen this right guys what does an arrange do so arrange will take the values from 0 to 10 and the in the values between uh, so it will create uh, the values between 0 0.1 okay so let's see that how it will look okay so we have created x so if you see x This is an array of elements from zero till 10. Uh, so it will not include 10 and it added 0 0.10. 0, so it will keep adding 0 0.1. So that is the uh, value of this. Okay. So we are we have created a value of x and then we are creating y to be 2 into of x plus some constant 5. So let's say uh, our x would be, sorry, our y would be. Uh, as uh, x grows, our, uh, our y grows two times of x plus pi to that. So that is some constant added to that. Okay. So with this data, this is just a dummy data we are creating just to understand the plotting. Got, got it? So right now we understood how the x and y is looking. So let's plot this. So just see guys, I plot Cool. So I've commented even plot dot show here. Okay. So in many cases, we do not want to use plot dot show. But if you have not used matplotlib dot inline, this plot this this will not be shown. Okay. So in many cases, we'll be using directly dot uh, let's say a direct plot. Okay. So it's just a basic plot. What we are doing is first we are creating values of x. Uh, we are using the function uh, we uh, you I mean like we studied in uh, NumPy where we are creating values from 0 to 10 and uh, with a gap of 0 0.1 in each. Okay. So as you see as x grows or y grows. Okay. So how can you see all functions in matplotlib, right? So inside this uh, notebook also you can see but I would suggest uh, go to the documentation, Python documentation of matplotlib. So yeah, so first we have done a very basic plot, right? We do not have any uh, legends here. We do not have what is the next label, Y label, all that, okay? So in the next plotting technique, we'll understand the same line, line plot with more uh, uh, details to that, okay? So what all we studied, uh, we'll try to apply that in the line plotting, okay? So first, what we are trying to do is whatever we have done it previously, let, let that be there. Okay. So we have this data till here we have created. That's the same thing. Got it. So here, what we will do here is first we create a figure for that. Okay. So plain uh, figure, what does that do is we can inside this figure, we can also try out so many things. So we can specify the figure size here. So what is the size of the figure? Length and width of the figure, we can specify that here. So first we are creating a basic figure structure uh, for that plot. Then inside that we'll be plotting uh, our, let's say uh, our plot. Cool. So here we are giving inside the plot, what is X and Y, got it? Then we will specify what is the line width what is the width of the line we want to have and what is the line style? So if we guys have uh, studied about line style, right? And also the color. 
then we have something called alpha. So that defines the, uh, what is the density of this? Let's try changing this, uh, understand, okay? Then we have marker. So what for point, so that should be a circle or dot, all that we studied, right? So we can use everything and see how this is gonna change uh, with, uh, with different attributes, okay? So then we have something called plot title. So what is the title of the plot we wanna have? And what is the label, uh, X label, uh, which is X axis label and Y axis label and the legend. So what does legend mean is we specify, let's say there are two lines, this will be more helpful, but even here we are specifying what is the legend we have want to have, okay? Here we have specified line uh, one, uh, only one line we have. So that is the legend we have given here and where is the location? So we are giving best, wherever it is the best location, which does not affect the plot, we'll give this, okay? So, and we are saying plot grid. So here we can have true, so it will have plot grid. So this lines will be visible or else if you give false, it will not be there. Then we can show the plot, okay? So what does plot dot figure is? So here we are, we are making, let's say, first uh, empty plot okay that does not have anything and inside this we can have so many slab plots all that but here we have just just one plot here okay but this can help to do various uh, uh, functionality of a figure for example here we want to specify the size of the figure let's say if you are giving phi comma phi here the size of the plot will change so see inside this plot, all these attributes that you can using this, you can do using this. Let's say how your plot should look, the size of the plot, if you want to have any slub plots, two plots in the same thing, all that can be done using this function, okay? So here one useful thing would be size of the plot. Let's go back to 10 comma five, that's because that's more uh, uh, easier to visualize. So a location, so where you want this uh, legend to be. So this line, right? So where you want that line to be. So if you give best, it will take the best possible position for that plot, which will not affect the line. Let's say uh, if you give, if you are specifying, uh, you can specify right, left, all that, any corner you want. But if you give best, it will take the best possible uh, location inside the plot where it will not affect the uh, plot we have, the lines we have. So always use best. So it will be easier. Uh, uh, the I mean, matplotlib itself, it will take where to put that uh, position of that line or let's say that legend. Let's uh, try out the options we have uh, on different, uh, let's say, different functionalities of line width, line style, color, which we have studied. Got it? So let's understand how the figure changes with every attribute. Okay. Let's go from here. Okay. So we have grid. So previously, the grid lines we have, right? Let's say if you want, do not want that. So if you give false, so you will not have any grid lines, okay? So that is one thing. And we all understood about this part. Let's go back to line width, okay? You can change the line width to any value if you want. You can give one, which changes the width of the line. So you can, that's one thing. Then the line style. So we studied about line style here. So style of the line. You want a solid line, dotted line, all that. We can give, specify all that, okay? So let's say if I give this. So you will have lines in between that, okay? So you can specify what is the style of the line you want to have, okay? So as, the, as you give the marker is to be O, the line is not visible very clearly. Let's change that to uh, point point marker. Okay, that's just a dot. So if you can see, there is a line. Okay, so when you have uh, over here, that was not uh, very visible. So you understood how do we change this, right? Then we also have color. We can also change the color to B, G, all that. So let's try out with B. Okay, so we can change the color and the transparency of this, right? We can also specify nine. So how transparent this should be. So it, it is very dark and right now. 
So you can specify that based on the alpha. Okay. I hope uh, the difference between line style, color, marker is clear. So we can, whatever we studied here, we can use those options in the plot. Okay. We have something called bar plot. Okay. So uh, bar plot is a chart that represents a categorical data with a rectangular box. Okay. So as I explained earlier, so the X axis would be categorical data and the Y axis would be the uh, representation of that. So for example, uh, we have 10 cities uh, that is a categorical variable and you want to know the population of 10 cities. So we can plot that in a bar plot. Got it. So here, uh, let's say there is one more thing. Uh, for example, we have social media platforms and by each social media platform, you want to understand percentage of use. Let's say Facebook is used 30%. Instagram is 20 and other platform is 10 percent. So in uh, when you have a categorical variable and y to be of uh, numerical variable, so we can use bar plots there to understand that data. So here we can have vertical bar plots and as well as horizontal bar plots. Got it? Um, yeah. Sorry guys, um, I forgot to uh, add this part here. There is a concept called subplotting as well. Okay, so let's say um, you want to create uh, same uh, plots. Okay, um, for example, you want to have two, three plots in the same thing. We can have something called subplot. So the only addition there is we are giving a plot dot subplot. So first we are creating the dimension here. So what does this do is, so we are telling, so we need one row, uh, two columns there. Okay, so then, um, so then we can specify where do you want to add that subplot to be. Got it? So here, uh, so for the first subplot, uh, so for the first subplot, we are giving, this is the first subplot, the values, and this is the value for second subplot. Okay, so there we are giving, this is the two, this is one. So because this was the first subplot, this for the second subplot. So subplot is nothing but, uh, we can plot uh, two, three plots, in the same graph itself or same visualization itself. So if you want to do that, first we need to specify what is the number of rows and number of columns you want to have. So in this case, I want to have one row and two columns. Okay. And this is the first plot. So, so for the first plot, I'm specifying that here, first plot, and we are creating the plot. Okay. Then what I'm doing is if I want a second plot, I'm giving two here. Okay. And I'm specifying that here. Okay, if I run this, so two plots would be created. Let's say even I can have three plots in this case. Let me do that. Y3, where I can have, let's say, so right now we have three plots here. So what I have done, so there is one row and two, uh, three columns, and I'm specifying first plot, second plot, third plot, and I am having different values, same X value, different Y values, Y1, Y2, Y3, okay? And I'm giving the name of the plot, I mean title of the plot to be graph one, graph two, graph three. We can also have uh, uh, multiple rows as well. It's not that we need to just have one row and three columns. We can also have uh, two rows uh, and like uh, two columns, all that we can do. So that just, we need to specify that part in sub subplot. So in np.arrange, okay? So you are creating your first one, you will specify the minimum value and here you will specify the maximum value. Okay. And you will specify the gap here you want to create. Okay. So you want to create a range of values between zero and 10 and the gap should be of, uh, uh, the uh, gap should be of 0 0.1 between two numbers. So what does, does it do is, uh, it will create values between 0 to 10 with a gap of 0 0.1. But let's, for an example, let's do this with a very small one, okay? And you want numbers between 0 to 10 with a gap of 1 each. So if you do that, you will see we create values from 0 to 9. So as I said, it will not take the value of 10. It will just create till 10, okay? Before 10. So let's say if you give 2 here, so it will create values between 0 to 10, but as uh, 8 plus 2 becomes 10, you don't get the value of 10 here. So that's why you see 0, 2, 4, 6, and 8. 
So, so this defines uh, the range you want to create between what range and the two or one, whatever the value you give here defines what is the gap between two numbers you want to have. So here it is two, two minus here also it's two, all that. If you give one, it will be different. So that's that's the that's the uh, function of an uh, arrange here. Um, so so here these uh, so first row I'll show you with an example itself probably. So let me create one more thing as well as y four. So here I've created in one row itself four uh, graphs. Okay, but if I change the same thing to let's say two comma So it will help the size of the figure. Okay. So what is the length and uh, width of the figure you want to be? Let's say if you give phi comma phi. So you are, uh, let's say the width has been reduced. Okay. Uh, so if you give 10, so the width has increased. Okay. So it's just to specify what is the width, uh, length and width of the figure you want. Um, so what we will do is um, we will complete the other plots and directly move to the uh, working session. So it will be use easier. Okay. So here in scatter plot, so as we discussed earlier, used to plot at data points uh, on an area defined. Okay. So it will have a horizontal vertical atoms to show how one variable is different. Okay. So, so if you plot just one variable across this, so it will see how that, that variable is different uh, or distributed across the plot, okay? Or it's very uh, in a unidirection, okay? It's in one direction or it's scattered across uh, many different places, okay? So here is one example. So if you can see, uh, you want to understand uh, versus um, age uh, versus height of male okay and female we want to understand uh, how the data is scattered right so here we can see so it's kind of following some pattern okay so for uh, a male height uh, is higher in terms of age compared to the female height okay so we can also plot just one plot here right let's say uh, we'll see uh, 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 how the data is distributed it's not following any pattern at all okay and let's say we can also give different shapes and let's say colors for two groups. We can also do that. Then histogram, okay. We'll see how the data is distributed across uh, the range. Okay. Here, if you see, um, so we can create bins and we'll see how the data uh, of a student attendance is distributed across the overall range, okay. So if you see uh, the peak is between like, uh, let's say attendance is 75 to, uh, sorry, uh, 75 days to 90. So that has the highest peak compared to its skewed, uh, it's very less, who has very less attendance, let's say uh, less than 30, right? So this will give you an idea of student attendance. Okay. We'll see the examples in the uh, notebook itself. Then the box and uh, violin plots. So here we explain any box and violent plots uh, will give you the distribution of a data, right? Uh, so here you can see if you plot any data, so uh, how distributed the data is, what is the median? This midline represents the median and the below line represents the first quartile and the upper one represents the third quartile, uh, whichever is away uh, uh, apart from these data points, those are outliers, okay? So similar to this, uh, we also have this part, let's say, uh, while in parts, it's just another representation of a box plot. So the distribution plot, okay. Cool. So let's get into the, uh, um, let's say, uh, plotting of this and let's try this out, guys. And if you guys have any doubts, please hold. So once you do uh, with examples, it will be more clear. So the purpose of legend is to understand uh, what does a, a plot specify, right? But we can do it. I'm not saying no, but uh, in a line plot that is necessary because we are not giving any, uh, uh, what does that line represents? 
but in bar plot we also know we already know in the x axis itself what does that represent so oranges means blue lemon uh, green all that so we don't need to have a separate legend to specify what does that mean so that does not make sense at all in a bar plot but in case of line plot we need to specify that so this line means uh, a line 1 let's say you have a line 2 you that will be line 2 so that's where legend having a legend makes sense but in terms of bar plot we already have that names in the x axis itself you don't need to separately mention that in a legend okay so let's start with scatter plot right so here we have two things okay so we are keeping uh, a to a to be the same okay which is the x axis uh, and we have b and uh, x okay so the length so the number of values uh, is same in uh, all three got it so first we are plotting uh, a comma b okay then a comma x got it so and we see how the distributed the points are is there some pattern but here we see we don't see any pattern at all the data is uh, very distributed across uh, all the range so there is no pattern between um, uh, a comma uh, b or a comma x as well so it's all scattered across in different uh, points okay so there is no calculation at all okay here we are as we are not plotting differently so this is a comma b and a comma x so then we are plotting both the things in the same plot that's it so there is no calculation happening as we are plotting both the things in the same plot it is giving different colors that's it let's try understanding customizing this right so we would have uh, the same thing whatever we have done plot we can do that the same thing here okay so so what we are trying to do here is first we are trying to uh, give different variations uh, how we want to plot okay so for a to b we want to give a color uh, g okay which is green and this gives the size so what how big you want that to be okay and then marker specifies how you want that to be so is it round or is it plus all that so so you can specify the marker so different shapes you want to have so this alpha is the brightness of that so how transparent your uh, or let's say your uh, your point should look like it should be very transparent or not okay so this value defines that zero being it will be very transparent one being will be very dark okay and then here the legend is necessary right because you cannot know uh, let's say what does uh, green mean what does red mean so that's when we are specifying uh, the legends so b and x so b will take the color green and uh, circle and here x will take this uh, uh, cross for x okay and we are we can also give title x axis y axis and we have seen if you want grid we'll give true or else false so we can also save this images as png jpeg format uh, and use that uh, in your presentations as well okay let's run this So you can see uh, uh, the file is uh, stored as scatterplot.png. Okay, so we can download this, or let's say, um, I mean, if you are working in, uh, you can download this and use it in your PPTs. Okay, got it. So location is equal to best is like where you want that legend to be. Okay, so if you give that to be best, it will take the uh, bet best position. It's not affecting any other point. Let's say this could be even in the, uh, let's say it could be even in the uh, right hand corner. Then it might affect the point which is there. So it will take a position where no points is being displayed. Okay. So that's why we give best location is equal to best. So it becomes bigger. Okay. So size of the, uh, let's say, uh, uh, circle if you want to have here. So if you give 200, 100, it becomes smaller. So that's just the size, right? So you can see the difference, right? I have changed the 200, so it becomes small. So you can, if you want blue, you can give B there. So we discussed this, right? Color, you can change your color. 
uh, we have discussed in the uh, initial markers itself, even in the line plot. Just see what is the diamond shape. So initially we discussed that. So go back. So yeah, you give the D there. That's it. That's it. So don't need to worry too much on that. So probably let's reduce the size. It's too big. So now it's good. Good looks good. It's very straightforward, guys. So you just need to know what is the symbol you want to use. So we have marker, size, alpha, color, all that. So we can just change it however we want it. If you are using uh, Power BI Tableau, uh, so that's only for visualizations, okay? And if you want to generate reports, got it? And plus those are paid versions, right? So let's say if you are working on a data science problem, uh, and or let's say analysis, you cannot go to uh, Power BI and Tableau just for that use case to create a report to understand how the data is looking. So in the process itself, you want to just plot the data in the Python notebook to understand how the data is looking. So that's one main thing. And then uh, Power BI and Tableau is a paid version. You do not want to uh, I mean, go there for a simple visualization, everything. And you will use Power BI and uh, Tableau for reporting purpose, not for our own purpose, just for our understanding how the data is looking like or one-time analysis will not do use Power BI and Tableau. Even who has Power BI and Tableau access in real world, let's say uh, I work for an organization, they have a Power BI or Tableau, anything of that sort. Even then, uh, if I'm working on an analysis, for that simple analysis, I will not take that data, take that to Power BI, load it and build a dashboard, then understand that. That is very time consuming. So only if you want to have an, uh, regular reports and you want, to, uh, you want to share that to stakeholders who does not have coding knowledge, regularly they want to see that metrics, only then we'll be using Power BI or Tableau, any of that, uh, let's say, uh, business intelligence tools. So here uh, we have a data set of numbers, continuous numbers from 10 to 25. It, it does not follow any pattern, okay? Uh, it's random uh, numbers we have, okay? And we want to plot that numbers in the bins of specified here. So our range is 0 to 100. We are trying to uh, plot that in this combination, okay? So we'll understand how the data is looking like. Cool. So bin specify. So what does it do is it will take zero to hundred. Uh, how many are there? So it will count and put it here. So zero to twenty, you have five things. So which means one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So between zero to twenty. So note down, guys. It will not consider twenty. Okay. It's still twenty. So you have these numbers. That's what is five. Then uh, twenty to forty. Okay. So which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. So you have seven numbers between zero to 40. So that's what is seven here. So what a histogram do is it will take all these numbers and based on the bins we have specified, it will plot the histogram. So we'll understand where that skew is there. Is it uh, in the middle or is it in the last? So how the distribution of the data is looking like okay so let's consider this to be uh, height uh, okay uh, of uh, of students in a class okay or let's say uh, attendance of students in class that's better because we have 0 uh, 10 to 95 so let's consider this percentage okay so we have uh, this one and then what we are trying to do is we are trying to plot that as an histogram, okay? So we are saying between zero to 20%, uh, how many people are there, okay? 20% uh, of attendance, how many people are there? We have five people and 20 to 40, between 20 to 40, what, how many people are there? So that is seven and, and 40 to 60, that is one, 60 to 80, that is eight, 80 to 100, that is three, okay? So we are trying to understand how the distribution of uh, attendance percentage is there. Okay. So we know, uh, let's say there are uh, majority of people are between let's like, six to, to eight, then 20 to 40. 
Okay. So accordingly, we can take actions or uh, this might not be a realistic data, but there will be always a skew in the left or the right. Okay. But do you guys understand uh, what does an histogram do? Move to the uh, next uh, part in the histogram itself. Okay. So here uh, in the histogram, got it. So we are, we can, uh, so it's the same thing, right? We have not changed anything. So as, so in the histogram, what we are trying to do is the same thing. We have not changed much. We are creating a title, X label, Y label, grid, all that. We are just trying to give uh, the color as well. So we can give even colors using a color codes here. Uh, so that's one example we are trying to do here. Um, so we have this color codes, right? We can get uh, using uh, histogram. We can also give color codes instead of the color names uh, in histograms. Okay. So that's one example we are trying to uh, do here. Let's try this out as well. Um, So it's not that you need to give color, or, uh, I mean, color code, just an example. We are giving it here. You can also give directly red there. Okay. So just for our knowing, so if you can give color codes, uh, we can do that. So just for that reason, we are giving that uh, value of the color. Okay. So edge color, I'll show you it. So this is the color, the between these two colors, you have an edge, right? What is that edge color you want to have? So that's why we give that. Okay. Let's try that to the obvious color. Okay. So right now you have blue, okay, but which is very light. You can't even see that. That's very simple. So it's red, it's almost everything is red. So light color of that. So the next one is the box plot. Uh, please uh, note this. It's very important in real world. We might use this a lot, okay? So here, let's say we have three uh, data points. One is total and then one is order, then one then is the discount, okay? So what are we trying to do here is we are trying to plot all this um data points and see how the data is looking like okay so here we see and whatever is the orange line is always the uh, median data point okay okay and green green you show means is true it will show that mean value as well otherwise not okay so and one more point to note here is this point outside this range, the upper uh, uh, range, right? Upper or lower range, those are the outlier points, okay? So in this first two, there are two points which are outliers. So you can clearly see that, right? So we can have most of the values are between, uh, let's say uh, one to 30. And there's only one value, which is 70, which is very uh, uh, uncommon, let's say, which is outside the our current range. Similarly, in this case as well of order, we have mostly everything between 2 to 30, but one point which is of uh, 44 is also present, which is an outlier for this data set. But for discount, we don't see any outliers. So it's like mostly it is starting from, um, let's say, 5 between 60. So it's distributed across. It's not that most of the points are in one range. And all others are in, uh, um, let's say, uh, outside that range. Okay, so this kind of plots will always help to understand to see how distributed our data points are. Okay, let's move to the violin plot, right? So my violin plot is more similar to box plot, but the only difference you see in violin plot is to just see how the plot is looking like, right? Let's say uh, if your data is distributed across uh, all the parts. So let's say if you see the third one, right? So you see there is no skewness to one end compared to the other one, okay? Uh, but if you see the first one, as you have a one outlier, which is in the top, which is 70, there is a lot of skew in the uh, upper part and most of the data is present in the below, uh, the lower part, right? 
but in terms of third plot, it's distributed across all, all the uh, values, okay, between 10 to 60. But in two, it's between both of them. So most of the data is between uh, 0 to 20. And more than that, there is only one data point, which is 44, right? So this while in plots tell you where your most of the data is present, okay? So you can easily understand the first data for the first one, your data part is kind of uh, present uh, between 0 to 40 and second one is uh, 0 to 20 and for three it's equally distributed across all points okay so the final one we just want to look at a pie chart right so in pie chart uh, so let's say uh, you have uh, percentages are distributed so the example i gave previously was the population by state here we have let's say label and uh, let's say we want to understand uh, what is the, um, let's say, percentage of uh, animals. I'm just giving there, let's say, uh, it's dog, cat, wolf, and lion, okay? So we see uh, lion to be 34 percentage, all that. So here, these are the exact values. We can also, so in pie chart, we will be specifying the percentage. What is the percentage of that, okay? So instead of specifying the exact values, okay? So that's what we are trying to do here. So this is nothing but, so 80 divided by the overall uh, sum of all this. That's what will be done, done here, got it? So the pie chart will give you uh, the, the percentage distribution for each of uh, the category we have. Okay. And here we give the labels. So labels is nothing but what we want to have. The sizes are the values. And so how do you want to specify? So you want to one decimal place or two decimal place, everything you can give there. And let's say shadow, if you want to have any shadow to be true. So the below one, you can give that and start angle. So how the angle should look like. So that's that's one thing. And how much it should explode. Let's say, so here you are giving 0 0.1. So only this part will explode outer of that. If you are giving that to be zero, then it will not explode at all. That's it. It will be like a simple uh, uh, direct plot. So if you are giving here 0 0.1, so then it will only the the last one will explode. So the line one will explode. And that's okay. I hope this is also straightforward, guys. So let's run this code as well. The angle, guys. So how you want the angle to be. Okay, so how we want that angle to be for everything. Okay, so it could be 90, 30, all that. Okay. So if it's 90, it's just like straight. So that, that's the thing. So 45, 45 degrees. So how we want to start. So it's on the 45 degree angle. Now it's 45 degree angle. So that's, that's what the start angle means. So first auto percentage means how many decimal places you want. Let's say you can also give two here, sorry. So you can also change how many decimal places you want. So you can give two, uh, you can give three. So all that you can give it here. So normally we can stick to one, okay? So decimal places you want to show here. So if you give 45, you can see the angle, right? It's 45 degrees. So where it starts, when you give 90, it's straight. So that's the difference. How do you want the plot to look like? So when it's 30, it's in 30 degree. So wherever this plot starts is like. So that's what this angle is made for. So if you go into an Amazon website, right? So you can see tons of products here, right? Uh, or sorry, tons of listings. Okay, so let's say if you go and search something, for example, if I search for Nike shoes, okay, so starting from this, if you see, there are a lot of recommendations here, right? Nike shoes for men, Nike shoes, Nike shoes for women, all that. So it's, it's not a human who does this, right? They will not write if you type Nike, you should then predict Nike shoes, okay? Because uh, let's say uh, if uh, Nike have so many other products as well, it has, let's say jerseys, it has drags, it has like, uh, let's say all sports products. But 
based on the popularity, when people type Nike, the next word comes up to be Nike shoes, right? So in those cases, based on the how uh, people interactions are, so the, we build an algorithm to predict these words. So it is easier for the user to select that instead of typing that, okay? So first place in a search, so this is called query autocomplete, okay? So you are typing a query. So how do I complete that? Okay. So instead of a person typing that, I can give an expanded query here. So this also helps in reducing the time users want and also keeping a very unique queries and also have an expanded queries. For example, um, let's say I'm a male and I come into this, I type Nike shoes. So let's say I'm I'm like, uh, I have, I do not want to type the full query, but let's say Amazon does not know what I'm searching for. But once I suggest this, if I see this, probably I might click on men, okay? Or let's say I just want more specific things in this, Nike shoes for women, uh, sorry, men running, okay? So it can expand the query in a way that it can go to the specific need instead of me just typing Nike shoes here. So the first part here is autocomplete of anything, right? So once you go here, you need to do an autocomplete. So let's say I typed uh, Nike shoes for men. Cool. So there are millions of uh, shoes that would be available in an, any, uh, let's say, a website, right? Let's say if you go to Amazon, it has so many products available. So how do I rank these products in a such a way that you will buy those products, right? I cannot show all the products in a random way, okay? In that case, you may not convert at all, right? You may not buy that product at all. So there will be millions of products. I cannot keep scrolling till... I reach to something, okay? So in that way, so I uh, so I need to rank in a such a way that I the customer will like that product and convert, okay? So this is called ranking, okay? This is our ranking algorithm. These are supervised uh, algorithms, okay? So this is one case, right? Even then you will see some places sponsored. This is not coming from, uh, let's say, uh, ranking. This will come from an ad platform, okay? So this is one important thing, okay? This is a ranking algorithm. But once you go into this, let's say I like this product, you are giving more data to the, uh, let's say, uh, platform, Amazon platform. Then what it will show, it will also show the similar products that, that you might also like, okay? This will also come from the uh, algorithm, recommendation algorithm, right? So this is one place. So this is not just stopping at a higher level, anywhere you go, anywhere you have a data, so any e-commerce site will definitely have an, let's say, um, uh, algorithm to do recommendations uh, in so that you will convert in that site, right? So one, one thing is the product recommendation. Then, so the Alexa part, right? See, same thing on the Amazon. So once uh, you have an Alexa, the first thing you speak, right? So you need to convert that speech into text. So we'll, I'll, we'll build an algorithm, okay, based on deep learning. So once you talk that whatever you speak, that will be converted to an algorithm, uh, sorry, converted to a text. So then it becomes easier, right? So once you get the text, so machine learning or deep learning does not understand the text or voice, right? It need to convert it into numbers, okay? Let's say the text will be converted into a machine understandable numbers. Let's say you uh, every word or every letter, it could be given as a number. And then once you do that, whatever the action you told, then there will be a different algorithms based on this action. What should I do first? Okay. What should I suggest him so that he will like that? Let's say if I, uh, if I uh, talk about, let's say any movie uh, or movie name, right? Or, or just I have given some a word, that could be a movie, that could be a pro some product, anything like that, right? So it also need to understand my perspective, my history. So in that way, it need to suggest that, okay? So it's not just voice to, uh, sorry, voice to text, even post text, uh, it need to have an, it need to understand what I'm asking for, okay? Then post that, it need to go search. Let's say I might ask, call someone, play some music, all that could be there, switch off a fan. Okay, it need to categorize that. So first is voice to text, and then it need to understand what is the command at a higher level. 
then it need to understand which what should i do next so that the customer or the user will like whatever i have sent so there is an uh, reward for every good action so if i suggested something i need to make sure i like that the, like the suggestion cool so then yeah then there is a very big thing right the movie recommendation so it could be netflix recommendation or it could be youtube recommendation right so even let's say in a recommendation there is one interesting thing right it's not that always what do you like i need to also make sure i need to diversify my listing cool so for example if i uh, if i am watching a video so the next four results might be very relevant to you plus the video you are watching right so then i cannot show all the results very similar to that video itself so first four would be like which i might like or let's say which is very relevant to the video and also to me and the next would be diversified what do i like okay in a overall uh, youtube during this time let's say during 7 uh, 7 pm i every day watch a news uh, but i am watching a, sub, a different uh, a video right now but the next suggestion after that four so there would be a very um, let's say the first four suggestion or three suggestion i'm just giving that number right it's not always constant the four would be coming from what you would like it depends on the video or how many videos are already present all that but just giving an example they will also diversify your results it's not always what do you show or uh, all that right so let's give me let me give you another example here let's say you so i am telling you this because you need to also make, keep this in mind it's not always you are doing something customer might like okay you are recommending based on whatever people like okay uh, you need to always think in the business perspective okay uh, so that you are providing a business solution you are not just building an algorithm which solves whatever customer wanted you need to also think in a business perspective on building the algorithm okay Uh, let's take an example of swiggy right let's say you order from a swiggy let's say i mostly order biryani and just give me an example there so i should not always if i go to a swiggy application if it shows all biryani restaurants then that's an issue right let's say you are not even diversifying my results based on my historical behavior let's say i just uh, came into a swiggy uh, app a month back uh, let's say all uh, let's say i did a 10 orders all 10 orders i did biryani but you cannot show all restaurants based on my previous orders right so probably you can show top 2 3 restaurants based on what i like but also you need to diversify my results what i may like let's say there could be an other um, relevant thing people who have already ordered biryani they could be always liking the other things right i need to show that and if you take recommendation of movies right that's more interesting so let's say you watch some movie it's not that always you can you cannot suggest that movie again right because he has already watched that movie so you need to know people who have watched this movie what other movie he may like and what is my liking based on that okay so you need to suggest something new based on what he has already watched it could be like based on the let's say uh, what genre of the movie it is who are the act who are the actors in it was the length of the movie time so based on all that you need to diversify that so there is no one specific uh, i mean there are algorithm for recommendation but you cannot always think in that uni direction so you need to when you are building any machine learning algorithm you need to always keep in the business in mind what are you trying to solve for so that's more important than uh, let's say you are building an algorithm right so you can build any algorithm very fancy algorithm but if it's not helping the business then you cannot let's say we cannot go live all that right so in any real world you need to think the business first based on that what you are working for what you are what is the problem you are trying to solve you need to keep that in the mind parallelly you need to build an algorithm for that and you need to also understand the results based on the business needs as well as the model needs so there will be always two things one is business metrics one is model metrics okay okay let's go into the uh, other one right so let's take google right for example um so in google uh, you will have this right uh, anything you open a google uh, uh, maps right in that whatever happens let's say the time uh, how much time it going to take to reach it's based on the historical behavior and the current traffic right so all that prediction will go into the google right it's not generally 
uh, but yeah, there is less of personalizations there. For example, I might drive faster, you might drive slower, all that could be there. But here on a uh, higher level, from uh, point A to point B, how much time it's going to take or uh, how what is the pred uh, prediction on the traffic it's going to be in that time, in that location. There are other inputs to that as well. Let's say there are satellite signals, what is the uh, traffic right now, all that, that would be there. But other than that, the traffic predictions. So yeah, introduction to visual learning. So let's understand in a very generic way, right? What is a machine learning means, okay? So in real world, uh, before getting into what do we do with machine learning, in any any real world, uh, before going into the algorithm, we always start with a problem statement, right? So here we are trying to solve a real world problem. Okay? Yeah. So in order to solve a real world problem, we are taking the data which is already present. Okay? Yeah. Um, so it could be a, let's say, recommendation. It could be, uh, let's say, uh, for example, it could be search, ranking, all that. So what do we do there is, so there is a data which is already present and there is a problem we are trying to solve. It's not that, so there is a machine learning. Uh, I mean, there is, there is, there is an algorithm. Uh, there is no algorithm and you don't watch any videos, right? Let's say if I just rank based on popularity or give some random videos there, right? Uh, not random videos, at least let's say what are the videos present in a YouTube, you're going to watch that video, right? So we're going to tune that accordingly. Let's say you watch this video, you watch another video, all this are, comes from the data collection. Okay. And how do you make, make sure I keep, I mean, I make you uh, watching movie or let's say keep ordering something or let's say uh, show you a right product so that you can order very faster, all that, right? So the machine learning comes into play after that. So when starting something, the first thing you need to know is you are trying to solve a real world problem. Okay. So in that way, in uh, let's say you are working as a data scientist or a machine learning engineer, data analyst, anything, right? As a business owner, nobody is going to come and give you the data set which you, uh, let's say this is the data set, uh, this is the uh, problem and this is how you need to uh, build an algorithm. Okay. Or let's say he will not even tell you what is the solution, I mean, what I want to solve for, right? So the first thing, let's say a product uh, manager, he will come and tell you in our, uh, let's say if you are working in an Amazon, he will, let's, uh, let's say there is no um, ranking itself. Search, once you search something, there is no ranking itself, okay? So you go, product manager will come and tell you, today people are not converting once they search something. So our conversion is kind of lesser or, or you could say our conversion is say less than 10%. What is the conversion? How many people visit the site or how many people search something uh, and how many people actually buy something there or even click. Let's consider click, right? Uh, how many people even interact there? So compared to the other sites, let's say uh, our conversion is very less or people are not even clicking on the uh, results we saw or which is very less. So this is what you're going to say. So then you need to go back. You need to understand this is the problem uh, we have today. And you need to suggest that, okay, we can build a ranking algorithm. So instead of going by a uh, random rank, we can rank based on uh, the user and the popularity. And we can build an algorithm so that we can rank in such a way that people will convert from that. Okay. So let's take another use case, right? Let's say you are working in a bank and you are saying uh, uh, there is a, I mean, let's say a CEO is come and caught talking to you. People are not paying me back their loans. Okay. There are people, there are many people who are defaulting the loans. Okay. So, and so here you already have the data, right? So you have people who have paid the loans who have not paid the loans. There are like, it's a very difficult problem. I'm just saying, uh, let's consider who are pe completely paid the loans, who have not completely paid, paid the loans. There could be some gaps, right? People who have uh, partially paid the loans, they have not paid after some point of, we'll come to that problem. Let's say, let's keep, keep the problem statement simple. So you will say that people are not playing the loans or uh, how do I solve this problem, right? So you need to go back and think, build an algorithm saying that, so if a person is coming to you, Based on these data points, he will pay the loan, he will not pay the loan. Okay? So normally, you will always get a business problem, not a data science problem. The first thing you need to consider is, how do I convert the business problem into a data science problem? Then do I have the data for it, build the data, then build the algorithm. 
So building an algorithm is the last step. I would say that is a uh, like a 20 step, uh, sorry, 20% of your problem statement. Okay. So the other 80% will go into, let's say first, let's say 20% will go into defining the problem statement. And the major chunk will go into defining or let's say uh, getting the data out, the required data in the required format that you can get uh, to the uh, build an algorithm. Okay. So the other 20%. Then the other 20% would be understanding the algorithm results, analyzing that. Okay. The finally you will be doing an A-B test, all that will go into that. Let's have a quick quiz question, guys. And the question is, which of the following functions is built-in function in Python? And your options are factorial, print, seed, or squared. Please mention your answers in the comment section below. If you want to make a career in data science, then IntelliPath has IIT Madras Advanced Data Science and AI Certification Program. This course is of very high quality and cost-effective, as it is taught by IIT professors and industry experts. So as we know, right, machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. And uh, so what it can do is uh, you don't need to program something. So it has the ability based on the data, we can build an algorithm, right? Based on the data, you need to are building an algorithm so that it can predict given a data, okay? What's going to happen? Okay. Cool. So this, this is more on that, right? So let's say, People talk, right? Machine learning. Uh, let's say you are being a data scientist. Um, um, let's say you you have like a lot of data in that. Okay. So there are tons of other uh, different types of algorithms that you can use on a specific data or trying to solve a problem, right? So first we'll understand how does a machine learn. Okay. Cool. So in real world, so as you have more data, so it's not so i just want to clarify this right uh, machine learning is not just more data and more diversified data is important right okay so when people say uh, you have a lot of data more data does not just mean that you have a lot of data points you also have a diversified data points for example in this case let's say if i have lot many data points of a same image okay so let's say you want to predict a dog given an image, okay? Uh, then what happens there is, uh, let's say people have taken image of a front poster of a dog, okay? From front poster or a very clear image of a dog, okay? You have only that image and you are building an algorithm based on that. But in a real world, let's say there could be a many angles the dog could be taken or there could be two, three images in a same thing, okay? And let's say in this, the puppy, uh, for example, the cake can have the same three dots as a, for image, that's the thing, right? Image will convert it into a numbers. Uh, um, we would have seen this, right? In NumPy, there is an uh, array of uh, numbers. So image can be converted into an array of numbers and it can see, so let's say there are three dots, okay? That three dots will have a higher uh, value of that number compared to the other questions, okay? So when you say more data, it does not generally mean a lot of data. It also means there are good amount of data plus there are diversified data, right? So only then the machine learning algorithm will work better. Okay. So, so make sure uh, in a real world, you get a very diversified data uh, and this happens with more data itself. That's when people say machine learning works better with the more data. Uh, more data means like you have, you have collected a lot of data. So that diversity, diversity comes as a subset of that. You are not going and saying is it diversified or not. As you collect more data, you get a very diversified research. Okay. So yeah, in real world, we would have seen this, right? We people, uh, people, uh, when you are logging in some site, will uh, we are asked to click on something. These are this will really help uh, any image based algorithm, right? We are annotating the data. Okay. We are giving, uh, let's say, where uh, where where is a fire hydrant. So we are going and clicking in a different ways, uh, image taken in different ways. We are going and annotating the data so that it can uh, use that for learning that, right? Let's say uh, the image are taken, taken in different angles. We are going, what do we an annotation, right? We are just giving, is that true or not, okay? Is that going with, well with this or not, okay? In that case, you are giving an algorithm to learn, okay? As a human, we are labeling the data so that we can get the algorithm to learn 
so that in future it can be done by an algorithm itself okay so on a higher level we see artificial intelligence as a very uh, broader ground right and within artificial intelligence we have machine learning and deep learning okay so machine learning is more on a let's say um, let's say if you take an algorithms right um, so if you take an algorithm it could start from a very basic linear regression logistic regression all that right it's a so it could be a, a specific of an equation but when into go into an uh, deep learning algorithms uh, we will be studying based on a neural networks. So that field of study is built based on uh, the condition of a human. That's why we call that as a neural networks, right? How a human wife, uh, brain works. We have a lot many neurons. So and the neurons are clubbed together. And based on the signal you get, you, uh, let's say, react for that. So that is the base of a deep learning algorithm, okay? And yeah, artificial, we all know, let's say, it's a, a, a bigger field of computer science. And let's say uh, it's making machine work. Uh, let's say the repeated, it's not that if you build an algorithm, uh, everything the human does, it can be done for that, right? So you are training and mission for a specific task and that task, that mission can do that task better than humans, okay? And the same mission cannot do the same uh, uh, other work, uh, but humans can learn that, okay? There are differences, right? So let's say you train a robot, you are building a robot for a specific purpose, it will do only that, okay? Uh, and let's say you try in an algorithm uh, and let's say to just do recommendation, it will do just the recommendation, but it can do a far better job than humans, okay? So that's what like subset of a, a, it, it's specific to a problem. So if you can't program that, you can build that algorithm, okay? And we can solve the same problem as such of machine learning and deep learning as well. But it is, comes with a new set of algorithms uh, that has been built based on the neural networks. That's a base. And that base of that algorithm inspired brain, how our brain works, okay? We'll be uh, using Python. We have algorithm, which is already defined. We'll use the uh, uh, Python to do all this stuff, okay? So just want to tell you guys, right? It's not that uh, we are learning... Uh, you, once you learn Python, you know machine learning. That's totally different, right? So you can also build machine learning algorithm, uh, even let's say, uh, let's say using R, you can, let's say, you, even using Excel, we can build machine learning algorithms, okay? You can uh, build uh, algorithms there, okay? So Python is just a tool to use uh, that, okay? Let's consider this, right? You can do an addition just with hands, okay? Or just with our mind, okay? Uh, you can do an addition using Excel. Or you can use an uh, addition using, let's say, uh, uh, let's say calculator. You can use an addition using computers as well. So that does not mean we know, uh, let's say, I mean, addition only can be done through this. Okay. That's just a tool we are trying to do using a specific programming language. Okay. Uh, even Spark has machine learning algorithm. Okay. Once you get into big data, even Spark uh, has uh, machine learning algorithm, but that's not as uh, wasp as Python has, right? We have so many algorithms built in Python, but in Spark, that is very less, okay, compared to um, Python, okay? So the agenda here is we are using Python as a tool uh, to build machine learning algorithm, okay? Learning machine learning algorithm is a separate thing. So you need to understand how a machine learning algorithm works, okay? How do you need to tune that algorithm? For that, uh, you need to uh, have the understanding of math programming uh, and the business problem. So these are the three base things of uh, machine learning, okay? So you need to understand uh, the math inside the algorithm, okay? How the algorithm works, okay? For that, we need to have a uh, uh, basics of mathematics. Let's say it could be statistics, it could be probability, linear algebra, differential calculus, all that. But that's not, a, I mean, it's not that we are gonna solve uh, using that. We just need to know how those things works, okay? And even the algorithm, we are not going to build the algorithm from the base, okay? We can also do that. I'm just giving an example. We can also do that. But most of the algorithms are predefined that as a function, okay? There will be only one function. You will be passing X and Y to that. X is the uh, the variables. Y is the what you want to predict, okay? So once you have, have the data, uh, we can uh, train that algorithm, okay? We'll discuss with the data so that it will be more uh, easier to grasp things. But yeah. 
that's uh, just the higher level. Python is just a tool, okay, to do that. So yeah, so in future, uh, any any thing, right? Any role you take, uh, which is very uh, redundant, or let's say uh, it's it can be uh, programmed. For example, uh, let's say you are uh, it could be chatbots, right? You are going to a website, or you are going into uh, any. Um, uh, application you want to have a specific question right so in that cases for resolutions uh, you can build a chat bot algorithm the human needs okay um, in what does a major um, e-commerce website does is let's say you go into there for the majority of the things it would have built a chatbot applications okay let's say if you go into swiggy where is my order here you don't even need an algorithm here right so the next thing would be there would be set of predefined things that could happen okay or let's say how customer wants based on the history that can be solved by chatbot itself we don't even need human resources there okay and for example, uh, let's say uh, annotating a data or any any uh, human uh, which is redundant work that can be done by a human that could be built based on a machine learning algorithm, right? So that the amount of uses uh, required would be reduced, okay? Uh, and it's not just you are going to, I mean, the A or machine learning going to grasp the, uh, let's say jobs there, it kind of optimizes the jobs, okay? People talk it very negative way, right? So it turns out to uh, provide new job opportunities, right? And leave out way for a very big market so that people can be like incorporated there. Let's say uh, we can even say in future, so we have auto ML. So don't we need, don't even, uh, don't we even don't need data scientists? No, they're right. So uh, auto ML, as I said, uh, you the final part is just the algorithm, right? So you are building that algorithm. But the rest of the things, understanding a business problem and taking that to a data science problem is more important, right? So that there would be a human uh, required. But yeah, there would be steps that we want to do will be very reduced. So you don't need to, uh, let's say you are building a data, so you can really use an algorithm to build the data how you want it. You, you always don't need to quote there, okay? So yeah, from a very low level, let's say, I'm not saying it could not be low level, but uh, very redundant jobs to a very high level of suggesting something, even when you are coding something, you can even suggest. So let's say we have seen the autocomplete there, right? Uh, we can have algorithms that makes a human's uh, life easier for any software engineers. Can I suggest the code, what he needs to type uh, as I do for the, uh, let's say query complete. For example, if you are searching something, you are suggesting something, right? Can I do the same thing on a coding level? That could be possible. Or can I, uh, given a use case, I don't want to keep typing that. So on a higher level, I need to have this. So if I say this use case, can I type that code for him? Uh, or let's say, get the code ready instead of you go and typing. Uh, even like today's world, websites, everything, it's like more built automatically, right? You don't need to have a human to type the code, but only for when you need changes, the deep level changes, that's when human gets involved. Cool. So yeah, let's get into subdivisions of machine learning. Like, right? what are the types of uh, uh, problems we have? Okay, uh, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning. Right? These are the three major top subdivisions, uh, or let's say problems you might face in real world that you're gonna solve for. Okay, driverless car is an example of uh, deep learning. Okay. And it's not just the deep learning algorithms, right? Um, you also need a part of robotics there. It's not you build, uh, you need to suggest something to the car. So that part will also be included. But if you take into deep learning, right? So you need to have image recognition there. The first thing is the image recognition. Is there something I can predict coming into this? But it's not just deep learning, even the machine learning problems would be there, okay? Once you see there right let's say there's a car in front of me or if there is an object okay in front of me post that what action should i take there you can also use deep learning or you can also use machine learning what action should i take should i take a pass uh, it's not always deep learning let's say you already predicted something use a deep learning algorithm but you want to take an action okay you can have a machine learning algorithm what action should i take should i take a, uh, should i stop my car or should i slow down okay based what different action should I take can also be done there. 
But here in this case, we can also have reinforcement learning. I'll talk about that. It will be a uh, more interesting part. So the machine learning, it's more, we are trying to solve the real world problems only. If you take uh, both the things as a business point of view, uh, if you are seeing deep learning is a sub part of the machine learning, okay? So it is evolved based on the neural uh, networks, okay? So when you are learning uh, machine learning algorithms, you have a uh, different types of algorithms. Let's say uh, it would be like a linear regression, logistic regression, all that, right? It's it's working based on it. Um, so you 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 are building algorithms there. So, but that comes under specific type of algorithms. Okay, let me give you an example, right? Uh, we coined this term data scientists like in uh, recent decade, right? It does not mean we do not have uh, machine learning previously. It was there. We didn't have that name, right? When people who are statisticians, they were also using machine learning, okay? So for example, everybody would have learned equation of a line, right? Can I see? Yes, uh, y is equal to mx plus c. Uh, that's the equation of a line. So yeah, so every math class would add that, right? So in that case, that is also in machine learning. That's a machine learning algorithm, okay? That is comes from a statistics base, right? But how much you can do with uh, with that uh, is uh, let's say uh, is a issue, right? Uh, so there is an evolution of machine learning, okay? Then there comes up a higher level of tree based algorithm. That is solving more, uh, let's say that's kind of solving a other a wide base of data, okay? Wide base of uh, data algorithm, you are getting better accuracies in the model and you are training faster, you are solving so many things, okay, there. And the next evaluation there is the deep learning. And that has totally seen a new league of uh, whatever we were doing in machine learning, uh, the way of algorithm, the algorithm is built is totally different what we have seen here in the machine learning, okay? So that's also sub part uh, of the machine learning, but how it has built is the based on the how your human brain works, okay? That is called uh, neural networks. That is the base algorithm, right? So our human brains has a lot of neurons, right? So that's how the algorithm is built. So the major difference you need to understand here is how we are built from statistics, then we got machine learning, then we got deep learning, right? It's a sub part. We are trying to solve the problem, but in a, the way we are trying to solve is different, okay? So the deep learning comes into play in that. Um, and it will be more clear once you actually see how that algorithms are, but this is I have written a very higher level, okay? So this is more like an evaluation of uh, the algorithms, okay? and how the our, our algorithms have been evolved in a different way. And the way we build the algorithm is also very different in deep learning. Yeah, let's jump into supervised algorithms. Okay. So what is a supervised learning? And this does not change at all. When you go into deep learning, when you go into uh, uh, also, these are the base, right? So this is how you solve a problem. Even deep learning, you can have a supervised algorithm, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, okay? So all that would be there. Let's jump into supervised learning, okay? So what is a supervised learning is? So you already have a data which is labeled, okay? You have a label of that data and you are building an algorithm based on that label, okay? So a very simple example here, right? Uh, let's say you have a training data where you know uh, you have different images, okay? You have like, let's say 1 million images. And for all that 1 million images, you have a label uh, uh, images of fruits and all that images, you have a label whether uh, what is that uh, fruit is, okay? It could be apple and that images are taken different angles, okay? Uh, is it an apple or is it an orange? All that uh, things would have been labeled. And once you have the label and you can, uh, you, you are going to build the algorithm based on that label, okay? You are training the algorithm uh, and saying that you need to predict this, okay? Um, I guess it will be a more clear uh, if I go to an Excel and explain you that, right? Let me open a small Excel sheet and tell you, give an example, right? So generally, let's understand how a data will look, right? So for example, if you are building an algorithm, how the data would look this feature one. One, feature two. 
I'll give x1, x2, it will be more easier. And you are predicting y. So what will how a data will look like this? You will have a lot of data here. It could be like uh, zero, or hundred, or let's say it could be like some some variable here, uh, category. All that you will be predicting value. Okay. So in this case, uh, so the data will be looking like this. Okay, you will have different variables of x. Okay, and based on this data, you need to predict y. Okay, so once you have a data and you need to have a label as well. This is the label. This is what we call label. Uh, what you want to predict? You have the data that is like supervised algorithm. Okay, and what is an unsupervised algorithm? Is you don't even have data. Okay, you are just giving. Uh, sorry. So some of the examples, right? It could be spam classifier, which is like fraud detection, and let's say a fingerprint. So you already gave the fingerprint. You need to understand uh, whether this the person is right or not. Okay. But in unsupervised learning, you do not have, uh, let's say, label at all. Your data will be given, and you need to classify or group this data. So all bananas together, oranges together, or apples together. Okay. So that's the unsupervised learning where you do not have the label at all. Okay. Then reinforcement. So yeah, you need to cluster this data into these things. Okay. So it could be, I mean, let me recommendations, everything. So what is the reinforcement learning, right? So in real world, you see this car example, right? Self-driving class. Or uh, so what here, uh, I mean, this is, will be trained offline, right? It's not that you want to. Uh, trying that car, self-driving car uh, online, or I mean, not in the real uh, environment, I mean, like roads, right? So what will happen is uh, there is something called risk and reward here. Okay, So there is an agent. Once you do this action, you will get an, uh, if you do that action right, you will get an reward. If you do a mistake, you will get an, um, let's say, a penalty. Okay, so So that the algorithm will optimize for doing the right thing. So the best example in real world would be a dog, right? People who have pets who will know that. So generally pet owners, what do they do is, uh, they will train the dog in a such a way, if he, if he does something good for dog, it's, it does not know, right? Which is good, which is bad uh, for a given, and it could be even on that specific person, what a dog, a pet can do based on his living condition, okay? So it will make sure you do not eat the food until owner says yes. So in during that time, it will, uh, let's say, it will, let's say, train the dog. So let's say once dogs, uh, uh, once he, one, only when we ring the bill, it should eat the food, okay? Or let's say uh, people train the dogs in such a way that you do an action. Let's say if you want to jump, you give some, uh, let's say, food for it, okay? And all this comes with an, this is a kind of a very good example of a reinforcement learning, right? You do something good, you get a reward. If you're not doing it, you will get a penalty there. Okay. So this is a subdivision of machine learning, but in real world, uh, we would be majorly seeing supervised and unsupervised algorithm. Okay. Uh, reinforcement uh, learning is just gaining the, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, gaining, and it does not, it, it have its, uh, let's say, uh, use case in very specific fields like self-driving cars like that and taking this into production is also in real worry right let's say in risk versus reward you can't test this in the <coughs> sorry you cannot test this in the real world or you cannot affect your customers all that but it's as a so the use cases of this are very small but there are a lot of research use cases for this. People do a lot of research on reinforcement. But in real world, in day-to-day -day life, once you are getting into any field, we see a lot of supervised and unsupervised learning algorithm. This all we discussed. What do you think? Uh, what do you uh, what do you do with machine learning, right? We do any any example we take, right? It could be like uh, building, uh, building, predicting the uh, house value, whether an email is spam or not. Uh, which type of house uh, lies in this segment? Uh, is this transaction a fraud or not? Anything you do, 
uh, I mean, like uh, many use cases we have for machine learning. Okay. So yeah. So even in supervised algorithm, we have two things. Okay. Uh, one is classification algorithm. One is regression algorithm. So when you are trying to solve, uh, so when you your label is a continuous variable. For example, your label. Uh, let's take this example. Predicting a house. Okay. House price. And you have features like um, number of rooms. Okay. Um, let's say like a number of rooms, square feet. And let's say uh, how many schools, schools nearby. What features it has, let's say gym, yes or no. Or let's say swimming, is there a pool, swimming pool or not? Okay. So based on this, so let's say you have four BHK and square feet of let's say uh, 2000 and schools nearby is three and gym you have, yes, this is yes or no. Okay, yes. And you don't have a pool. So what is the house price? Okay, let's say it's like uh, 50 lakhs. Okay all that. So you will have data like this and you have data like continuous variables. So it could be 50 lakhs, 30 lakhs, or let's say one crore. So you will have data for everything and you will have house prices. Okay. So house prices are continuous variable, right? So when you are uh, have a continuous variable, that is called a regression. Okay. And you will have features like this. Based on these features, you will train the model and you will predict it. Okay. I'll I'll come how that data will look like. And how, what is a classification model? Is let's say uh, you are predicting an email spam or not. So you will have features like uh, length, length of the email, length of the email, then uh, user name, domain. Uh, how many repeated characters? I'm just giving an example, right? Okay, so here you will predict is this spam or not? Yes or no? So this is classification algorithm. Is this clear, right? Difference between uh, regression algorithm and classification algorithm. When we are predicting a discrete, okay, yes or no, or let's say if you have like, you can have three, four categories as well. Okay, here it could be two categories or three categories. Let's say you are predicting uh, apple, orange, or pineapple, all that. You have three foods, images, you need to predict all this, okay? So or these are the few examples of classification algorithm. For regression algorithm, it's like continuous variable. You are predicting a continuous variable. What is the house price? Uh, or let's say, uh, what is the salary? All that, it could be a con continuous variable. So, uh, so uh, regression is, you have a continuous value. So for example, house price is a continuous value, right? You cannot say my house will be only 50 lakhs or 80 lakhs or uh, one crore. So your house could be 55 lakhs or each and every, uh, it could be even 51 lakhs or 53. You cannot say that is a it has a discrete value. This is the values uh, my results might get, okay? So your range, even range also, you cannot say that, right? Even the house prices can be more than one crore itself. Or let's say in the training data, uh, or the training data, you might have the data only till uh, 50 lakhs to one crore. But uh, in the real world, once you build that model, predict it, your house prices even can be like one crore, five lakhs. I'm just giving an example. So there is no bound to that. And uh, let's say it could take any value between uh, in that range, right? Uh, so it is a continuous variable. When you are predicting the continuous variable, it's called a regression problem. And when we are predicting a discrete variable, so it has the specific value. So it is like, uh, is it is email spam or not? Yes or no? There is no other value it can take, right? Or let's say you are predicting, uh, given an image of a fruits, uh, let's say only three fruits it can have, okay? Uh, you can predict, uh, let's say, is this, uh, let's say, fruit orange, uh, apple or pineapple? So if the problem is defined. You need to predict only, classify these three only, right? or it could be fraud detection. Yes or no, is this fraud or not? Or it could be like, uh, will this customer pay me the entire loan or not? Yes or no, that's it, simple. 
So there is no other variables it can take. So you are just classifying will this yes or no, or what is the category of that? Okay. So as I said, right, classification algorithm is so is this a person, male or a female, or is email spam or not? So these are defined, right? So you're gonna just predict these two values. Okay. Okay. So yeah, so the other examples are like let's say um is this transaction fraud or not? Or is trying someone trying to hack our network? Okay. Uh, these are unusual patterns. There is a difference here. Okay. Uh, so classification algorithm, even there will be data will be very skewed. So you need to understand how your data is looking like. Let's say, for example, uh, you are building an algorithm. Um, you are saying my accuracy is 99%. So when you say something 99%, is it a good, good algorithm? My algorithm is predicting 99% right. Is it a good, good algorithm? Any algorithm cannot be 100% right. Let's say 99.99%. Uh, let's discuss any algorithm cannot be 100% right. There is something called uh, overfitting. I'll tell you guys, I'll explain that uh, before going to that itself, right? Let's say normally in a real world, uh, when uh, when it's 99% or 99.9%, it depends on the problem statement you are trying to solve, okay? So for example, in real world, let's say you are predicting male and female, uh, your data might have 50% male, 50% female, or let's say 49, 51, something like that. Okay. But in terms of problems like spam or fraud, your most of the data, I mean, let's say your 100% data, let's say how many, for example, if I say, uh, if I have built, you are have an algorithm and all the data, uh, you have a data, 99% of the data will not be spam, right? Or let's say if you are having a fraud transaction. How many fraud transactions you guys should have faced? Right? That's very, very less, right? Uh, so, yeah, Ramesh, let, let me come to that point. We'll talk. It's not just uh, accuracy in that point. Okay. Uh, so, in terms of that classification problem, so once you have 99% of data to be non fraud, only 1% data would be fraud. Okay. Uh, let's say any algorithm you build or just you write a rule, uh, predict everything to be zero. Okay, not fraud. So you will have what do you, what will you have? You will have um, hundred. I mean, your accuracy would be ninety nine percent because ninety nine percent of time you are right. Only one percent of time you are wrong, right? So in that case, you cannot have something called accuracy there. Okay, so it depends on the problem to problem. So it's not just an accuracy as a measure. We will see there is something called precision recall. But we will talk in detail when we go to the actual algorithm itself. That will be more clear to you guys. So it's not 100% is right here. Be clear on that, guys, right? So there is some concept called overfitting. Okay. So let's say you build a data. Okay. Let me show you guys. So you build an algorithm in your training data. Okay. So let, let me show you that, right? So how you build an algorithm first. So house prices, okay. let's, uh, let's say you have a classification algorithm. Let's not do this. Let's take fraud or not for a prank problem. Okay. Um, so here salary or income. Average deposit. So in real world, if you want to build an algorithm, right, you will not get a data like this. Okay. You will have data from different sources. For example, uh, in order to get uh, income uh, data of a customer, it will be, there will be a data source or a table, uh, which will be stored there. You will have users table. 
okay users table uh, from that you might get the income of the customer so it might have uh, so that will be a separate uh, table or a data frame okay and for average deposit in one year what you need to do is you need to go into transactions table transaction table we need to we studied this aggregations right so based on user level we need to find the average office uh, trans, uh, average office deposit uh, every month okay deposit average so here we will be aggregating this data okay so based on the user level so here you have at the user level itself so here uh, married or not it will be here based on the user so you will not get the data which we wanted directly so once you get the problem statement we need to think what are the other features that might be uh, what are the features that we can use to build this algorithm okay let's take this problem statement itself right so now i have, I have added and you need to go to the tables and derive those features then create the final data frame for building an algorithm okay uh, a business owner or a, you are working for a company there a product manager comes and tells you uh, people are not playing the loans back can you build an algorithm to predict will this customer pay my loan or not okay so this is what uh, the questions customer i mean product manager is asking you okay what are the data points do you guys think that will be helping you to build the algorithm let's not worry about the algorithm let's worry about what are the data points that would be required right that's a very basic i mean that's a very generic question let's say income of um, and how what is the deposit in last one year average deposit per month is he married or not is he salaried person or not what type of job he seen to all that payment is age so as one data frame we've studied about data frame right do you guys think this data, even if you ask client, right, uh, it, it will not be present at one place. Some data will be at a unique level. So, for example, if you are talking about a user, let's say user gender, user gender, is, let's say it's, say, I mean, it will be in one table where it will be, uh, let's say, user features like what are the features you could have income. So, this is fixed, right? It could change time on time, but what is the final thing you're going to take during that time, right? Is he married or not? That will change, but that will be in one table, right? Based on the users. And the other things you talked about, let's say uh, the SQL helps, data frame helps, everything helps here, right? Or Python helps, okay? So the other things, deposits, right? Deposits will be in a transaction table. And is he had any assets or let's say, has he taken any loans or not? That will comes from loans table. And how much did he repay, okay? So all this data will be in different tables or different data sources. You need to get the data and convert into one thing. Okay. Here, here the transaction will be at what transaction ID level. Okay. So how will the data will look for a transaction? You will have, let me open another tab, right? So you'll have uh, transaction one, he paid deposit. Uh, deposit of 1000 and let's say transaction two deposit of oh, sorry withdraw of 100 so all that would be coming here okay deposit withdraw based on user level u1 would be here u1 so same thing will be for sorry user one user one same thing will be for user two uh, user two user three everyone right so you will be aggregating the deposits and withdrawals and then putting the data here at a user level. So we, need, we are predicting at a user level, right? So you will be aggregating the transaction at a user level, then combine users and transactions, whatever we have aggregated. Here we have aggregated user level, here we are already having the data at user level. So we'll be aggregating this data, these two, and also this here also loans, if he has any loans, this could be there, okay? This is where your uh, data will help, right? The, uh, whatever we studied in, um, let's say Python, the pandas right so you you will be merging these three things and you will know users will have always a transaction right so let's say uh, then you will do an inner join here and it's not that all users should have loans then you will do a left join okay so you will take data from different tables and then you will put it into one table the way you want it and 
then you will get the data whether he has repaid the loan or not. Previously, if you have taken the loan, I mean the users who have taken the loan will get their, their data and we will see whether he has repaid the loan or not. So we'll build a data like this. Okay. I can repeat even once uh, again if you have doubt. This is very important, guys. It's not just learning the algorithm, how it works. You need to know how we are applying the data in real world uh, because we are not going to repeat this again because when you are learning, you will get the data as it is, right? You are going to just build the algorithm. We are not going to know how we are going to build it, okay? Yeah, risk assert. Yeah, that's right. These are the features. That's right. But I'm just asking, how are we building the data, okay? I hope things are clear. It's very straightforward, right? So you are having data from different sources, okay? And you are combining that the data, how you wanted in one data frame for building the algorithm. So in this way, uh, so you get the data for, let's say, 100 data points. One, two, so let's say, uh, not 100, let's say, one, two, or let's say you have like um, 10,000 data points of. So let's say you build the data like this. You have 10,000 data points, okay? So then what do you do, okay? So you need to build an algorithm based on this. So in during the building an algorithm, what we will do is you need to also know uh, how the algorithm is working in real world. Okay? So you have, let's say one year of data uh, from, uh, or let's say you have like 10,000 data points, of people who have taken loan already or not. Okay? So what do you do is you build this, build, uh, split this data into two parts. Okay? So let's say 70% of data, you will take only till 7K. And with this data, you build the algorithm. And this data you will keep for testing. So this is what we called as train and test split. Okay, this is the train data. So this is the train data, training data. And this is the test data. So we also have some 10% for, let's say, sometimes we'll have something for validation. Okay. So what we will do is, let's say we have an algorithm. We'll learn about it. Let's say we have an algorithm. We will give this data. This is the input. For this input, this is the output I am expecting. Okay. Sorry, this is the output I am expecting. Okay. So we build an algorithm and we see my accuracy is, let's say my data is 50, 50%. Okay. My accuracy is, let's say, 90% where you're going to predict 50, the data is like male or female. Okay. I'm just doing it. So my accuracy is uh, 90%. Is that good? Yeah. Kind of 90% is good when your data is kind of 50, 50. Okay. But when you are testing the data, which is unseen, this data is not seen by algorithm, right? That's how you will know how your algorithm going to work in the real world. This is more important. Okay. Yeah? So your data is like here, you will have like nine, uh, let's say 50%. Is this a good algorithm? So this is the accuracy in trying. And this is in test. So you have a data set. You will split that into three, uh, two parts. Let's talk about validation later. So what you will do is this data is already known which is yes or no, you will have the data, which is previously present. We'll have this data, but we will not show this data to the model. Okay. So what we will do is we'll show only 70% of data to the model and train a model to uh, predict whether uh, this customer will pay a loan or not. Okay. And this data will not show to the model. We'll not use this for training. Okay. Then what we will do is will you build the model on this data, right? We'll see how much good is in this data because this, this data is not seen by the model, right? So if it's performing same way as the train data, it's good. Let's say here it is 90, 89%, same as like closer to train. So we can say when we get this model in the real world, it will perform in a similar way. So what will happen is, so this is the actual uh, paid versus not paid, right? 
Okay, then we build a model. So model will also predict. Yes, no. Sometimes it can even predict no, right? Let's say. Yes, all sorry. So what will happen? The accuracy here. And so this this data is already seen by the model. So the model is tuned to this data. Okay. Then what will happen is uh, when the model uh, for an unseen data, we need to give this model. Okay. Let's say it's not predicting at all. Let's say it's predicting very weirdly here. Then that model is not good. So it's predicting uh, no, yes, no, yes. Okay. So it's not even predicting right. So the model is as more fit to the the above data. So model is like performing 100% in uh, train data, performing like 10% in test data. That's not a good model because it will not perform good in the real world. Okay. Which is a good model is, which is performing 90% or let's say even 95%. However, it is performing in the uh, real uh, train data. It need to perform the similar way in the test data as well. 89 or between 89, 90, 91, kind of that, right? It need to be closer to the, uh, how it is performing the train data because this data is not seen by the model yet, okay? So once you take this model in the real world, it will perform the similar way, okay? So this concept, when, when overfit is like, your train data is, training data is 195% or even or 100%, okay? And here it is like 40%. So this is over fit. Under fit is here itself in an accuracy. You are seeing just let's say 30% of accuracy. You're not even, model is not even good like, uh, let's say, uh, let's say good uh, to be uh, good than average also. Let's say you predict everything to be male. Uh, then it's like 50% right, always, right? You have a so it's like very underfit model, right? So that's what we call as underfit. During underfit, we will not even see the test data. So in the same classification algorithm, there is an other subdivision um, when you are when we are talking about, right? Let's say uh, it could be uh, the skewed data. That's what we call it as a skewed data set, where you have major population in one end, and there is a very very minimalistic, like not even one percent, like zero point zero one percent. Uh, in that case, uh, the transaction like, so uh, a fraud transaction, it's not loan or not playing the loan is also different. Like it could be 5% all that, but these are like very skewed. Like it's just, it could be uh, less than 0.1% like that. And is there any hack in the network, all that. These are very uh, uncommon events occurring. So these comes under mostly um, anomaly detection algorithm. So why I'm saying all this is because for every, uh, let's say, type of algorithm, um, for every uh, group of algorithms, uh, type of a problem, we will have a specific type of algorithm we will be using. Okay? Uh, so just understand, um, I mean, like, what are the different types of algorithms are there, but this will also come under a supervised algorithm. Okay? So these are kind of subdivisions or, of that. Mm -hmm. In classification, even in classification, it's a subdivision of that on anomaly detection algorithms. Hmm? Yeah. So what we else have is like, uh, so we can also work on clustering the uh, data sets, right? Grouping the data set into uh, kind of specific uh, use cases. Okay. Um, let's say it could be uh, where a house lies in a segment or let's say uh, what type of customer buys this product, all that. So this this will not be a direct yes or no, but in an overall level, so let's say you are you have a marketing campaign, right? Uh, you want to build an algorithm uh, who can buy this uh, products, right? So you will be building an uh, algorithm to predict that. So whether uh let's say uh, whom i send should send a notification let's take an example here right uh in real world say let's say uh you have given a uh, marketing uh, budget okay and you have so many of customers you cannot send all the uh notification to all the customers right first thing it's not a good experience for customers um and uh, and you need to send to a specific group okay 
or you need to target say, specific customers in Facebook, Instagram, all social medias. Okay. So in that case, when you can build an algorithm to predict what are the what type of customers can buy this product, so you can kind of target only those uh, customers. Okay. So yeah, so let's get into uh, regression algorithm, right? So yeah, so let's start with, um, let's say regression, right? So you have many things, but generally uh, how a regression uh, data looks like, for example. So what we will do is something called mean squared error. So it's nothing but, so what is the value you predicted? So actual value minus predicted value. Whole square. So uh, when you're working with an algorithm, a regression algorithm, so what do you generally do is, uh, there are different sets, right? You can have mean squared error, mean absolute error, all that. So, uh, so mean absolute error is nothing but, let's say you directly have this. Okay, without any square, sorry. So, so how do you calculate this? Let's say in a real world, when you are building an algorithm, right? So you need to say, how good is your algorithm in test and trying, right? So one example I gave you was accuracy. So that's for classification problem. But even in the classification problem, we have uh, so many other things, okay? Uh, like pression, recall, F1 score, all that, but yeah. Let's uh, let's discuss that. But before going to that, when you are saying how good your uh, regression model is, right? So in that case, you will be calculating uh, the actual value minus predicted value, the whole square. So in some cases, the whole square uh, would be uh, necessary. Some places not. But in general, uh, the generally we uh, mostly will be using uh, mean uh, squared error. Okay. Or uh, and to get negate the uh, root value, I mean negative value of that, and sometimes we'll uh, we'll also use uh, root mean squared. Okay, so it's just the root of that square root of that. Okay. So you have root here. So uh, in this case, uh, what you generally need to do is what was your value minus the predicted value? You need to square it. Okay. So based on this, you can say, how was my model uh, performed? Yeah. But how can you say this, right? Can you, uh, is this, a, do you guys think there is a specific value, uh, which is good? Probably for an accuracy, you can say like 90%, 80%, all that, right? But let's say your mean squared error, you are saying, uh, or let's take the same uh, 50 lakhs, uh, oh, sorry, uh, house price example, right? In house price example, somebody is telling you, your mean squared error is like, um, I mean, we are having in the values of 50, for 50 lakhs, we'll have 50, 100, all that. You are having a mean squared error of like, root mean squared uh, error of like, uh, let's say uh, four. Simple guys, let me repeat it, right? Let's say you built a model, okay? Let's say you have a data like this, uh, or let's say you have data like house prices, which we have previously. So let's say, let me put that example also. Let's say you have value of, uh, so you have values for uh, based on this different values, number of rooms for
So yeah, so you have um, like data like this, right? So you could have same, so many data points like this. So what will first you do is you build a model on this train data set, yeah? So this is, let's say train data set and you have a test data set. So I'm just, for example, we are having uh, less number of data points, but in real world, let's say you have millions of data points, right? So in that way, you are building a model on this. So this is the value Y, okay? And these are the values of X. So you have value y and x. So you built a model. So model will predict something, right? So you built a model, you model will predict some data point. You need to know how your model is performing, right? So you, uh, so it's model is built on this data. It will predict for both train and test. Let's say model is predicting like 49, uh, 49, uh, 31, 80, Just giving an example, right? So, in order to see how the model is performing, you need to have some value, right, for that. Okay. So, what is the value you think that is right? I mean, like uh, based on if you want to understand your model prediction, right? So, we'll use something called root mean square, let's say. So, what we do is generally so house price, so actual one minus predicted one, the whole square. So square root of that, we can also use that. Okay. So we'll have the sum of this. So this is root mean square, sorry, mean square error. Sorry, we can take an average. So here it will give you the model. So let's say you have model one, which has predicted like this. Okay. And let's say, uh, sorry. so you can say my model mean squared error is 1.75. For a values like this, uh, 50 to 40, it's good. But let's say your values are like in thousands, all that, right? Let's say your difference would be higher. So you always need to understand what is your uh, prediction value, uh, let's say um, uh, your model performance, right? That's when you will see how my model is performing, right? And let's say your model uh, mean square error is 1.7 here, and suddenly it is like 15, and let's say like um, here. So what will happen? So your mean squared error has suddenly shifted from 1.75 to 125. That's really wrong, right? So, so that's when we used to understand. So model metrics are something we used to understand how my model is performing better, okay? So here we have something called mean squared error, new root mean squared error, all that, okay? So here in this case, if you see, I mean, if you if you want to negate the value of squaring, you can just use root there. But uh, even then, you can clearly understand this model is overfitting, right? So here you have values like this. Uh, I mean, like your uh, value is 1.75 here. It's 125 here. It's way different from train versus test. So let's say and uh, in real world, we'll not just stop with one model, right? We'll build an other model, same uh, regression model with different parameters, right? So we'll use four features, five features. In some cases, we might use three, four uh, actually, right? So in that case, we might build so many models and we'll try to understand, let's say this model is giving out, um, so in that case, this we can try understanding this model, right? So let's say here mean squared value is even lesser, okay? And let's say this model is even performing in the uh, test data as well, as uh, predict, uh, as uh, in the train, let's say it does not have 
a lot of uh, gap between sorry what did i do let's have a quick quiz question guys and the question is what will be output of len parenthesis then bracket hello 246 and your options are error 6 4 or 3 please mention your answers in the comment section below if you want to make a career in data science then intellipat has iit madras advanced data science and ai certification program this course is of very high quality and cost effective as it is taught by iit professors and industry experts so yeah so you don't see much difference between train and test here so we use model metrics to understand how is our models performing on the data we have so we uh, we see how is my model performing in train and how is my model performing in test and you can build lot of models for the same data set itself and understand which model i can use okay in the real world and see the gaps okay this when we use the model metrics model metrics are very important to understand the model performance okay and also will not just stop with this right we'll also understand business metric so so there are two things you always need to check when you build a model how is my model performing on this uh, or model test and train everything and how is my business metric looking like so for example um, so let's say you are building a model to classify uh, whether he will pay my loan back or not okay so in that case you can un also understand by building this model how much i going to save for this bank okay uh, so that will give you an idea when you are talking to business owner okay so you always need to write down two things you have you need to have a model metric also you need to have a business metric so if you see here so my why is the actual house price okay and uh, uh, for building a, another model which is uh, i my this is my predicted value so this minus so oh, sorry 20 minus 21, the whole square. So that's the mean squared error. And normally you always divide by n. Okay. So how many data points you have? That's what you do. But yeah, I have not added that here. But yeah, that is generally known. Okay. Overall, you will divide by n. So if you do an average, so it's like division of all things, right? You divide by two, or you do an average, you're gonna get the same value here. But yeah, one more thing to understand, right? So in real world. uh we will not always uh stick to specified set of features okay let's say um you uh you come up with a lot of features uh for a problem statement so what you generally do is we try to understand the importance of the feature okay um that so how do you understand that important of feature it changes from problem statement to problem uh, sorry algorithm to algorithm but we'll discuss that but if you let's say you have a tool uh, or let's say you have a function to say for this model these are the important features okay um, so what do you do is and also uh, what do you do in this case is you will try out different combination of features okay so you might let's say you uh, somehow it turned out to be pool is not a very important feature right so in that case you will what will you do is you will again build this model with just three features okay to predict the house price and um, and let's say that is model 3 with three features okay and understand uh, how my model is performing good okay so this is one thing and more than train and test we also have something called validation okay so what is the validation data set is so why do we need a validation data set is so we generally train our model here okay with a train data set and test and see the trust data set but but what we do is keep tuning that model based on how it is performing on test so if, even if it is not seen the data of test we are tuning that model based on the test data till it's performing best on the test data so what could happen in that case is uh, in real world it might not be tuned according i mean it might not be like uh, let's say generalized for the real world data set so we always have a validation debt which is not attached until we finalize the model okay we test we train we test we try out different combinations all that uh, so we call that as a hyper parameter tuning of models uh, and the uh, trying out more different features in the model only then once we finalize the final model only then we will go into the 
um, how does it? We'll go into the validation and test finalize. Okay, this model is performing based on the final uh, validation set as well. So the split would be like normally, let's say we can always have uh, 70 uh, for train, uh, 20 for a test, 10 for validation. Okay. Um, is this clear? Why do we need to have a validation data set? Let's get into classification problem, right? So as said previously, okay. So you have a classification problem where it says, um, let's take an example, right? Let's say you have one. Right. So in this case, we'll have uh, one, one, So, okay. So in this case, ones, um, ones are like five, zeros are like a four. Let's say it's, let's say it's equally distributed, let's say, okay. So what you generally do is, uh, one thing is called accuracy. Okay. So accuracy is generally used in a balanced data set. Okay. So, so how many um, yeses are there? Like uh, how many matches are there? They're by the total count, right? Let's say in, in our case, so we have like what? Um, so totally 10 we have, and we have like what? Two false, right? So our accuracy would be 80%, right? So eight uh, divided by 10, okay? So, but let's say we do not have these many points. Let's say we do not have, uh, Let's say uh, we are trying to predict. Okay. Say, let's say we do not have a balanced data set. Okay. We have like uh, five ones uh, and two zeros. Okay. So what do you do generally in that case is we call something called uh, recall and precision. Okay. So let's say you wanted to predict only one. Okay. What is a recall is out of all ones. Okay. Uh, how many ones you are able to predict right? Okay, so in that case, so can you tell me guys, out of whatever uh, recall of, so here we will be differentiating two things. Recall uh, for one, we'll have recall. Uh, so what is recall is, let's say uh, out of all positives, out of all ones, uh, how many you are able to predict right? Okay. So in that case, so how many total we have ones? We have five ones, right? We have five ones. In that five ones, we are able to predict four right. Right? So out of uh, five ones, we are able to predict four right. So our recall is 80%. Got it? Um, let's say you train your model on 70% of data and you test your model on 20% of unseen data, okay? But let's say your model is not performing good on that 20%, what will you do is you will go back to the train data and you go back to the model and you tune your model to make sure it is performing best uh, as uh, in train as well as test, okay? Even though you have not shown the test data to the model train mod, training model, right? Uh, even though you are not uh, shown that, but you're tuning the model so that it's going to perform in good in test data, right? But in process of tuning that, what could happen is it might overfit for the test data as well, okay? So in that case, what you need to do is uh, you need to have a final validation data set where it is, uh, it is not even, that should be the final model you're going to test there, okay? You're not going to tune a model anymore. So it should be the final data where you need to test, okay? So you will do all the uh, model improvements between train and test itself. Even though you're not showing, you will go back to the train, train model, uh, train, uh, sorry, training the model and uh, uh, do hyperparameter tuning, uh, changing features, all that you will do there. Uh, but uh, you will not test until your final model is ready. 
only then you will go to the validation data set. It's kind of a second, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, making sure your model is going to perform in the real world. Okay, but normally uh, train and test should be good. But yeah, still uh, we have a concept called validation. That's why I'm saying that. Okay. Let's uh, let's understand about recall, right? So recall out of all ones, okay, out of all actual ones, how many you are able to predict, right? Okay, so let's say uh, we have how many actual ones? We have only four actual ones. Okay, normally uh, we calculate accuracy for the um, let's say skewed data. Let's say where whichever data is uh, sorry, we normally calculate recall and precision when uh, for the unbalanced data set. Okay, so let's say your uh, data set is uh, 70, 80, or oh, sorry, 70, 30. Or 80, 20, or 90, 10, or even 95, 5, it could be even one percent, right? So, but for what we calculate recall and precision, we might calculate for both the categories itself. But generally, when you talk to a business person or a, any uh, any other co-worker, you'll talk accuracy about uh, sorry, you'll talk precision recall on the uh, minimal data set. So where uh, the things are lesser, right? For example, in case of fraud. So let's say you have totally, um, let's say you have totally uh, how many 16 data points. Out of that, um, uh, loan versus not loan, uh, who have not, who have paid the loan, who have not paid the loan. Ones are who are not paid the loan. Okay, out of 16, you have what? Uh, totally um, four who have not paid the loan. Okay, so you have 25 percent of people who have not paid the loan. Our data set is like 75, 25. Okay. So in this case, you want to understand uh, what does a recall mean is uh, action, uh, out of who have not paid the loan, uh, how many we are able to predict right? Okay. Uh, so for that, what we need to do is, so how many uh, who have not paid the loan is the denominator. So which is like what, um, which is like four. And how many, who have, uh, how many we are able to predict right? So which is like, uh, so we are not able to predict right only one. So which is three divided by four. So our recall is 75%. So you can say, uh, I'll be able to lightly predict. I mean, like say, if you are talking up to a business owner, this as a business. So how do you say this? I'll be able to predict 75% of time uh, who are not going to pay the loan, right? Okay. But yeah. But in real world, you, you need to understand what does a recall mean. It's not just the formula, guys. So, uh, yeah. So, formula you get forgot, but just uh, keep this point clear, right? Uh, and so, you just, if you take this a uh, loan problem, so you need to understand uh, who are not paid the loan, how many I'll be able to uh, predict, right? That's how uh, you need to keep this in mind. So, it will be easier for you to remember, okay? As a formula, as it's like, uh, what is the true positive? And what is the, uh, let's say, uh, how many we predicted, like, right, right? So what is the overall part? Cool. So in, uh, in terms of precision, what we will generally do is, so let's say our recall is 70%. That's okay, okay? But in terms of predicting the recall to be 70%, let's say if I predicted everything to be one, is that a good model? then you can't even give loans to everyone, right? Uh, anyone. So what you need to make sure is, am I predicting only the right things or what I wanted? Okay. So then what we will do is, out of uh, predicted ones, okay? Out of predicted ones, okay? Uh, how many are actually right? Okay. So in that case, how many are predicted to be one, which is six? How many is actually right, which is three? So three divided by six. So my precision is 50%. So here, what we are saying, true positive. What is true positive? We are saying these are true positives, okay? Which is three. So again, three divided by three plus false negatives. What are false negatives? Which is falsely predicted as negative. What is that? Only this one. So this one, the zero is falsely predicted as negative. Okay. So that's nothing but uh, let's say if you want to put it in a words, uh, out of actual positives, how many positives you are able to predict right? Okay. So, but this is the actual definition. So, when somebody asks about what is the formula of recall, you tell two positive divided by true positive plus false negative. Here, false negative is uh, 
uh, which is predicted negative, but it's actually positive. Okay. Is this formula clear? And what uh, is also clear about false negative? Okay. Now, now what we're gonna see is uh, precision. So, what does precision mean? Is general generally don't think about formula. So, in process of predicting the uh, loans, let's say you are predicting who will default my loan, who will not pay back my loan. You predicted many of them will not pay back the loan, right? Let's say you have only four people out of sixteen uh, will not uh, will not pay. I mean, will not pay back the loan. But what you have done is you have predicted like uh, extra two people, okay? Sorry, extra three people who have not uh, who will not pay back the loan. Okay. In this case, what will happen is your when your pressure is so less, let's say it's fifty percent, uh, you will not be able to leave the give the loans to them. Okay. So you are losing the money or as well as from the business. So that's what pressure means, right? Pressure is out of predicted positives, okay? You have predicted uh, six to be positives. Out of that, how many are actually positives, okay? So out of predicted positives, which is uh, six, I have predicted six to be positive. And out of that, only three is positive. So here the formula would be two positive plus false positive. So formula would be true positive divided by true positive plus false positive. Okay, so this will give the whole idea as a one number. Okay, so how is my model is performed? So for example, let's say my pression increases to, um, let's say I'll just delete this for now. Let's say my pression goes to nine. Okay, 0 0.9, which is good, right? Let's say I, I'll be left at 80. Uh, but let's say somebody asks about how is your model performing. You can just talk about your fun score, but but your question could be nine, but your recall could be like uh, very less. Okay, your recall is like just one. Uh, your recall is just ten percent. Then it's not a good model, right? Or let's say it can be vice versa itself. Vice versa, like you can have a high recall but low pressure. So low pressure, so which is also bad. So you need to always have a common ground. You need to always have a good pressure and always good recall. But in this case, uh, in this case, you have, uh, let's say, I mean, kind of very less re recall is good. Let's say it's like 0 0.75, uh, but pressure is like 0 0.5. So you need to optimize your model in such a way that uh, you are able to like, uh, let's say, uh, not, let's say, not have these values, right? Change this to zeros, all that. So you need to improve the model so that your pressure is also increased and you can improve the F1 score at an overall level. Um, the regression is to uh, it's a technique to find the relationship between uh, two or more variables. Um, so change in dependent variable is associated with the change in one or more independent variables. So what does that mean? Okay. So let's say a variable X Okay, uh, its change is dependent on variable uh, y. Okay, um, so we'll discuss about that okay, in detail. So yeah, so to give an example here, uh, let's say a regression technique that displays a relationship between y based on the values of x. So for example, as the temperature decreases, okay, uh, we humans tend to wear jackets uh, to keep us warm. So there is a relationship between uh, the temperature, uh, the climate, and uh, the people's clothing, or it could be the sales of the clothing. How, how do you predict that? Let's say um, uh, there could be a relationship between, so here, uh, the temperature uh, is the independent variable, and uh, uh, let's say warm clothes. It could be the sales of warm clothes, or how many people are wearing uh, jackets, all that. So that could be the dependent uh, variable. So this jack, uh, number of jackets uh, people are wearing is dependent on the uh, climate uh, or the temperature we have. So the temperature is the independent variable and number of jackets is the um, dependent variable. Okay, so we can predict, uh, let's say, uh, number of jackets going to be worn based on the temperature that we have in the climate. So yeah, some of the other uh, other examples is let's say the temperature versus 
number of uh, ice cream sold uh, and inches of rain versus a new car sold let's say there are a lot of rains and that could be let's say leading people to buy different uh, new cars okay <clears throat> and yeah daily snowfall versus sky or visits okay so wherever you think there is a relationship uh, and you can say uh, you can build a regression model upon that okay right so in regression we have two things okay uh, so there is a linear regression and logistic regression so linear regression is for predicting the continuous variable okay it's a straight line so as you see a uh, logistic regression has a some function called a sigmoid function okay uh, a log linear regression is used for continuous variable uh, so it's a regression model uh, even though we call a logistic to be a regression but we use that for a classification problem uh, so fraud versus non fraud uh, who will pay the loan who will not pay the loan all this uh, categorical variables uh, uh, discrete variable that uh, we will be using logistic regression so that's for a classification problem for linear regression we will be using the continuous uh, uh, we will predict the continuous variables okay example house prices right <laughs> So we discussed these things in detail in last class. Okay. So yeah. So the same thing, right? So you see continuous variable, and it's also a regression issue here. It's also a classification issue. It's a straight line and S curve. S curve. So that curve has a, some name, which is sigmoid function that we'll discuss in the next class in detail in the logistic regression session. Okay. So yeah, so simple linear regression is useful for finding relationship between two continuous variables. So you have some X and you have Y. So one is the predictor or the independent variable and other one is the response and the dependent variable. So in real world, we use uh, the terms called independent variables and dependent variables. So here, a dependent variable will be only one and independent variable can be one or many, okay? So you are predicting a dependent variable based on many uh, other variables. It could be like one or it could be like even thousands possible, right? So you are based on all these combinations of X, you are predicting only one Y. So different variable will be always one, okay? Right. So here, uh, just to understand, let's say we have uh, only one uh, independent variable and uh, we'll understand the concept based on one variable. And that will be like uh, easy to visualize, understand all that. But in real world, we'll have always more than one variable. Okay, uh, that's how we build a model. Cool. Um, any doubts here? Um, let me see the chat window. It's more coming from whatever we discussed in the last session itself. Um, give examples, right? I'll do that, Ramesh. So we discussed, right? So uh, you you mean for what do you mean by examples? Uh, like for specific to this, specific to uh, simple linear regression, or let's say uh, multiple uh, examples. Okay, right. So as I said, right. So let's go back to um, this this example: temperature to uh, people wearing a jacket, right? Uh, so here, uh, there is only one uh, dependent variable. Yeah, it's always the same. And only one independent variable, which is temperature, the climate, right? Uh, so there could be other variables as well. So uh, for uh, people wearing a warm jackets, okay? It could be temperature or it could be, uh, let's say, there could be a festival season as well. Let's say uh, it's not that just the temperature. Let's say during a temperature, uh, people do not want to come out at all. They can stay home, all that could be possible. But uh, that season, the time of the uh, season is, um, uh, let's say it, uh, it could be a, a festival season. People want to come out and go uh, as much as possible. Then time is also important variable there. So it's not the climate, it's that uh, month uh, of where people want to buy. Okay. So let's say you are building a model to predict uh, how many jackets will be sold uh, during this month. So that um, you can build your supply for that. Let's say you are working for an, yeah, a retail or an e-commerce uh, website. So you need to build, tell your uh, sellers. So this is the uh, supply you want to have. This During this time, uh, you're going to get this much, uh, let's say, um, need of jackets. Okay. 
So on overall level, everybody knows, right? Let's say it could be a winter season. People want it. But let's say winter could be like a longer period. Uh, when do they want it? When do you need to keep that ready? Okay. So there could be some season uh, where people want to buy it. Okay. So that's uh, temperature and the time of the uh, season might also matter, all that. So, so it's not just one variable. You could have more than one variable to predict only one dependent variable. Okay. So as I said in the previous example of house prices, so house price could be dependent on more than one variable, right? It could be the location of the house. It could be the square feet of the house. And it could be, uh, let's say, a number of rooms you have, which floor it is in. So it's not just one variable. You have so many variables to predict just one house price. So all this combined will give you the one house price. So this is the difference, uh, Ramesh. So I hope this helps uh, understanding uh, uh, predicting a dependent variable based on so many independent variables. Okay. Great. So logistic regression we will discuss in detail in the next class, Ramesh. So just to under just understand, we have something called logistic regression that we will use for classification problems. Okay. Great. Let's move forward. So yeah. So let's let's for now uh, for the understanding purpose. Let's say uh, because we cannot visualize more than uh, one uh, two variables right in a chart. Let's say you you can't write a uh, hundred dimensions in the same thing. But just for the understanding purpose, we'll start with uh, one variable which is dependent variable y. Uh, independent variable is x. So any change in x. Uh, will be uh, will predict uh, there will be a change in y. How much is that change? We have to predict. So that is the equation of a line. So we have a line here. Okay. So here uh, it's a positive example. So for example, uh, any change in x, uh, there will also be positive change in y. So that is a positive thing. Uh, and if it uh, let's say if any change in x. If uh, the value of y is negative, then that is a negative change. So your equation of the line will be in this direction. Okay. So if it's positive, your slope will be this, which slope will be positive, or else the slope will be negative. That's why you see here. So the line has shifted in a different direction. Okay. Yeah. This is the line, and um, this is the line of a linear regression, which is uh, for one variable, which is y is equal to mx plus c. And these are the observations. So the points you have is the observations. Okay. So so let's say you have so many observations. Okay. So you you predict. Uh, sorry, you plot these points x versus y. Okay. And this line you are building to make sure. So your error is lesser, right? So it, uh, the error between the line and the point is lesser. So we use some method. There are uh, other methods as well. So one example is least, least square method. And there is something called gradient descent, uh, which is a more robust. But yeah, we'll understand least, least square method first. And then I'll give you an idea of the gradient descent as well. Okay. But for this, uh, the purpose of the session, we'll focus on least square. Okay. Um, right. So, uh, so you guys understand we have a line. And we have different points. Okay. So, uh, what is the purpose of this line is to make sure the error between the point and the line is lesser. Okay. So, there are so many points and the overall uh, error should be less. Okay. So, we need to build a line like this. Okay. The equation of a line with a slope. Uh, and so that uh, our error should be like very minimal. Okay. So, that's the agenda of building a linear regression. Guys, so any doubts here? Um, this is very important, very simple concept, but yeah, very important. Um, I hope it's clear, right? So we are building a line. We have so many points. Uh, these points are built based on X and Y, okay? So X will have a value of one uh, and Y will be value of two and we point this. So this is just a potting. We would done this, right? In schools, colleges, we have, we plot this graph uh, or the points in the graph uh, based on value of X and Y. And the point here is we need to build a line uh, so that equation of a line so that the error between the line, whatever the predicted by the line and the actual value is less. 
So yeah, as I said, we need to minimize the error uh, between the line and the points. Okay. So yeah, so here, if you see, uh, as the speed uh, increases with the distance increases, so it's there's a positive relationship. Okay. So the distance uh, travel uh, in a fixed duration of a time. So we need to predict the distance uh, based on the uh, speed that we have traveled. Okay. So here speed is the uh, x and how much, so how much distance can you cover with the speed, okay? And the m is the slope. So this, the slope, uh, how a bend should be there, that will be, uh, that's what we will be predicting, okay? So as I said, yeah, uh, if it's positive, it's the uh, positive slope. As the speed increases, you will be able to cover a lot more distance as speed decreases, right? Uh, so yeah, and there will be um, any equation, right? We'll have something called an intercept okay, uh, of a line. So where you need to start the line. So it'll not, you will always start from a zero, right? So, so this intercept is what is called C, okay? And let's say uh, speed. So as the speed is higher, the time of the distance, I, I mean, time you wanna travel will be reduced, right? So if you go, if you are going on a very high speed, uh, the time you're going to reach there will be minimal compared to if you are going on a lower speed. So uh, the speed and the time will have a negative relationship. So then your slope will be negative. Got it? So yeah, uh, here um, x is the uh, independent variable and y is the dependent variable. So let's see with an example, right? So let's say x uh, we have from 1 to 5 and y is like um, 4, 3, 4, 2, 5. Okay. Let's plot this one by one, okay? So which is one and four. So when X is one, um, let's say Y is equal to four. And then we have plotted other points as well, okay? So we need to build a line so that our error, uh, whatever we're gonna predict using that uh, thing uh, is gonna be minimal uh, to X, uh, Y, okay? So we need to predict Y based on the equation of a line, okay? So let's let's ask us, right? What is a, a better prediction? For example, let me ask uh, whichever talks about the data. That could be an estimate of uh, how uh, what is the value that could be there. Okay. So our idea here, right? So if you give uh, mean equal to five, right? So uh, sorry, if you take a mean as five for this, okay, and build a line based on that. So for all the points, you are predicting the value to be five. Okay. So our major aim of a regression to be uh, first, right? Uh, so you will get some error for this. Uh, we discussed something called mean squared error, mean absolute error last time, right? So just to give an example, four minus five, three minus five, four minus five. So the gap between that should be higher than the, the line we're gonna predict. So the equation of the line we're gonna predict. So the base uh, will be the mean, okay? But that's that's not the best way to do it, right? We can do a better job at this, okay? So for that, can we predict a line, build a line, equation of a line uh, to predict this value of y so that the error between the point uh, and the uh, line is lesser, okay? So let's say this is the perfect line, right? Let's say it actually crosses, uh, have a right points for, uh, the three blue points, okay, so the in the between, and have some gap between these two points, okay. So here, what happens is, uh, here we have this uh, of 3.6, okay. So here, our error would be reduced, okay. So then, yeah, so how do you build uh, the slope? Let's say we, if we take this, uh, what is the slope of the line? So only then you can predict this line, right? So yeah, we know the equation of a slope, it's, it's like x minus uh, mean and y minus y dash, uh, same x minus x dash, okay? So having this, uh, we can uh, predict the slope uh, first, okay? So given that, so we'll build that, let's say uh, we'll start with x minus x bar, uh, okay? So all these things uh, will start, okay? We have uh, uh, minus, so X minus X bar, which is like what? X minus three, okay? So this is the mean of this value, okay? So that we have built. 
And similarly, we build for x minus x y bar, which is the mean of that y bar. Okay, so which is four minus three point six, which is zero point four, and three minus three point six, which is zero point six minus zero point six. We build this. Okay, so accordingly, we build the um, um, slope. Okay, so then we get the value of zero point one. Okay, so our slope will be zero point one, and we have the value of x. And we need value for intercept, right? So for that, uh, for we first keep that to be 3.6 for now on an overall level. Uh, and then we uh, add this, okay, in order to derive the intercept. So we keep 3.6, the average value and whatever the uh, value for uh, X as well. Okay, what is that? Uh, 0 0.1 into 3, okay, which is uh, 0. Uh, Sorry, which is just a minute, which is 0 0.3. Okay, so now we can derive uh, the C, right? So in order to derive C, which is 3.6 uh, minus uh, 0 0.3. So we get 3.3. So now we keep C to be 3.3. So, so we our C starts here. Okay. So uh, that's how our C starts. Then we build this equation of a line. So now we have the equation of line to be uh, y is equal to 0 0.1 uh, into x plus 3.3. .3. Got it? So we repeat this process until we reduce this error. Okay. So we keep on uh, improving the error and we'll come up with the final equation. Got it? So that is the equation of a line. So right now we have only the values of mean. Okay. So in order to derive the first slope, okay, we, in order to derive the slope, what do we do is um, x equal to uh, the mean value, okay, the mean value of x and y is equal to y minus mean value of y. Similarly for x minus x uh, bar the whole square. So this is the equation to uh, derive the mean. Uh, sorry, uh, slope. Okay. So we start uh, calculating that. So first step is one, so value of X minus uh, the uh, mean value. So mean value of X is three. That's what we derived that, okay? So similarly, we derive for all values. So once we do that, uh, we get these two values and that's what we call it as slope, okay? So right now we have the value of slope, so which is 0 0.1. So we put m is equal to 0 0.1 um, and uh, we have the value of x and y, the average value of x and y, okay? So as we get the average value of uh, uh, x, which is 3, 3 into uh, 0 0.1 is 0 0.3 and uh, we know the value of y, I mean mean value, which is 3.6, okay? So then in order to derive c, 3.6 minus 0 0.3, which will give you uh, 3.3. So that's what we call it as intercept. Okay. So right now we are at this point. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So then, yeah. So then what do we do is, uh, then we repeat this process. Uh, in stock Y, this Y, we take the values of whatever we predicted through this, right? Uh, it's better than that, right? So we take the predicted values and repeat this process. And so that uh, our error is uh, very less between the point and whatever the value we have. So we keep uh, repeating this so that our slope will be uh, better for predicting this, okay? Uh, I hope uh, this is clear. Dy by dx, yeah, that's right. And we have a very uh, other uh, important method which is called gradient descent. Uh, can we move forward to that? I'll give, I'll just give you guys an idea. Um, great guys. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. So we have something called gradient descent search. Okay. Gradient uh, descent. I'll tell you how that works. So uh, so there is a concept called gradient descent. Uh, we would have all come across uh, the calculus, uh, all that, right? Uh, so, um, in order to find the equation of a line, uh, we use a, uh, so one is the least squares method, the other one is the uh, equation, uh, sorry, other one is the gradient descent. 
So for that, what do we do is, let me share the uh, whiteboard. Okay. So uh, generally what do we have is, uh, we have something called y is equal to, uh, let's say we have something called, um, uh, let me, uh, so y minus y the whole square, right? So we need to find this uh, error between this, okay? So in order to do that, uh, what do we do is we expand this equation uh, and then uh, we equate this to zero, okay? So our major motive here would be, so if you put plot this uh, equation, we'll get a curve like this, okay? So we'll get a curve like this. So in order to uh, find the minimal point, okay? So that value will be zero where M is equal, uh, where M is the right point. So uh, when this have to be zero, we need to have a perfect slope there, okay? So uh, we follow this process to find the minimal value of M and then we use that. So this is the other concept, um, but yeah. Let me see uh, if I can like type it for you guys. But yeah, um, you guys are interested, right? This is one thing uh, which is like, uh, let's say uh, least squares is the very, I mean, uh, one methodology. And this is the methodology. And this can be used even in the deep learning, all the, uh, all the other strategies as well. So the gradient descent is one common method of solving any equation, okay? So you have an equation and you mean you need to minimize that equation and find the values uh, of the unknowns uh, so that your error is lesser. So the error here is uh, what is the actual value and what is the predicted value. In order to do that, we'll go with this route. Okay. So what do we do is in that case, uh, we start with the value where M is random. We'll take a random value of X. Okay. Let's say we start the value of here. Okay. And then we see, uh, and we see how uh, having that value of M, is it uh, having a positive impact or a negative impact, okay? So if it's a positive thing, uh, then uh, let's say, so let's say we are here, we need to reduce the value of M, okay? And let's say we are here, we need to uh, increase the uh, value of M, okay? So accordingly, we'll change the value of M so that our minimum is here, okay? So we follow this process to, to, uh, to derive the value of M's uh, by doing an calculus at every step, okay? We do an, um, we do an uh, differential calculus on keeping uh, Y constant and we derive the values of X uh, slope values, okay? So first, what will be there is, first we'll have uh, equation of a line, okay? Which is Y is equal to MX plus C, okay? Then uh, for the cost function, so in order to solve the equation, what we will have is, uh, we had this mean squared error, right? Mean squared error, uh, which is, uh, let's call mean squared error to be um, some cost function C. Okay. Let's say we have this. So we need to solve, uh, one divided by n, which is number of records, then y minus y cap, uh, y cap, I'll call it as, let's say, y1, okay? The whole square, right? So this is our cost function right now, okay? In order to solve this, what we will need to do is, uh, we need to first uh, expand this equation, okay? So what we need to do for that is equal to, uh, so c will be, um, um, y, sorry, one divided by n into uh, y, y is the actual y, and then we have something called mx plus c, which is minus c, because that the whole minus, the whole square, sorry, sorry, this should be different race, c, Minus y minus the actual thing. Okay, sorry, I'll do small change. Right. Okay, 
So then you will have whole square here. So now in order to find the equation, right, we will equate this to e zero. So we will equal to zero. Okay. So now our motive is to find the value of m. Okay. So in order to do that, what we will do is, uh, so sorry, uh, for this, uh, we'll, we'll have uh, some change in the equation. Let's let's leave over y divided by n. For the overall purpose, what we will do is, we'll have one divided by two, okay? So this will be the final equation. So our motive is to find the value of m, okay? So for that, what we will do is, we'll start, uh, uh, let's say, uh, let's say we'll do, uh, a differential calculus on this. Okay, let's say if we differentiate this, what we will have two divided by two. So, so we need to first differentiate the whole equation. So if you differentiate two will be in the front. So two divided by two, this will get canceled. So that's the reason we generally start with. So then we will have m x uh, plus c minus y. So that is one equation. And internally also we need to uh, differentiate, right? So we are differentiating based on uh, dy by dx. Okay, so we are keeping x to be constant. So then, so this, uh, so this will be go, this will go away, this will go away. Okay, so then we'll have just the m, and then equate that to zero. Okay, so then we'll get the first value of m, uh, and in this process, let's say uh, what we will have is we'll have something called learning rate. So how much you need to change? So learning rate can be 0 0.1 to 1, okay? How much the value of M you need to have? We, we can have the value of M starting from, let's say some random value, okay? we'll start with four. I'm just giving an example there. So once we start with four, so what we will do is uh, we will, uh, we will, we'll see. So in order to get to the zero, what is the best value we can have? Uh, so we keep, uh, so this is the equation of a line, right? So that's what we, uh, so we keep repeating this process. We start with the value of M, okay? We have something called learning rate. So uh, learning rate, we need to, uh, uh, we need to have step-by-step -step process. And if we have a higher value of M, we'll minus that, or we have a lower value of M, uh, we increase that. So till we get the uh, proper value, uh, of an M will be continued the process. So that's what gradient descent does. We do not do it. So gradient descent as an algorithm does that internally uh, and keep updating the M so that the uh, we get the local minima. So that's the point, right? So we cannot achieve the local maxima. Uh, C is the constant intercept, right? So that will always be, uh, that will not have any value. Uh, so that is the intercept, Ramesh, right? So in this case, so you should add it to, don't worry about the sign here. Uh, so in this case, so 150. So what we are saying is when you have the values skewed towards one variable, for example, in the first equation, the values is skewed towards one variable. Okay. In that case, your M square will increase. Your cost will be very high. Okay. But in the first equation, uh, where 50 square feet, 10 rooms, so it's distributed across all three variables. So he, even here, it's like one is higher, but in this cases, we should not have an equation that is distributed just on one variable. So you should think about having a uh, uh, linear regression coefficient values distributed across all three, okay? All three coefficients or how many ever coefficients you have. So that equation is more generalized and far better in the real world, okay? So that's why we had, um, we add uh, in the cost function, instead of having just y minus y, uh, sorry, predicted minus actual the whole square plus m whole square. So this will make sure you have the uh, coefficient value distributed across all the things. Instead of having one variable having the very high coefficient value, others having uh, near to zero. That's not a good uh, model. Yeah, okay. So this is the extension, whatever I spoke, right? This is called L2 regularization. So previous equation in the, uh, let's say in the linear regression, we'll have actual minus predicted, uh, the whole square, that's it, okay? So that is the equation of a uh, linear regression, but we will have something called ridge, ridge regression. So that's what is called L2 regularization. So we'll having a penalty term 
for the coefficient value. Okay. So, and we also have something called lasso regression. It's similarly, we have a penalty variable, but instead of the whole square, we just had the alpha value and summation of weights. So weights are the coefficient values. Okay. So these are the two other uh, regressions. Okay. So, so we learned, so everything is same. So linear regression is the base thing and having a penalty term, we have something called L2 regularization, which is the ridge regression and lasso, which is the L1 uh, regularization. Okay. So these are very important uh, interview questions as well, guys. So just letting you know, cool. Some extra stuff uh, upon linear regression. Yeah, here you can see, um, we have like um, the columns and data here of Boston housing data. Okay. So we can also see the head, top five, uh, call, uh, five rows. And here we see something called description of the columns. Okay. So, so the dependent variable here is uh, the last column, which is the medium value uh, of owner occupied home. Okay. So in that, um, and this values is in uh, thousands. Okay. So which, which means it's 24,000. It's not just 24. Okay. So that is the medial value of uh, owner occupied home. So we need to predict this based on the previous, uh, based on these variables. Got it. So here we have per capita crime rate by town. So what is the town rate of the, uh, sorry, crime rate of the town and proportion of residential land zoned. Okay. And then we have portion of non-retail business acres. Got it. Then charge level dummy. It's a like it's a dummy variable, like uh one if a uh, track bounce river or zero otherwise. Okay. So we have zero and one. That's a categorical variable. So then uh, nitric oxide concentration, average number of rooms, and uh, proportion of owner occupied units, okay, and weighted distance to five Boston employment centers. Got it. Uh, so weighted is like uh, uh, it's not the actual distance. It's kind of, uh, uh, let's say modified values there. Okay. And we have index of accessibility to radial highways yeah. and full value of property tax per, uh, uh, 10,000. Okay. So what is the, uh, total value of the property? And we have people teacher ratio by town and B is what, where BK is the uh, proportion of blacks by town and LSAT is the percentage of lower status uh, of population. So this is more about the town and as well as the, uh, let's say the, the building you have, the price or how uh, close it to a reach and highway or what is the proportion of uh, low status uh, people living in this population, all that would be present. Okay, based on this, we need to predict the median value of the owner occupied homes. Um, that values are in 10,000, oh, sorry, thousands. So info will give you um, how many values are there. And let's say, uh, so here, if you see, we have like overall 506 records. Every every column has 506 records. There are no nulls then, right? So let's say some column uh, has uh, values less than 506. Then it means that uh, we have a values uh, let's say uh, few values to be null. So, but here in this case, we have uh, values for all columns, right? And every column, what is their data type? So data type here is float or else int, okay? So in this case, what does that mean? Here, everything is uh, turned out to be read as an, uh, let's say a numerical column, okay? So, but what do we see here? Uh, here is, we remember reading one column to be a categorical variable. What is that column? So we see something called um, Charles River dummy variable. So one, if a uh, track bounds river or zero otherwise. So even that has been loaded as an int variable, which is uh, Charles. So this has been loaded as an int variable. We know that is a categorical variable, right? Like, so we can understand few data from that because it's a zero and one. Okay. Uh, you cannot uh, use describe to understand this data. That does not make sense. Right. 
So, but yeah, for others, uh, in order to understand the uh, descriptive statistics, right? Uh, all, all mean, median, everything, we'll be using something called describe. Okay. So, data does describe will give you all, um, okay, all uh, values from mean, median. Um, so, here, so you loaded this data, right? Let's say you see some column, let's say, uh, let's say CRIM, okay? So, per capita crime rate by town, okay? So, here you see mean to be 3%. So, let's say it's a percentage of values, okay? Um, and you have maximum to be 88%. But one thing you see here is we have a very big gap between uh, the maximum and the um, uh, maximum and the 75th percentile, right? So, so one idea we can understand without seeing the data itself, uh, we can understand having a higher crime rate. The towns which is are having a higher crime rate will definitely have the lesser house prices, right? So that's just one idea. And what is, I mean, there is a very big gap between these two, right? What do you do? Like, uh, it's also in different columns. For example. Uh, let's say zone, uh, the proportion of residential land zone. So yeah, so even in this, you see like uh, a 12 and maximum to be 100. So there is a big gap between 75th percentile and max. So don't you want to understand what is the gap between these two things, right? So in that case, we have something called, we can see that in the percentile uh, itself, right? So what you generally need to do there is you just give percentiles and you just add what all things you want. Okay, let's say 0 0.5, 0 0.99, sorry, 75. Or let's say 90, 95. Okay. So this will give you an idea. So if you see till 99th percentile, you have the values to be like what, what I mean, like a uh, crime rate to be 41. Till 95th percentile, you have 15 only. So there is a high skewness in terms of the crime rate, right? So uh, so that's, that's the general scenario, right? It's not that it's going to be distributed across all towns. So you will see very high crime rate in specific towns uh, compared to the other uh, towns, right? That's that's a known thing. So, is there some correlation between uh, um, any other variable? That also we need to check, right? Um, so that that's also there. Okay. So same same thing would be um, a proportion of a residential land zoned. Okay. So here there was a bigger graph, right? Till 70 percentile, we were seeing only 12.5 percentage to be uh, zo uh, zoned. But uh, there are very few things which are like very higher. So in this end, okay. So based on that, you need to understand each and every column. So let's take one more thing, right? So for example, um, as we said, uh, Charles River, which has like a bounds of the river, which do not have bounds of river, okay? So having bounds of river should have an higher uh higher prices compared to the not having uh that's just an hypothesis right this is what you need to understand from the data but does this tell you something nothing else right let's say it's very small data only post 95 percentile you have ones all others are zeros but this is a categorical variables so how do you uh let's say understand a categorical variables so you cannot use describe describe will not give you an exact answer so what do you generally do uh, when you have any categorical variables so there are two things, CL. Outliers is like, which cannot happen at all, okay? You generally need to remove that data, at, you cannot have it. But there are some cases you cannot live with those, okay? Here in these cases, let's say there is a higher crime rate, you cannot remove that data, keep saying that it's an outlier, okay? That's how your data is, okay? If you want to make a career in data science, then IntelliPath has IIT Madras Advanced Data Science and AI Certification Program. This course is of very high quality and cost effective as it is taught by IIT professors and industry experts. So you want to see 
what is the average uh, uh, average uh, price value of a house for river which is touching the river which is not touching the river okay so that will give you the so how do you validate your hypothesis let's say if it's touching the river it's expensive if it's not it might not be okay so can we understand that so this is our hypothesis this might be true or might not be true so for that we need to check that right so how do you do that yeah so then just give me right let's say you have a categorical variable so it will give mean for all columns do we need for all columns no so if you need for a specific column what do you do so you just keep that specific column here so oh our hypothesis is right so if you see average value or house value when it is uh, touching the river it is expensive right which is 28 and if it is not it is 22 so then we need to do the train and test split right so what does the train and test split so we need to have few records for training the model and we need to have a test which will not show to the uh, let's say model at all okay so we can specify uh, if it's 2 0 0.2 it's like 20% you're going to have it for test if it's 3 you're going to have 30% okay as the data size is very small let's say we'll go with 20% okay we need to have some data for training at least so what does a random state means is if you do not have a random state, every time you split it, uh, you get a different values for X and Y. Okay. So have a random state so that uh, is, uh, if you have the same value, you're going to get the same records in train and split, uh, train and test. Got it. So for that, we need uh, uh, import uh, from the uh, scikit-learn. We are just importing the train and test split and using that. Uh, we're going to split the data. Okay. So let's see the shape. So here for train, uh, we have like uh, X train, we have 404 and 102. And for test, we have, let's say, one, uh, sorry, uh, for, sorry, sorry, sorry. We have 404 and for train and uh, Y variables also, we have like 404. Similarly, for test, we have one or two uh, X variables and one or two Y variables. We discussed, right? Uh, we need to have some portion of data split into uh, for training and some portion for testing. So training is the data will be used for model training. And testing is to understand how is our model performing on an unseen data set. So if you are using all the data set for training, you will not know how your model is going to perform in real world. So for that, you need to keep some data for testing purpose, okay? Uh, or let's say it should not be uh, thrown in the model. So for that, what we are doing here is uh, we are taking the data, which is X and Y. So we have X, uh, only uh, one variable we are taking from all that columns. Uh, we also see what, uh, how to build with other columns as well. But yeah, let's say we have only one column and here we have an uh, other column, which is Y, okay? We have loaded that data. So let me show you the Y as well. So now we have two, uh, two data. Okay, this is just an head. And what we are doing is we are passing X and Y and saying we have a function for train and test split. So split this data into train and test. Okay. So for that, you need to specify what percentage should be in the test, what percentage to be in the train. Okay, so you don't need to specify both the things, but let's say if you specify test size to be 0 0.2, it will take 20% of data in the test data, other 80% to be trained. Okay, so and random state is, so it, it's randomly selecting, right? If you are not giving any random state, every time you run this function, you might end up having different records in both train and test. So have always have a random state, have the same value so that you get the same records in train and test. Okay. Then what is the 20% uh, of uh, 40 uh, sorry 506 uh, which is uh, 102 so that is there in the uh, test and other 404 is there in the train data okay so now you we have split the data right so now you have 404 uh, for we just need train values right uh, so then what we will do is we need to build the model right now so in order to build the model. Uh, from scikit-learn, linear models will import the linear regression. Okay. 
and we'll create a regression first. This is a dummy thing. We do not have trained our model anything. So we just imported the linear regression uh, to a regressor. We are keeping this into a variable. Okay. Uh, so then what we will do is using fit. So you are saying fit this model x train to this y train variable. Okay. So this is the model training part. Okay. So you have completed the training of the model. This actually it's a smaller data. That's why we are getting a faster results, but it will take few minutes in, in real world scenarios. Okay. So, and we are printing the intercepts. So intercepts are the weights. Okay. So, oh, sorry, intercepts of the constant value and we have the coefficient values. Okay. So what we are saying is, uh, as we all know, uh, having a lower status population will decrease the, so it will be negatively correlated, right? So that's the model we have right now. So we have zero point. So our model will be like, um, yeah. So in order to predict uh, house price, which is why we'll have this zero point, uh, sorry, minus zero point nine two four four into value of x. What is x? x is the uh, percentage of uh, lower status population plus the constant, which is this intercept. Okay. So using this, we'll be able to predict the y, which is the house price. So now we have finally built the uh, model. Okay. So with an, uh, one variable. So we'll, our model will be generally like this. Okay. So if you want to predict for that, so we'll use this. So let's say we'll take the test data and pass that model. Uh, using that model, we are predicting for the test data. Okay. So if you do that, we'll have the test data itself. So this is the predicted variable. So we use this model to predict the values for the test data. So now let's see how is our model performing. Okay. Just a minute. So we discussed, right? We have different variables. Mean absolute error is the direct uh, error and mean squared error. Uh, so we'll we'll see on root mean squared error. So this is root mean squared error. Okay. So let's see how our model is performing. Okay. So we have the values like this. So uh, which is higher, right? Mean absolute error. So normally our uh, average value of this to be. So what is our average value here? It's 22. And let's say our mean absolute error itself is five. Uh, it's kind of an, the error is kind of an higher because we are just using one variable here. Okay. Uh, and what do we need to check is we also need to check how is our model performing in both test and train? Is there a bigger gap between test and train? So we'll understand is there is, is model overfitting or underfitting? Okay. The first question is, what is PEP8 and why is it important? PEP stands for Python Enhancement Proposal. A PEP is an official design document providing information to the Python community or describing a new feature for Python or its processes. PEP8 is especially important since it documents the style guidelines for Python code. Apparently, contributing to the Python open source community requires you to follow these style guidelines sincerely and strictly. So what he says basically uh, is that if you want to contribute to the open source uh, development of Python and uh, you are contributing to any of the libraries, let's say NumPy or Pandas, uh, let's say you want to add in a functionality or a particular module inside that, you need to follow a certain guidelines that is provided by the Python community. And these guidelines are called as PEP. So PEP8 is a particular version of these guidelines wherein you have to follow a structure for you to contribute to the open source Python code. Now let us move on to the next question. Python is an interpreted language. An interpreted language language is any programming language that executes its statements line by line. This means the source code of a Python program is converted into bytecode that is then executed by the Python virtual machine or PVM. Python is different from major compiled languages such as C and C++ because Python code is not required to be built and linked uh, like code for these languages. This distinction makes for two important points which is the first point is Python code is fast to develop. As the code is not needed to be compiled and built, Python code can be readily changed and executed. 
This makes for a fast development cycle. The next point is, Python code is not as fast in execution compared to other languages. Since the code is not directly compiled and executed, and an additional layer of Python virtual machine is responsible for the execution, Python code runs a little slow as compared to the conventional languages like C, C++, etc. So we also have a pro and we also have a con uh, of Python being an interpreted languages. All right, the third question for this video is, what is a dynamically typed language? Before we understand a dynamically typed language, we should learn about what typing is. Typing refers to type checking in programming languages. In a strongly typed language such as Python, 1 plus 2, that is 1 as a character and 2 as a number, uh, will result in a type error since these languages do not allow for type coercion. Type coercion here means implicit conversion of the data types. That is the Python compiler won't um, automatically convert your data types to the same one and then add it. So this is not applicable for Python. But on the other hand, a weakly type language such as JavaScript will simply output 12 as the result. It will convert the number 2 as a string and then add the string that is append the string together and output 12 as the result. But this is not the case in Python programming language since it is a dynamically typed language. Now type checking can be done at two stages. The first stage is the static stage. Here data types are checked before the execution. And there is one more type which is dynamic. Here data types are checked during execution. That is while typing out your statement on a single line, your data types are checked whether they are compatible or not. Python doesn't wait for you to compile the whole source code. In fact, it does that line by line and that is why it is also called as an interpreted language. You can also put the answer this way. Python is an interpreted language that executes each statement line by line. Thus type checking is done on the fly during execution. Hence Python is a dynamically typed language. Let us move on to the fourth question. Is indentation required in Python? So the obvious answer is yes but you will need to expand upon that answer so let me just do that indentation in python is compulsory and is a part of its syntax indentation provides better readability to the code which is probably why python has made it compulsory all the programming languages have some way of defining the scope and extent of the blocks of code. In Python, it is indentation instead of braces. Indentation provides better readability to the code and that is why they have made it compulsory. Now, let us take an example. When it comes to other languages, let's say Java, when we have to construct a for loop, uh, we have to put the blocks or the statements inside the for loop within a braces. So it goes something like this and uh, the statements inside the for loop need not be indented or given a space. It can be on the same line as the for loop itself. So that doesn't make any errors. But when it comes to Python, the print statement that is inside the for loop should have indentation that is four spaces. Let us move on to the next question and uh, guys, this is where the hands-on begins. Uh, First four questions were uh, theoretical and uh, this is where uh, things get uh, hands-on. How to print without a new line in Python? The print function is used to display the content in the command prompt or the console. The default functionality of the Python print method is that it adds a new line character at the end. Let us take an example here. Let's say you want to print two strings on a new line. So you can do that by using the print statement. So if you type your code something like this, uh, the first string should be hi and the second string will be welcome to IntelliPath. And if you type this in a Python environment, the output will be hi followed by a new line and then uh, the next string which is welcome to IntelliPath. Now suppose we want to print these two strings on the same line, that is we want to skip the new line character. So how to do that? Welcome to IntelliPath uh, automatically prints in the new line. In order for this string to print in the same line, we have to use a parameter called end. So the print function has one more parameter, which is called as end, and you can assign any value to this parameter. It goes something like this. So you use your uh, print function as it is, and you print out the string. You add in the string uh, what you want to display on the screen and then you type a comma and then add the end parameter and then uh, you assign it a value which is enclosed within a double quotation. So within the double quotation if you add a 
empty space so it will print an empty space uh, if you want to add another string you can do that as well let us see what the output is right now so the output will be the first string which is hi followed by the second string which is welcome to IntelliPad. now if you do not add the white space in the double quotation in the end argument it will print the first string hi and uh, it will append the second string without any space let us move on to the sixth question what are keywords in python python keywords are special reserved words that have specific meanings and purposes and cannot be used for anything but those specific purposes they cannot be variables they cannot be functions or identifiers you can use the help function to know more about them and as of today uh, that is the latest python version is 3.10 there are 35 keywords uh, that are currently present and these are all of them some of them include true false continue break lambda yield etc the seventh question is list all the built-in data types in python language the table present on the screen basically lists out all the data types that are present in python for the text type we have string for numerical types we have integer data type floating point data types and complex numbers and for sequence types we have list tuple and range when it comes to the mapping type we have dictionaries and for set types we have set and frozen set we also have bool for the boolean type and for binary we have bytes byte array and memory view which are not commonly used but still you should be knowing about them and we also have a special type which is the none type and in case if you want to know the data type of a particular variable in python you can use the type of function so the output will basically display the data type of the variable the type function takes the variable as its argument and outputs the data type of the variable moving on to the eighth question what are the differences between python arrays and lists both lists and arrays are used to store a collection of items that is data in the python programming language moreover both data structures allow indexing slicing and iterating so both python array and list uh, support indexing slicing and iterating as well coming to the definition of list a list is a data structure that's built into python and holds a collection of items lists have a number of important characteristics the first character is List items are enclosed in square brackets and list should be ordered that is the items in the list appear in a specific order. This enables us to use an index to access any item. Lists are also mutable which means that you can add or remove items after lists creation. List element do not need to be unique. Item duplication is possible as each element has its own distinct place and can be accessed separately through the index. Elements can be of different data types. You can combine strings, integers and objects in the same list. You can also include another list inside a list. So which is basically a nested list. Let us go through the example uh, mentioned in the screen now. So in order to create a list, you must enclose your list items within a square bracket. Now in this example, I have included four list items, which is one, 8.9, J and hello. And this basically shows that you can include heterogeneous data types because one is an integer, 8.9 is a floating point number, J is a character and hello is a string. And then on the next line, uh, you can print the list and you can also print the type of the list in the next line. So the output will be the list itself because I'm printing the list called my list. And then the type of list will be list. Now moving on to the array data structure. An array is also a data structure that stores a collection of items. And uh, like list, arrays are ordered, mutable, enclosed in square brackets and able to store non-unique items. To use arrays in Python, you need to import either an array module or a numpy package. So array initialization in Python has two ways. You can either do it by importing a module called array or you can use a library which is basically an open source library called numpy. Let us take an example here. Here I'm using the first version that is I'm importing the array module. So I in the first uh, statement import array as ARR. ARR is basically an alias. On the next line I will be initializing a variable 
and assigning the array to that variable called my underscore arr so you have to use the array function here that is array of and here array of function takes in two arguments the first argument is the type of uh, data which you will be storing inside that array in this particular example i have given small i which basically means i am storing integer data types inside my array and then after that you need to include the array itself here i have included five elements that is one two five and i have enclosed that within square brackets on the next line i am printing the array which is called as my underscore arr and then i am finally printing out the type of the array that is my underscore arr now let us see what the output will be the output is and it also shows the data type in the output as well and now we will see how to create an array in the second version that is using the numpy library numpy arrays support different data types to create a numpy array you only need to specify the items and there is no need to specify the data type of the array let us take an example on the first statement i am importing the numpy package and on the second line I'm using the array of function again but here I need not mention the data type of the elements of the array instead I will be directly uh, inputting the array elements so one more thing to note here is that uh, the array elements need not be the same it can be of different data types hence I have included hello which is a string and followed by 1 2 and 3 which is of integer data type so it is basically an heterogeneous array and on the next line i'm printing out uh, the array uh, called as my underscore arr and finally i'm printing out the type of the array now let us see the output for this so the output is the array contents itself and then the data type of the array which is nd array which is numpy arrays now after knowing how to initialize uh, a list and how to initialize an array and uh, various types of initializing arrays i have consolidated the differences between arrays and lists into three points which basically boils down to these three all right guys the first point is arrays need to be declared and a list need not be declared they can be initialized uh, on whatever statement you have to use it because uh, they are built into python in the examples above you saw that the lists are created by simply enclosing a sequence of elements into square brackets creating an array on the other hand requires a specific function from either the array module or the numpy package and because of this reason lists are used more than arrays the second point is arrays can store data very compactly they are also more efficient for storing large amounts of data the third point is arrays are great for numerical operations lists cannot directly handle math operations for example you can divide each element of an array by the same number with just one line of code if you try to do the same with a list you will get an error it is possible to do a mathematical operation with a list but it is much less efficient than arrays moving on to the ninth question what is the dictionary data type in python python dictionary is an unordered collection of items each item of a dictionary has a key key value pair each key value pair maps the key to its associated value dictionary elements are accessed via keys you cannot access them using indices like in other data types like lists and tuple that is you cannot call them by uh, defining their uh, index number that is 0 1 2 or whatever it is you will have to uh, call the following key The syntax for creating a dictionary in Python is given on the left side. First, you need to choose an identifier. I have chosen my underscore dictionary, and then you should declare the key value pairs inside a braces. So braces are nothing but uh, flower brackets. So and the format is key colon followed by its associated value. And you can include how many ever uh, key value pairs inside the pair of braces that you want. each key value pair is considered as a single item on the dictionary while the values can be of any data type and can repeat keys must be of the immutable type that is you cannot change the key once you have declared it and they must also be unique that is two keys cannot have the same name and here on the right side i have mentioned the different ways of creating dictionaries the very first way is uh, you uh, put in the elements that is the key value pairs inside the flower braces a dictionary can have integer keys 
it can also have mixed keys as in the second uh, example below that is it can be a string and then an integer and the alternative way of creating a dictionary is using the dict of function okay guys moving on to the 10th question explain the concept of indexing in python talk about negative indexing now, before we get started with indexing, let us understand what iterables are and what is their main function. The knowledge of iterables is much needed to get behind indexing. It is a special type of object in Python that you can iterate over, meaning you can traverse through all the different elements or entities contained within the object. It can be easily achieved using for loops. Objects like lists, tuples, sets, dictionaries, strings, etc. are called as iterables in Python. In short, iterables is any uh, thing that you can loop over. Under the hood, what all these iterable items carry are two special methods called the iter and the next method that implements the sequence semantics. Even the for loop in Python is implemented using these special methods. Now that we know what iterables are briefly let us know about indexing it is a special type of object in python that you can iterate over meaning that you can traverse through all the different elements or entities contained within the object it can be easily achieved using for loops objects like lists tuples sets dictionaries strings etc are called as iter over under the hood what all these iterable items carry are two special methods called iter and next that implement the sequence semantics in python even the for loop in python is implemented using these special methods now that we know what iterables are briefly uh, let us now go into indexing indexing in python is a way to access individual items within an iterable by their position in other words you can directly access your elements of choice within an iterable and do various operations depending on your needs now let us take an example here i have declared a list in python and i have called the list as fruits and i have added five elements within that list which are of string type so we have apple grape orange guava and banana so let us see how this works under the hood in python so in the very first step python allocates memory for the list and uh, each element is indexed as follows apple will be given the index 0 grape will be given 1 and so on until 4 in python objects are zero index meaning that the position count starts from 0 many other programming languages follow the same pattern now as you can see by default uh, many people use the positive indexing for their item retrieval so we have 0 to 4 and there is another concept called as negative indexing in python which basically means that uh, the last element of the list is uh, indexed as minus one and the last but one element of the list will be indexed as minus two and so on until minus five and the length of the list is five so this is about uh, indexing and negative indexing in python moving on to the 11th question explain the concept of slicing in python slicing a list gives us another list instead of a single element slicing is an incredibly useful feature in python a slice specifies a start index and an end index and creates and returns a new list based on the values of the indices the indices are separated by a colon now let us take an example but before that keep in mind that the sublist return contains only the elements starting from the start index which includes the start index but it will exclude the end index elements so you guys will understand what i mean in the example so let's say for example you create a list uh, of five elements that is uh, one to five and you call the list as example in the next statement you are printing the example by calling it uh, by index uh, length that is the slicing method so the syntax for slicing is um, element uh, colon and then colon which basically means the first element uh, before the colon is the start index the second element after the colon means the end element so the second statement here means that print out the first element until the last element so uh, the second statement prints one two three four and five in the third statement we have uh, the start index as one and the end index as five so it will print from the second element of the list which is two three four five and coming to the last statement we have four 
colon 5 that is the start index is 4 and the end index is 5. So it will print the last element which is 5 and uh, the end index element minus 1 which is the same. Both 4 and 5 points to the same element and hence it prints only one element which is 5. You can see the output below. And there is one more trick to slicing guys. If you leave out the start index, it is assumed to be zero. That is, if you do not put anything under the start index uh, place, that is before the colon, the default value will be zero. And similarly, if you leave out the end index, it is assumed to be the length of the list. And here in the example above, it will be length of the list is five. So it will be five. Let us see this with an example. So I have declared the same list as before in the previous example, which contains five elements, one, two, five. And in the first print statement, we have uh, colon five. That is the start index is not mentioned. And by default, it will take the zeroth element as the start index value. So you will be printing out the whole list, one, two, three, four, and five. In the second print statement, we have three colon and then null element which basically means it tells the python compiler to print from the third element to the final element of the list and coming to the last print statement the start index is not mentioned and also the end index is also not mentioned so let us see what the output is so null value and 5 means the whole list 1 2 3 4 5 and then uh, 3 colon null uh, value means print from the third element up until the last one and finally uh, null colon null means start to end that is basically it copies the list moving on to the 12th question explain the differences between list and a tuple both list and tuple are built-in data types in python and they are meant to store a collection of elements both these are capable of storing heterogeneous data both of these are iterable objects now let us see the differences one by one lists are mutable tuples on the other hand are immutable that is once you create a tuple you cannot change its elements unlike lists list is implication of iteration is time consuming that is within list the iteration is time consuming when it comes to tuple it is comparatively faster than a list and for this very reason tuple is used over the list data structure Coming to the third difference, the list is better for performing operations that is insert and deletion. Tuple data type on the other hand is appropriate for accessing the elements. That is if you want to access your elements faster, you can go for the tuple data type. And if you want to make changes to your uh, database, that is uh, you can use lists. Coming to the fourth difference, list will consume more memory and tuple will consume less memory when compared to lists. The fifth difference is list has several built-in methods that is for insertion, deletion, updation, uh, all the CRUD operations. Lists will have the built-in methods for it. But tuple do not have many built-in methods. Coming to the sixth and final difference between list and tuple, the unexpected changes and errors are more likely to occur in the list. But when it comes to tuples, it is hard to take place. That is, the error is unlikely to take place in case of a tuple. Let's have a quick quiz question, guys. And the question is, which of the following is not a keyword in Python language? And your options are pass, evil, assert, or non-local. Please mention your answers in the comment section below. All right, moving on to the 13th question. What are functions in Python? Explain with an example. Python function is a block of related statements designed to perform a computational, logical or evaluation task. The idea is to put some commonly or repeatedly done tasks together and make a function so that uh, instead of writing the same code again and again for different inputs, we can do the function calls to reuse code contained in it over and over again. Functions can be the built-in or user-defined. It helps the program to be concise, non-repetitive and organized. We can create a Python function using the def keyword, that is def, define keyword. You can choose any any identifier of your choice for the function name. Then comes the parameters which are enclosed within parentheses. 
Now let us see the syntax of creating a uh, function. So as I was saying, the parameters are enclosed within the parentheses. Now what does doc string mean here? Doc string stands for documentation. It is always a good practice to write a short description of what your function does. And then comes the block of statements under that function. It can be of any length depending on the function's complexity. Lastly, the function return statement is used to exit from a function. Return to the function caller and return the specified value of data item to the caller. Now let us take an example of a function. So here the function name is absolute underscore value and it takes in one parameter which is called as num and after that we have the doc string which basically says what this function does very briefly. So the doc string in this example says this function returns the absolute value of the entered number. Now what is an absolute value? Absolute value is a number or a value wherein it only gives out the magnitude of a number. Let's say for example the absolute value of 5 is 5 and the absolute value of minus 23 will be 23. Now that we know what absolute value is, uh, let us see the statements uh, defined below the absolute value function. So the logic is, if the number is greater than or equal to zero, which basically says if the number is positive, you do not do anything, any changes to the number, you just return the number as it is. And in the else condition, you return the negative of the number. That is if the number is negative, you return the negative of the negative number, which will result in a positive number. And uh, the print statements uh, following that is, uh, calling the function twice and the parameters passed are 2 and minus 4. So the output will be 2 because it is positive number it will enter into the if condition and it will return the number as it is and uh, coming to the second function call wherein the parameter is minus 4 it will go into the else part of the logic and it will return minus of minus 4 which will result in 4. Alright moving on to the 14th question of this video explain modules and packages in python. Modules and packages feature in python is responsible for implementing the modular program programming paradigm. A module is essentially a python file with a .py extension. It can contain any number of functions, classes or variables. The common practice is to put together a set of related functionalities together in a module so that you can reuse that whenever you want in any python files. After you are done with creating a module, you can import that using the following syntax in the very beginning of your program. That is the syntax is import followed by module name. Using this syntax will import all the functions, classes and variables that is present inside that particular module. Now let us take a look at an example and see how a module is used in Python. First we create a file named CALC which stands for calculation which will contain all the functions for binary arithmetic operations that is uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. Then we create another file where we use this calc module by importing the CALC module. So in the CALC file that is calc.py, we have defined four functions, add, subtract, multiplication and division. All of these functions take in two parameters that is a and b and the control comes out of the function by returning the appropriate answer. Now after saving this calc.py file, you create another python file which is main.py. Here at the very beginning you are importing your calc module by writing down the statement import calc which is the module name and then you are assigning the value of 2 to a and 3 to b and in the print statement you are calling the add function by using the dot operator on the module name which is calc.add and you are passing in the argument in the main.py file which is 2 and 3 and 2 and 3 will be passed to the add function and again we are calling the multiplication function uh, here also we are uh, passing in the uh, parameters as 2 and 3. Now let us see what the output will be. So the output is as expected 5 and 6. So basically when you call the add function in the main.py file, the control goes to the calc.py file 
and then here uh, the control goes to the return statement which is which basically adds a 2 and 3 and then returns the answer back to the main.py file and then it is printed out in the output the same goes for the multiplication function as well so this is how a module works by looking at this example we can say that a group of functions that is addition subtraction multiplication and division which is present inside a python file will make up a module so the pictorial representation goes something like this that is here in the picture there are five functions and uh, in total uh, you can save it as a .py file and in turn it will become a module so in our previous example we have taken four uh, functions which is add subtract multiplication and divide and we have saved that file and it becomes a module when you import it now if we want to add complex functionalities other than simple binary operations we can create another file and import it as another module. Imagine importing 10 modules like this for your program. It becomes a repetitive task. For this very reason, we consolidate all the related modules inside a directory and we call that directory as a package. Now, it is diagrammatically represented uh, in the picture on the slide. So, a uh, several modules will be consolidated into a directory and this directory is called a package. And if you want to work on a very complex project and which basically deals with databases, web-based functionalities, linear algebraic operations, trigonometric operations, etc. You will have to consolidate several packages and put it under a single directory. And this is what we call a library. So the diagrammatical representation of a library will look something like this. Several packages consolidated into a directory will become a library. So to sum this up, several functions, classes and variables make up a module and several modules consolidated into a directory is called as a package and several packages consolidated into another directory is called a library. Coming to the last question of this video, demonstrate any three ways to reverse a string in Python. There is no reverse of function for the string library in Python as it is there in the Java language. Therefore, we will have to know these methods to reverse a string. So the three ways are using the for loop, using the inbuilt reversed of function and finally using the extended slice syntax. Now we will be taking a look at each one in brief. Firstly, using the for loop. Okay, let us see how for loop works. Here we have defined a function called as reverse and it takes in one argument which is s. It takes in a string. Here we declare a variable called as string which is basically an empty string and then you initialize a for loop and iterate over the string and then you put in the logic in the next statement result is equal to i plus result which basically means that you are taking the first element or the first character in that string and adding that to the empty string which is stored in result. So here in the first iteration, the first character will be stored in the uh, result which is i and in the second iteration, the second element or the second character in the string which is n, n will be prepended to i and then in the third iteration, the third character t will be prepended on the result string. So now after third iteration, the result will be t n i and then on the print statement, you are printing out the original string followed by the reverse string after going through the for loop in the reverse function. So the output will be as follows. Your original string will be IntelliPath and the reverse string will be T-A-A-P-L-L-E-N-T-I which is basically the reverse of IntelliPath. The second method is the inbuilt reversed method. Here we make use of the built-in reverse function which basically creates a reversed object which is also an iterator from the original string. Then on wrapping the join function around it, it will prepend each character to the empty string on which the dot operator is used. Now if you guys uh, get confused, let me explain it through an example. So on the very first statement, uh, we declare a string and call it IntelliPath and then we use the reversed of function on this string which basically stores a reverse object in the memory and then on top of that reverse of function you use the join function 
you wrap the join function around the reverse function what it basically does is it prepends every character to the empty string that is declared by the dot operator uh, before the join and then the whole result will be stored in the identifier or the variable called result and then in the final statement uh, you are finally printing out your result so the output will be the reverse of the original string which is t a a p i l l e n t n i the third method is using the extended slice syntax all right before doing this uh, let me revise what the slice uh, syntax is the slice syntax basically says that uh, you use the colon in between uh, the start index and the end index but here we are using the extended slice index which basically has three arguments instead of two uh, that is the start end and the step the start index uh, is where the slicing of the object starts that is the slicing of string starts and the end index is where the slicing of the objects stop and finally uh, the extended uh, argument is the step uh, argument and this is an optional argument that determines the increment between each index for slicing let's say suppose you add the value 1 in it so the uh, increment is 1 that is it will uh, print out uh, in terms of 1 uh, steps if you put in 2 let's say the list has elements from 1 to 10 let's say you put in the step as 2 so it will print all the even uh, numbers in the list that is it will print 0 2 4 6 8 and then 10 so it basically increases the step by 2 skipping all the odd numbers in the list now that we know what an extended uh, slice syntax is, let us take up an example. We declare a string IntelliPad and store it in S and then you are slicing the string by using slice uh, syntax. Null value followed by colon followed by a null value followed by minus 1. In this example, I have given null values for the start and end arguments which means it will uh, take default values for start and end index that is 0 and the length of the string and the argument for the step uh, function is minus 1 this will imply start from the last character because minus 1 is the negative index for the last character in a string and then take one step backwards until the first character of the string so this is what minus 1 means to the python compiler and finally the output will be the reversed string of intellipat all right guys uh, that covers 15 questions that's it for today's video if you want to make a career in data science then IntelliPath has IIT Madras Advanced Data Science and AI Certification Program. This course is of very high quality and cost effective as it is taught by IIT professors and industry experts.